the Athletic Football Show's Draft Night Special. Are you ready? Let's get it started! Live in studio from Kansas City. Featuring your host Robert Mays, the Athletics NFL Draft Beast Dane Brugler, and of course, the one and only Nate Tice. Plus, special guests along the way. The NFL Draft is now officially over. Welcome to night two of the Athletic Football Show's 2023 live draft coverage. I am Robert Mays. Joining me tonight once again, the athletics draft guru himself. It is Dane Brugler. Dane, how you feeling, buddy? Feeling good. This is uh, day two and three are for the scouts, right? You know, This is for you. This is for yeah. the, you put in all those hours <laughs> and figure out who are the gems in this draft. Uh, we're going to find some starters today. It'll be fun. People should know that if it were up to you, we would do this again tomorrow. Yes. The draft would be 12 rounds long, and you yeah. would do live coverage of the draft for as long as the draft There's went on. 259 picks. I mean, <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's keep it going. Keep it rolling. Also joining us tonight, my good friend, it's Nate Tice. Nate, how you doing, bud? It's Friday night. I'm feeling just right. This is, <laughs> this is great. No, I love this. Dane and I were talking how it used to be just a Saturday, Sunday affair and marathon. Uh, marathon. Yeah. The new, we were trying to figure out the start time. It would go noon to 9 p.m. <laughs> and at the end, you just see that like, confetti falling like from behind <laughs> everybody with Chris right. Berman and stuff. And no, it's, it's, it's nice. We're Friday night. We're prime time rounds two and three. And like Dane said, there's this is fun to kind of now you get to see kind of like some movement with some guys, some guys that might be surprise picks, some guys that fell that we've talked about last night ad nauseum. And now we get to actually see them maybe get selected. Today, and that's a lot of fun. We got two rounds today, but let's talk about last night a little bit before we look forward to what's going to happen tonight. Now that you've had some time to sleep on it and have some thoughts in the cold light of day after what happened <laughs> yesterday evening, your first thought when you woke up this morning is you look back on last night's events. It's got to be the Eagles for me, just what Howie Roseman did to come out of this draft, this first round, with both Jalen Carter and Nolan Smith. The two Georgia defenders, after last year, what they did in the first round with Jordan Davis, then you get into Kobe Dean. It just collect all these Georgia defenders. It's not a bad strategy, not at all. <laughs> and so well, uh, just the fact that they were able to get arguably the number one player in this draft, uh, they, were, they were making calls, uh, trying to get up maybe to five, six. And then once he started falling a little bit, 
they thought, okay, this is realistic. We can get, we can go get Jalen Carter, and then I don't think they ever thought Nolan Smith was going to last until pick 30, like he did. Uh, both, it, it's such an ideal landing spot for both these guys with the infrastructure of the locker room and where they are with that defensive line. And then also with the expectations and managing that, and then also for the Eagles to add this, these type of talents. Mm -hmm. It's just an awesome fit for both the player and for the team. I think twofold. It, they're both players that fit with the Eagles maybe better than they would fit with another team. We talked about this a little bit last night. Yeah. For Jalen Carter, it's just believing in your infrastructure, believing in your veterans, believing in your culture. For Nolan Smith, I'd have to assume that one of the reasons Nolan Smith fell is that there are some teams in the teens and the 20s who are like, well, how are we going to use him? Right. If we're going to draft him this high, what's his role going to be? On the Eagles, he can be a role player to start. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter kind of that murkiness about what his role is because his role can be so specific in, in Philadelphia compared to what it might be with another team where he would need a little bit of an outsized presence on that defense. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, Will McDonald. We'll talk about him another time, but with the Jets, didn't love the pick, but I understand what the Jets are doing because in with what they do in that defense, Will McDonald's not to come in and be the guy, the, the number one pass rusher. They can work him in and sub, and he can just he's going to have a ton of flash plays this year, even though he probably won't be a starter. And with Nolan Smith, it'll be the same thing, where he's not going to be expected to be the guy from day one, but you can use him in different ways. They'll be creative with him, and you can just do so much with a guy that has that type of ability, that type of speed, that type of character. So it's it really a home run pick for the Eagles. If it, it, they both were top 12 picks in my yeah. personal draft board. So no surprise, I, I love what they did. How about you, Nate? What was your draft hangover like this morning? Just w waking up and, yeah, feeling a little Bijan uh, with the Falcons. <laughs> I, I just like that. We'll talk about that in a sec. But really where the quarterbacks all ended up, of course, with Bryce Young. But then Stroud emerging through smoke screen and silly season, being ending up being the number two pick, which is – just again, hilarious that we spent a calendar year and they ended up going one, two, just like we thought a year ago. So it's kind of interesting. And also just where Richardson going to the Colts, just love that fit. I'm really excited just to see that whole, that thing unfold for the next five, six, seven years. Hopefully it lasts five, six, seven years. And that's just a two years and we're all going like, that's why he was a project, Nate. <laughs> now you gotta look at that completion percentage. And then also just where quarterbacks didn't end up. Yeah. And I, I know we'll talk about Levis in a second and Hooker and, and Hennon Hooker as well. But those guys, that, kind of landing spots for everybody. It's kind of, it's fun now that we have some like concrete evidence of what's about to happen. And what's becoming kind of an annual tradition, you and I went out last night after we're just kind of decompressed. You're yeah. so wired after a crazy night with all that stuff happening. We were sitting there talking and we're almost happy that CJ Stroud went to and Anthony Richardson went for because it validates what we saw. Yes. If one of those guys had fallen, let's say Stroud falls out of the top 10 and maybe Richardson goes in the back half of the first round, I think we were both so excited about both of them. It was a little bit of validation that yeah. we saw the prospects in the way that the team saw the prospects this time. Oh, and when the odds were starting to break out and break down the last couple of days, and of course that's, Vegas is riding the wave with that and the yeah. information just like we are. And so I, you always have to remember that, but then there's also times going like, okay, what do they know? And I'm right. seeing Richardson's odds dropping that he's not making a top five pick, six yeah. picks. And those are those moments, that, like you just said, where I'm just going, oh boy, oh boy. Am I, do, I, do I know nothing? <laughs> like, have I, I ever watched a quarterback It was the before? Principal Skinner meme. It was, am I out of touch? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, the league's out of touch. Yeah. You know, that, uh, that's exactly how I felt. And then, yes, it, like you said, it was validation. And But also the flip side is that, like, I did like Levis. And I, I do, I legitimately yeah. had a first round grade on him. And, and, you know, he was the fourth guy in my top four. But it's still surprising that you go in the first round. But again, but those other guys, especially Stroud going to Richardson going forward, top five, I was like, okay, yes, some, a little bit of validation there. So what do we think the Levis fall is a product of? Because I understand if you still like him and maybe it doesn't happen. My first thought there is, well, there aren't that many teams where it seemed like a soft landing spot. Right. You know, if Tampa didn't like him, is there another team that's super motivated to trade back into the first round and get him? And if that's not the case, maybe it's just a fit thing more yeah. than it is about a commentary about him as a prospect. Yeah, and I, I think that teams did make some calls, uh, but the Eagles, once Nolan Smith was there, they weren't moving out. You look at the Chiefs, they couldn't move out. They're picking at 31. Yes. They wanted their moment. Yes. Yes. They, they, the Chiefs could not move. So, Celebrate. you know, there were some interesting spots where maybe it could have happened, but uh, they didn't. And you know, with Levis, we, we've talked about it so much, how easy guy to like, yep. maybe a hard guy to love. Yep. Uh, that just you, you see the tape, you see the traits, yes. you see the tools. It's easy to be optimistic, but there's just something missing. Yes. And when there's something missing, it's hard to, you know, you, you can get close, but you can't get quite there yep. in terms of turning in that pick 
writing his name down and really saying this is the face of our franchise moving forward. So I get it. I understand. It's still a surprise that he's still on the board here as we start the second round. Uh, I'd have to imagine he's going to come off the board pretty quickly here. Now that's the question. To who? Yeah. Uh, does Hendon Hooker go first? Uh, right. How does that yeah. work? Do we see a trade up for one of these quarterbacks? So that's an interesting point here. I, th we talked about the Titans maybe moving up in the top 10 for Will Levis. Obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but they have a pick here in the second round. They could go up and go get him. The Rams, welcome to the draft. Right. Uh, are you going to make a, a <laughs> big splash normal, here? But there yeah, is right. a lot. Of, yeah. Like, don't mistake it. There, there's a lot of Rams fierce fans here surprising oh, them out in Kansas yeah. City, and that that is. They have a second round pick. This the, is like the biggest draft <laughs> they've had right, in a decade. Right, right. Woo! -hoo, we actually can celebrate. It. I would say just anecdotally, like uh, again watching Levis, and I came around on him. But that's also the thing with a first round quarterback. You shouldn't have to squint, yes, and sure. so that's why I always come back to it. It's like you shouldn't. Shouldn't truly have to go, ah, oh, oh, I really want, the, oh, okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. And the term I've always come back to at Levis, and as we talk about him more, but is that, is that he's robotic. And, and I don't mean that robotic like a stiff athlete. I, he's a good athlete. It's just robotic in his movements that everything feels predetermined. Mm -hmm. There's a drill that he, they didn't practice on Wednesday. He is doing it in the game. And it's like, is that feel or is that just like you learned a dance move? And how I refer to it too is that it's like a father or a husband practicing the first dance at the wedding mm -hmm. and then they just went through yeah. it I don't know if you you've Speaking got of my through personal this. experience yes right now. and then all of a sudden he's like he has to do it he gets through it. And it's like wow that's pretty good and it's like okay what else he got that, that's all I got he's using the dice but that's how Levis feels a, a scout a scout put it to me like this he, he follows the quarterback playbook perfectly yes. you know it, the size the toughness the smarts the toughness it, all that there but there's just something missing yep. from now so he's following the playbook right but uh, is it natural? Is it innate? Yeah. I don't. It, it's, it's, it's such hard a commentary that. on where the position is. Yeah. Because that little magic fairy dust that Bryce Young has, yeah. that Anthony right, Richardson right, right. certainly has, and what we were wondering if C.J. Stroud had it. Yeah. That was the biggest commentary and the biggest kind of conversation around C.J. Stroud. Does he have that creation ability? So I think being a little bit more robotic, being a little bit more statuesque, not having that feel. It feels more pronounced than ever when we're judging quarterbacks, and it feels more pronounced in this class because you're contrasting it to a group of guys that absolutely have it. Yep. It's kind of the best thing they have going for them. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes even some of the simple plays look a little forced or yeah. a little little harder than they should. So, and, and you know, it's tough with the, the situation he was yeah. in. You know, we've uh, some will say we've made excuses for him. I, you know, I look at him as reasons why yeah. he struggled at times because of the supporting cast and the, the offense just did not look right. right. Especially compared to 2021 when everything was going right and he, and he played at a high level, won 10 games uh, for that Kentucky offense. So it, 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 we don't kill the kid, but I, you know, when you start to talk about it, you understand why he's still here in the yeah. second round and. He'll, he'll get snatched up here pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll, we'll have to see how it plays out. You know, once you get into the, into the league, it's all about how you play. It doesn't really matter yeah, exactly. where you're drafted. Yeah, that's exactly Where right. do you want to see him land? I really do like the Rams landing spot. Mm -hmm. I really generally yeah. do. Um, and not because of just the background and everything, but it just makes sense to me. It's like, if someone's going to unlock him, why not the guy that did unlock him his junior year uh, at Kentucky and Liam Cohn? And I also just think that's a good transition plan um, for Matthew Stafford. It's kind of funny that there has been some comparisons between the two players. Don't have, exactly see it, but you know yeah. they're tough and they can do some trick shots, and that's about it. Well, but, two guys that he's been compared to are the two teams we've already mentioned: Tennessee yeah. Yeah. and the Rams. Matthew yeah. Stafford and Ryan Tannehill is kind of an amalgam of those two guys yes. in the best case scenario, and yeah. both of those teams could be in range to draft that's him. Excellent. Exactly. They could. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Titans would be interesting too. Um, and for after you know taking a nice safe offensive lineman in the first round, I really I was like, okay, you guys are listening, you guys are doing the safe stuff, getting on. Ba what did we keep saying yesterday, hit it in the fairway. Yeah, that's and it. that's what they did. That, nothing wrong with that. This would make a lot more sense to maybe okay, we did get a guy, and we mm -hmm. maybe we did really like him originally. So why not? Well, okay, here we go. Let's just let's ro roll with it. We were waiting for next year possibly to like start our clock. You know, Aaron Vrabel, I don't think, has a clock. I think he makes his own time, yeah. whatever he wants in Tennessee right now. <laughs> but I think that would maybe, you know, set it forward. And it's like, okay, this is a guy we did generally like, and we got him at a nice, safe spot. Trust your grades. Yes. It's fair yes. to say that teams did not have a first-round grade on Will Levis, uh, or else I think he'd be off the board at this point. Right. He had to have had second-round grades around the yes. league. And yeah. so, you know, where is that sweet spot where a team's going to swoop in and get him? Does it take a trade? Mm -hmm. Do they feel comfortable waiting to see if he falls? And then where does Hennon Hooker fall into this yeah. equation? Uh, could there be a situation where a team believes in Hooker more than Levis? It, it's possible. Yeah. Talk about Levis and the Rams being a potential fit. Talk about the Titans. What about Hooker? 
What, what do you think is a, a reasonable fit for him here early, midway through the second round? I mean, I think the Rams again. The Rams, I yeah, know, no, right? right? That's and another one. It, it really does. I mean, I, I would say, Man. I would say Minnesota. They don't Minnesota's, have a second-round yeah, pick. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think that's probably not realistic. But Hennon Hooker in Minnesota, I, I like that idea of a natural succession plan to Kirk Cousins uh, down the road. So that that one's a little interesting. Yeah. Um, I know, right? Any other ones? I know, like Lions, maybe? Like, you know, like, yeah. just like they would yeah. quarterback the future. But well, it's they like, have two second round picks. Exactly. And that, right? that, that kind of goes with their plan. They, they're kind of doing their own thing anyway. So <laughs> that would yes, make sense. They are. Speaking of the Lions, kind of a surprising night, a yeah. newsy night for them. Here to talk us through that is our Lions writer at The Athletic. It's Colton Pouncey. Colton, thank you very much for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. How you doing? Hey, Colton. We're doing okay. We've yeah. had an eventful 24 hours, but I would say not as eventful <laughs> as yours have probably been. Your reaction when Jameer Gibbs is the guy that comes off the board at 12 after that trade down from the Lions? Yeah, it was a big shock. You know, I think all of us in the Lions media were kind of checking Twitter, you know, had our notifications on, waiting for the pick. I think I was probably the first one to see it because my reaction was, whoa, Jameer <laughs> Gibbs? And I got to, like, break it to the room. Uh, so certainly a shock, but uh, when you hear, like, Brad Holmes talk about the running back position, you know, he said in his pre-draft uh, meeting with us that, He's not afraid to take a running back that early. You know, he's part of a draft team that took Todd Gurley 10th overall with the Rams. Um, to him, they're football players. So, hey, he got a football player that he liked at number 12 overall. So, obviously, they're picking at six. They trade down. Did they give you any insight into the thought process behind essentially how the dominoes fell last night to get to that moment? You know, Holmes said that he had a handful of players that were kind of his favorites in that range, and uh, some of them were taken. So uh, if I had to guess, I would say Devin Witherspoon going to the Seahawks kind of uh, with a curveball for them. Maybe they didn't expect it. So they, they decided to pivot there, um, trade it back to number 12. They ended up picking up the 34 overall pick as well. Um, so I think they're happy about the haul. Uh, they like Gibbs as a player. Um, we'll see who they get in the second round here at 34th overall. But um, I would say Witherspoon was probably the player they had their eye on. You know, for, in terms of fit, he fits a lot of what they try to do um, in terms of the man heavy corner. Um, has that dog mentality that Aaron Glenn looks for. So when he was off the board, it seems like, look, we're not taking Jalen Carter. Maybe they had issues with whatever during that process. Um, Tyree Wilson wasn't really a fit for them, I guess. Uh, so they traded back to 12th and ended up getting uh, Jameer Gibbs. And Brad Holmes was, you know, slammed the table happy. So I guess they got their guy. <laughs> It seems like, you know, Jameer Gibbs may be a little bit higher than people expected. Jack Campbell may be a little bit higher than people expected. Would it be reasonable to guess that after they move back to 12, maybe they had their eye on Gibbs at 18, and because of the sequence of events, everything got pushed up a little bit? Yeah, you know, Holmes did say that he looked at Gibbs at 18, but I guess he heard some rumors that uh, maybe the Jets at 15 were looking to take Jameer Gibbs, and that was probably, I think that's been later confirmed by some other people, so... Um, he mentioned like 15 as a spot. He started getting some texts as soon as he took Jameer Gibbs saying, hey, like there were some teams that were looking at him in the teens a little bit after you. So probably a good call for him to take him at 12. So that was kind of the feedback he was getting. Again, you can question running back uh, positional value and everything like that. But at the end of the day, they got a player that they like a lot. Um, you know, Holmes was at the Alabama Texas game early in the season when Jameer Gibbs was basically like their best receiver. Bryce Young and Jameer basically won that game for the <laughs> Alabama offense. So. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that that had a lot, had a lot to do with um, you know why they went up in and, and made that move and why they uh, ended up taking him at 12th overall. Beyond positional value, I'm curious about just the allocation of resources at this position for the Lions this offseason because they gave $11 million guaranteed to David Montgomery and then they draft a running back at 12. They give Alex Anzalone a pretty decent-sized contract to come back to Detroit. They already have Malcolm Rodriguez on the, on the roster. How do you envision those two positions shaking out after they've already spent a little bit on that a month and a half ago. Yeah, you know, their whole thing this offseason was just to get better, um, get better players on the roster, build out the roster as much as they can. And I guess they feel like they did that. Um, bring back Anzalone, that's a guy they like a lot, probably more so than uh, the rest of us, but they <laughs> love that dude. He, he's been their guy since, uh, you know, AG was in New Orleans with him as well and brought him over to Detroit. So that's their guy a lot. Uh, they like him a lot. Um, you know, getting Dave Montgomery, he's a player that, basically considered an upgrade over Jamal Williams, um, gives you a little bit more in the passing game than Williams. Um, they like him to be that kind of, a, you know, the tough runner inside that Jamal kind of played that role for them. So I think that's the fit there. Um, but also they've said they're not afraid to upgrade. And when you look at, you know, Jameer Gibbs and DeAndre Swift, they kind of play like a similar style in this offense, I think. So I almost wonder, and I, I, 
kind of threw this out on our podcast the other day. Like, if they take a running back early, what does that mean for DeAndre Swift? Uh, Holmes was asked about that yesterday, and he did not really give, you know, a, a resounding <laughs> answer. <laughs> DeAndre's on the roster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, that's all he's saying, like, we have, it hasn't changed anything yet. He <laughs> mentioned the word yet, and I was like, all right, so he might not be here even tomorrow. So we'll see if they end up making a, make a move there. But, um, you know, in terms of what they added, I think they feel like they, they upgraded some positions, and this is a year that they expect to be competitive. Um, you know, Lions have not won a playoff game since 1991. They have a roster that they feel is getting there. So if you have a chance to add some impact players, which they feel they did, um, and you can kind of lower up the roster and try to make a move and make a run here, like it's hard to fault that, but you know, some people will anyway. So a lot of ammo here in the second round for Detroit. What are the what's the priority list look like for Brad Holmes as we head into night two of the draft here? I'm looking at defensive tackle. Um, you know, I was wondering, okay, you pass on Jalen Carter, maybe you take Kwasha Kansi a little later, they pass on him too. Um, so I wonder if they have a guy, have their eye on a guy like uh, Keanu Benton from Wisconsin. They have that 34th pick now. I wasn't, I was kind of unsure if he would make it to 48. So now you have the extra pick. Maybe you kind of just take them there and say we're getting a really good player, a starting caliber player. Um, and that's three. Your first three picks are dudes that can basically start for you. So it seems like they're loading up. It seems like they want to win now. That would be another pick in that direction versus maybe, you know, I know some people have tossed out quarterback. I'm not sure if that's a position they'll look at in the second round just because their moves have kind of indicated they're trying to win now and just, you know, add potential starters. Um, so I think in the second round, that's kind of what I'm looking at, like defensive tackle, maybe tight end like Darnell Washington falls them at 48. Um, and then maybe you take a cornerback. That's a position that they kind of address in free agency, but they still have some long-term needs there. So maybe that's a spot for a corner at 55. So those are kind of three positions I'm looking at. And if I had to add one more, I'd probably say guard. Um, you know, Vitae is a free agent. He's got or the free agent, agent next year, he's got one year left. Um, you know, Jonah Jackson is a free agent next year. They, I'm guessing they're going to try to bring him back, but you never know with the market. So um, getting a young guard in there right now is probably uh, do them some good. A lot of work ahead of Brad Holmes tonight. A lot of work ahead for you as well, my friend. So we'll get you, let you get to it. Really appreciate the time. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Cole. Thanks. What do you think of that explanation? For the Jameer Gibbs, David Montgomery, DeAndre Swift backfield combined with the Alex Anzalone, <laughs> Jack Campbell, Malcolm Rodriguez linebacking core. Well, Dan Campbell was in New Orleans when they drafted Alvin Kamara. Yeah. All right, he saw that. And uh, who, I, in my report on Jameer Gibbs, I compared him to a combination of Kamara and Chris Johnson. And like, if you take those two guys, kind of yeah. put them together, and so you know a little bit of a mixture of the two. Gibbs is what I think what you have, what you're left with, and I think this is their version of of Kamara. And I, I think people lose their minds when you hear first round and running back together like that. I think we have to look at, especially the Gibbs pick, as a first round weapon, mm -hmm. offensive skill weapon, because that's what he is more so than strictly just a running back. He's going to line up in the slot. He's going to uh, be a big presence in the run, in uh, the passing game. Mm -hmm. So that value is different than what they thought they were getting with DeAndre Swift. And so we can talk about the value yeah. of drafting with 12th overall. I'm just excited about the player. Right. And I trust your offensive coordinator. Yeah. Trust Ben Johnson to Leo, know what to do with this new toy, shiny toy that he has. Uh, so I'm excited for what Gibbs is going to look like in that offense. Yeah, and like Ben Johnson in the Lions situation, it's actually one situation where I'm like, okay, like, you know, like he's probably going to get the most out of this. He at least has shown creativity of how to use guys. Right. Like even a guy like uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, who is a, a very effective player. He's like just brutally efficient as a receiver. Like that's the best way I can describe him. He never asked him to go like, you're never running a route past 12 yards. But he knows what he is. He knows his personnel. And that is a, a, a true strength that you can say it's a compliment I could give to uh, to Ben Johnson. And I, I thought it was interesting with Colton. Well, first off, he said, uh, yeah, Bryce Young and Jameer Gibbs, you know, they led him to victory. It was like they led him to a, a lot of a lot of points. That was basically the whole <laughs> offense for Alabama this past year. Yeah. Uh, but he's saying, hey, they're, they're, they're trying to win now. Like the, the quote, the trademarked wide open NFC like they're looking at it this way and they're going like let's crank this window open the rest of our divisions reconfiguring mm -hmm. like so okay maybe that's what how they view it like even with Jack Campbell I've talked myself way more into it because uh, yes there's a uh, this linebacker class is not deep at all like I mean you know better than anybody so they had a need there even though they paid Anzalone and like Colton said yeah not not too high on Anzalone, so it's like they needed a guy that can probably play here and play actually legitimate snaps if they want to compete like they think they are. I understand that. 
They, I know. They, no, I get it. Your window is now. I get that. There are a lot of teams whose window is now, yeah. and you still offset that by drafting high-value positions yeah. in the first round. The Eagles' window is now. The Eagles are still drafting edges and defensive yeah. linemen, all, all, yeah. no, no matter what. Even if the Eagles have a needed safety, which they have right now, even if the Eagles had a needed linebacker, which they did last year, they're not drafting those guys in the first round. No. So I still think there's a way to balance wanting to make your team as good as possible in the short term with understanding that the draft is for one, two, three, four-year considerations at high-value positions when you're talking about top 20 picks. Well, that's what that's just that's me. Yeah. No, no, I thought the Van, like even Van Ness going to pick later in 12. Like it was, I, I do like gifts. Offset like, those, two, those, those yeah. two plans, right? And, and that's what I, I always go back and forth to sometimes when it's like, okay, the other team wanted that guy too. It's like, well, you have guys in tiers, so, you know, right. at different positions. Right. And you're like, well, if that guy's not there, we go with this. And that it is what it is. So I think like being like scared of he's not going to be there, it's like it happens. That's how the draft unfolds. So we shouldn't maybe, you know, this is where reaching happens and all that, those types of things. So I did, I agree with you. I thought first and foremost to reinforce the trenches, at least defensively. That's where I thought the plan should go. But I understand, like, trying to add some explosiveness to an offense. So it's like you're trying to straddle both, but it's, it's hard. I, and you have to look at it. They probably thought Devin Witherspoon was going to be there at six. It's, that's, I, it seemed and, like it short-circuited it, that. that. Right. Yeah. And yes. once that was off the table, once Seattle took him at five, which props to Seattle for keeping that one close to the vest. No one, no one <laughs> saw that one coming. Once that happened, that's where Detroit, yeah, they, they you, I don't want to say they panicked, but, you know, they kind of, they weren't sure they weren't as confident in plan B, maybe. Right. And plan B was the trade back. And then at 12, it's like, well, we do really like Gibbs. We're going to try and take him at 18. Maybe let's just take him here. Yeah. Let's just, you yeah. know, and let's take him here. And then at 18, I, th their first round grades or their, their board must have been pretty small for Jack Campbell to be that next guy yes. over a Cansey who went a couple picks later to the Bucks or um, you know some of the corners who were th available right uh, there Christian Gonzalez had just went so and they could have had Christian Gonzalez at 12 right. if they wanted to do that route but Deontay Banks was there yeah, yeah. a few of the corners were still there yep. so they could have gone in a lot of different directions and for Jack Campbell I, so I had him going in my mock draft. It was just in the second round. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it just seemed like, could Buffalo have taken him at 27? Yeah, that maybe. 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 Yeah. But uh, to think that we had to take him in the top 20, it's a big That's surprise. Yeah. The idea, the Alvin Kamara idea, I totally understand that logic. And we, we do this all the time. It's like, okay, if the, this running back's pass catching value is this high, does he transcend that positional value discussion? And we bring up one or two guys every time that happens, usually mm -hmm. Alvin Kamara and Christian McCaffrey. Right. Are there any other examples? Eckler. Or is this, it. and maybe Eckler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But Eckler is, was an undrafted free agent. Yeah, exactly. Like, no, yeah. So this idea of, well, he's such a good pass catcher that he's more than just a running back, so we can have a different value discussion about him, very rarely does that actually work out in practice. So I think the idea of that always sounds nice, oh, yeah. but then when we get down to it, it's like, we're spending a lot of money on a guy that's now our fourth pass catching option, even if he's this, a good pass this catcher. This is what Urban yeah. Meyer said about Travis Etienne. Like this, this right, is, he was yeah, like, right. "We're going to use him like a yeah. slot receiver." And I was like, "Well, his ball skills aren't great, Urban." So right. <laughs> maybe he's not probably better. not better than the slot receiver you're going to use or you're going to have, or the one that they're going to sign the next offseason for eighteen million dollars <laughs> a year. That yes. they it. And Amon Ross St. Brown is already on yes, the line. The slot and that yeah. that hat on the hat stuff is, and even stuff with Gibbs and what I, I think he had to improve on his pass protection. Like that would yes. be one, a lot of college running backs. You can say this about well, most and at, of them. At 200 pounds, how much better can he do can that? He, yeah. And so that's, it's all about snaps play and how many touches you can feasibly get. That's why CMC, uh, when we talked about him and saying like his contract is actually pretty fair because he's basically a slot receiver and your number one rushing option. So it's like, that's, yeah. that's value right there. But I, I totally understand that, that that there's not enough guys that that actually it's a lot it's a theory thing it's like no that's great everybody loves their scat backs I thought James Cook was going to catch a thousand yards last that's year that's like, exactly the guy no, I was no, thinking about well, if we drop I this did, skill set in that, that is the exact thing I was talking or yep. thinking about because the Buffalo logic with James Cook is we already have so many other it's, weapons why wouldn't we just drop in a pass catching back to give us this one element we don't have then six months go by. Eight months go by until the end of the season. And you look at the Buffalo offense, it's like, oh, man, maybe we weren't right. as loaded as we thought we were. Yeah. And I think with Detroit's offense, there's a chance we get to the end of the season and we have all of this hope about what the Lions offense can be. And then we get to December and it's like, well, they got Jamison Williams who hasn't really developed as much as we thought he was going to and Amon Ross St. Brown and they don't really have a third receiver and they're piecing together their tight end position. And maybe this kind of cherry on top running back who is a pass catcher isn't as good of as an idea as we thought he was. Yeah, and he, just to be fair to him, I, he is much more than just a pass catcher, obviously. Yeah. Like, I think he is 
an offensive lineman's best friend as a runner because he is so good at press, sort, yep. get north. Exactly. Yep. He, his timing is impeccable. Yeah. It's, he has a real feel for it. So I think with that offense, I do think that he will be a really nice changeup to David Montgomery and the way they run yep. the football. So now, again, get back to the value part of it, taking that to 12th pick. I, I honestly, I wasn't sure we would ever see two running backs go in the top 12. Again? Again, yeah, ever, really. Yeah. Hey, we saw it with Christian McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette that, that year. That's that the last year we saw. And Melvin Gordon and Todd Gurley go 10 and 15? Yeah, Gordon was yeah not quite top 12, yeah. right? So 18, 20 or somewhere there. Yeah, it, th I did not think we would see it anytime right. soon where we'd see these running backs go top 12, but here we are. I think just I want to be clear about this so I get ahead of the, the blowback when Jameer Gibbs is incredible. <laughs> Brad Holmes and this Lions regime deserve the benefit of the doubt yeah. based on what they've done so right. far. I mean, I was a little, you know, you're going to stay put and pick Penny Sewell at seven when you can move back and some teams need quarterbacks yep. and you're so far away. They've sequenced this in a way that makes total sense for them has worked out well for them. So they deserve the benefit of the doubt, but I think that there's reason to be a little oh, bit absolutely. skeptical about what the strategy looked like last and, night. And what you're, you're bringing up uh, that he's an offensive lineman's best friend. I think specifically he's going to be the Detroit Lions offensive line's yeah. best friend oh, because yeah. if DeAndre Swift and Swift has his positives and like just like every running back but vision and getting right. his foot in the ground is not his his strength but for Jameer Gibbs it is yes his vision and feel and be able to if they have these open running lanes he's gonna be able to rip off 10 yard gains where Swift was running right into the back of the guard or bouncing a run to where he shouldn't be bouncing it that's where if Swift can average over eight yards a carry while he's healthy before he got hurt this year it's like Imagine a guy with better vision and just better feel as a running back. That's where he's going to – there's going to be some really fun explosive gains that he's going to create. Right. Let's change the tone of this a little bit. What was your favorite just fit last night? Player with team. So I know you love the Eagles plan overall, but one right. singular player, you're like, ah, I like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Maybe Buffalo. Uh, I mean, I know we yeah, talked about that a lot, but, man, I love that Let's pick. talk about it some more because I, yeah. I, I <laughs> have been changing my feelings. Yeah, no, I, you know, with dropping Dalton Kincaid, whether he's your slot receiver, whether he's, you know, however you're going to use him as a tight end, adding a pass catcher of that caliber, maybe the best pass catcher in this draft, adding him to the mix now, I just, I can't wait to see what that looks like. I, I think it could pay immediate dividends this year, his rookie season. It's going to make that entire offense better. Yep. Uh, Stephon Diggs is going to be better. Dawson Knox is going to be better. The run game should be better. Josh Allen should be better. Uh, for an offense that at times last year just did not always look like on, on the same page, mm -hmm. Dalton Kincaid's, I think, going to help put them in the right direction. Right. I, I, I mean, We said it last night, but I, I wholeheartedly love that fit. Like, I yeah. really do. Like, I, I had some issues where Kincaid was pro maybe would end up and what he would I'd be asked to do. But with the Bills, it's like, this was so needed. It's perfect. Personnel-wise, everything. I, I totally agree with that one. I like. Uh, I really like, of course, Anthony Richardson of the Colts, yeah. B. John Robinson to the Falcons, and these are just like, this is just pure schematic <laughs> fun. Like right, this is just right. what I, we don't have to talk about anything else. But I just really like those those, those fits. I, I really do. It's B. John with the Falcons offense uh, is. I'm giddy. Yeah. I, I'm giddy. Just a bizarre, bizarre football team. But yeah. in the best possible yeah. way. Yeah. You know, it, you know it when we watched them last year, it was almost listening to like a post-rock band. We're like, this doesn't <laughs> sound like it's supposed to sound, but just washing over me in a way that makes me happy. People are going to tune in. They're yeah. going to see yeah. how oh this works God. out. No, yes. no doubt about it's, it. It's a great concept album. Like, it, 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 really it absolutely is. is. And, and really, I liked uh, uh, Maisie Smith with the Cowboys. Yes. And I thought that was... It was one I didn't know I wanted, and now that I saw it happen, I'm like, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Like, what? It really does. Okay. That's what they needed. Yeah. It, Peanut butter it, on yeah. a burger? Yeah. yeah. That, that, actually, I didn't know I wanted that, but now it's great. Yeah, but that's how I felt about that fit, and I just think it's, it, man, that Cowboys defense got really better with a young, talented guy mm -hmm. that just fit perfectly for them. The other one I wanted to mention, too, Christian Gonzalez going yes. to New England. Oh, yeah. I mean, I hated to see him fall like that but man he had a nice landing a ni nice landing even though he was falling a little bit <laughs> yeah so to go to new england where they had smaller corners right now he's a big winner like oh, that, yeah. like yes. that he, no doubt. he won even though he fell in the draft exactly. which is good talk about how the lions deserve the benefit of the doubt i think the patriots that trust has eroded a little bit over the <laughs> yeah. last couple years mm -hmm. but every time they draft a corner or they make a move in the defensive backfield i think it's worth a light bulb going off in your mm -hmm. head it's like ooh. They like that guy? Yeah. I wonder mm -hmm. what that says. Why are you taking the safety from Lenore Ryan in the second yeah. round? It's exactly. like, oh, Kyle Duggar. Right. Yeah, there For it is. For all the swings yeah. and misses on wide receivers yeah. and some other positions, when they make a move in the defensive backfield, Belichick specifically, I think a little extra attention goes Absolutely. there. The one I kept coming back to from last night, now that Lamar has signed the deal, I've started to allow myself to go down the road of what the Todd Monk and Ravens offense will look like. And now you drop Zay Flowers into that equation. 
and I like Zay Flowers. But just the explosive element that he brings, and I know there's some questions size-wise and what his role might be, but the best version of Zay Flowers, a healthy Rashad Bateman, Odell Beckham, Nelson Aguilar taking the top off, the offensive line they already have, and Todd Monk and Colin plays. Yeah. I mean, there is a chance this thing is just yeah. fireworks. And it may take a little while. Yep. I'm assuming mm -hmm. that so there are going to be some kinks because it is going to be a departure from what they've been yep. in years past. But if they're trying to pivot hard and kind of step into the next phase of what they need to be on offense, I understand the steps they're trying to take to get there. No doubt. And even with that Beckham signing, we knew wide receiver is still going to be an option for yeah. them because they want to be more explosive. and. I mean, it just a matter, such, the, such a narrative change, the way we were talking about this Baltimore offense a month ago right. compared to now yeah. with Beckham in the fold, yep. Zay Flowers in the fold, and Lamar signed to that five-year contract. Yep. Uh, yeah, if you're the Browns, Steelers, Bengals, yesterday wasn't a great day for you. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, not no, at all. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think if you're a Ravens fan, you're obviously pretty giddy about it. There's no more Patrick Ricard third down screens. Like, that's, <laughs> no. they don't, no. that, that's, that's the thing. If this were... Uh, Greg Roman did, did do Greg Roman did do some nice things, but it's just if Zay Flowers was going with a Greg Roman offense, I'd be like, oh, really? <laughs> like another hitch route? Like where that's the only route? But like now we got Todd Munkin, who is really a mad scientist, mm -hmm. and anyone that's watched his Georgia offenses, his offenses when he was calling plays with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they're explosive. Like he finds his best ways. There's not just one Todd Munkin play; he runs everything. So, but now you're getting all these yak guys with Rod Bateman as well, Mark Andrews on over routes. It, it just, it's really fun. Like I, it's another, we were talking about it last night and it's like, it felt, all the receivers felt samey, but I didn't hate that. But for once I would kind of really like that. It's like, just, let's just get a whole bunch of guys that can just create uh, on slant routes and take the ball to the house. Watch George's offense last year and watch the tight end get sweeps. And yes. you know, I mean, just, he knows Crossers. the strengths of, of the team <laughs> yep. and how to, maximize what he has so yeah. That, that, yeah, that was a good one two three weeks ago I don't think there was a lot of underlying excitement about me watching the Baltimore Ravens offense in oh. 2023 now it's probably on a short list of the units I'm most excited yeah. to watch this year no doubt yeah so it's been a hard change what do they call that in basketball the week pass teams like, yeah, yeah that's it. That, but that's <laughs> seriously that that's what the Falcons were for me last year and it was kind of I compared it to the Northman, and I'm blanking on the director's name, uh, but you, I know you know it. But it was like a pop, it was like that was my little art yeah, house, yeah, yeah. art house flick. Uh, Eggers, know. Robert Eggers. Thank you, Eggers thank you. Name. I yes. knew you know it, but they were that was kind of my like little yeah high Rotten Tomato score, you know, from the critics, but then the audience score is a little lower. That was the Falcons' offense for me last year, but now it's like yeah, well, now we're gonna get that kind of Marvel movie. We're gonna get that you know 98 percent on both both accounts. So I'm really excited for the Falcons' offense. Uh, Northman starring the fullback from the Rams. Yes. There you go. <laughs> he was great. Too, by the way. He's great in succession right now. Steelers <laughs> officially on the clock, so hopefully we'll get get the pick here very soon. Is he a I'm, trade? I mean, yeah. Is someone going to trade up for that? And that, that's so that's my big question here. Yeah. Steelers are on the clock. Do we expect this pick to get moved? And if this pick gets moved, who do we think lands we in the talk, spot? Every year we talk about it, and it doesn't ever it get never moved. happens. And part of that is I think that the team picking first. You go home. You reset the board. You sleep on it, and you get excited yeah, about yeah. who's left. Yeah. yeah. And doing my mock draft last night and thinking about, okay, you know, Joey Porter Jr., yeah, it'd be a great story, but you know what? Brian Branch is yes, still out there. Yes, I saw you did I that. Love I love that. <laughs> Maybe not the DB everyone was expecting, but it's the DB you need. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I'd love to see that fit. Um, I, I imagine they're getting a lot of calls, though. Oh, I'm and sure. so you listen to that. Uh, a, a chance to pick up some more draft capital, some more picks maybe, uh, for a team looking to get Will Levis. Mm -hmm. when it, I think we're going to see these tight ends start to go. Michael yes. Mayer's still out there. Yes. Uh, the Lions have the third pick here in the second round. Michael Mayer, that'd be a great fit. It I'd would. love to see that there. Uh, so there, we've got a lot of good players still available and some intriguing fits here at the top of the second. Isn't it funny, like, uh, and especially we were talking about the Saturday-Sunday drafts, and it used to be the first pick of the fourth round. Yes. That was, the, oh, my God, everybody oh, yeah. was calling about it. It's still kind of, <laughs> it's kind of lost a little edge, you know, right, a little right. bit, but that used to be, like, the most popular pick yep. that everybody was moving up for right there, but this right, right then and there. But that's what's funny when now it's broken up into two nights or really three three days is that it used to blend from that first to second round and so when inevitably the Patriots traded back you still got to see their picks yes. that that day now it's like anyone that trades out of the first round it's like oh we got to wait you know we got to wait a whole another night so it's kind of just a different flow now and I'm still getting used to it which is kind of funny.
Brian Branch, I think, would make a little bit of sense with the makeup of the Steelers' secondary. Mm. They could use somebody to play in the slot, but outside corner is still a pretty big need for them, even after going mm. to get Patrick Peterson in free agency and on a pretty modest deal. Mikel Weatherspoon was hurt for a good chunk last year. They still have Levi Wallace. You know, it's safety, they got some options. Demonte Casey is still on the roster. They yep. brought him back, Mick Fitzpatrick, obviously. But if they drop another outside corner into this equation with the guys they have in the front seven, going to get Broderick Jones in the draft last night, making the move up for him, we talked about this. The offense pretty intact yep. you know around Kenny Pickett you put one more corner into the mix here with the guys they have on the second and third level or second and first level of that defense Steelers suddenly become like kind of an intriguing team if this falls the right way the, yeah if everything goes the right way they should you know George Pickens continues to ascend yeah. as a receiver and uh, that offensive line gels together yeah. with a, some new additions on there which should be a better unit for that team uh, and Keely Ringo, that's an option here if they want to go yeah. outside corner. Uh, the, the big f physical corner from Georgia, outstanding speed. Not many guys walking around look like Keely Ringo. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, – and, and I think there's a lot of different targets for teams making the calls up here. Yeah. Whether that's uh, – one of these quarterbacks, like we mentioned, Michael Mayer, possibility. Uh, defensive tackles, we saw a run on those in the late first uh, with Brian Brzee, Mozzie Smith. Uh, could we see uh, Adeboare, the Northwestern defensive yeah. tackle, come off the board here pretty quickly? Uh, so I think a lot of t potential targets yeah. from teams looking to move up. And that's, again, this is the draft of the eye of the beholder of more than uh -huh. anything. So that's what, it, I'm glad you're breaking it down because it used to be sometimes where it's like, oh, well, this guy's remaining, so we, we, we got to go here. Right, right. I'm glad you threw in Branch as the as the mocked pick for there, though, because it was just like, oh yeah, he's still around. Yeah, he was. Yes. A lot of people had him going top 20 for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then kind of like fell off after testing. But he's just a football player. That's it. He really is, and it's kind of like a very Steeler type of guy. Oh yeah. <laughs> like just as far as football IQ and just kind well, of more than he, he played he played the star position. Yes. At Alabama that Mika Fitzpatrick popularized. Oh, God, so right. to pair those or to get those guys together. Oh, I know. Like, yeah. Just two geniuses actually, like yeah, football yeah. geniuses. Like, I, I, the I Steelers, love that. They love those guys. They do. I mean, just think about all the defensive players that kind of fit that mold over yeah. the years. Troy Paul, Malo, McKinnon, Fitzpatrick yep. there now. Just guys who have that Even sense. Even TJ Watt up front. Like, because mm -hmm. then they run like defense where, uh, under Keith Butler where they're just like, yeah, just freelance. Do, yeah. do what you want. You see it go. It's yeah. like, oh, God, I can't believe they let them do it. But okay, go for it. That's a Steeler way, apparently. They, that plan that they had a couple years ago, this is way off topic, but when they had TJ Watt, Cameron Hayward, the defensive lineman from Notre Dame that they had there for a little while, who's now there. Oh, oh Tuit. Uh, Stephon Tuitt. So yes, when they had Tuitt Tuit and Cam Hayward there together, they because Hayward was such a rock, yeah. they could let Tuitt do whatever he yeah. wanted. So yeah. that kind of combination of those dudes who were uber reliable, dudes who were just playmakers outside of structure, yeah. and one kind of rotating around the other, it's like a symbiotic relationship. It's very cool to see happen. That's yeah, really cool. and now with Alex Highsmith emerging as yeah. being a yep. legitimate pass rusher in this league, and Larry Ogunjobi's there, and so, you know, they, they've got some things to work with in that front seven, um, and it's just a, it's about building the secondary, and, yeah. you know, so you bring in Patrick Peterson, what's that going to look like? Uh, so if they did go outside corner here, it's, it's no mystery why they would. That, that seems like the one area they, they definitely need to get better. They wouldn't. They would. I, I like that they want Broderick Jones too. And this is. Yeah, it's like the, form, right? This is yeah. This is just gonna be hanging kind of over my head until I actually do is studying the Steelers' offense because I just I really want to know what what happened. I, I stopped paying attention to the offense because like oh, it, they were happen. on the no fly list for yeah, a while, they were man. On the no fly list mm -hmm. for a long time, and now it's like oh, okay, come on, yeah, okay, you're back in coach. <laughs> you're in row 32C. So I, I'll be now. I can actually watch these guys again. So I am just interested, just like. Because they probably don't need another pass catcher, right? With Pickens getting rid of Claypool and all that, but it's and they like, signed, they traded for Allen Robinson. And, and, right now, yes, they're, exactly. They're drafted Calvin Austin last Calvin year. Calvin Austin last year and, and Deontay Johnson. So it's like that's and now you can kind of limit it. That's what's fun is that they now have this kind of very young offense. It's kind of how the Bengals have been kind of put together the last couple of years. And I talked about this last night. A young offense, we can pay our defensive players. So it's it's interesting now to maybe drop in another little youth injection p potentially right now. Well, pick is in, so they're not trading it. There we go. It's uh, they're never, it's they're, they're gonna, never they're, get straight. <laughs> they're going to stick and pick. So. For other potential trade options. So the Cardinals are now owners of that 33rd pick right. after the trade with the Texans. I assume that they're still very open for business at this stage of things. Oh, yeah. So. It, the way they set themselves up for next year with adding a first and third from Houston, uh, they might have two top five two top 10 picks next year. Uh, so they, they're looking pretty, but they've got some work to do still here on day two. Wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, they made a move back. Detroit's 
the third pick uh, after the next pick after Arizona, what are they looking at? Are they looking again, stick with the theme we talked about with Colton, just adding starters, guys that are come in and, and help this team better right now? Those are really the only other moves from yesterday that have shaken up the second round. Obviously, the Packers now own the Jets' 42nd pick, which yep. is their first of two second round picks. And then the few more trades from earlier, the TJ Hawkinson trade coming into play here, the Roquan Smith trade with the Bears. But yeah. the top of the second round is what we saw get shaken up yesterday. Right, exactly. And so uh, we'll see if we see. I'm, I'm sure we'll see some more trades here uh, as teams move around. The quarterbacks especially. Yeah. Seems like that's going to be... We talked about in the first round. There's certain points of the first round where trades could really make the drafts go this way mm -hmm. or that way. And I think we'll see that here in the second round pretty quickly. And, and, I mean, just every position here, even the receiver position, because we've talked about how there's a lot more role players in, on day two. Yeah. It's like now we actually get to see where these guys end up because there could be some really fun kind of receiver two, receiver three, even super receiver fours that could go on day two. And we talked about how, you know, there's only so many first round grades. Yeah. There's only so many second round right. grades. And so at some point, that's going <laughs> to fall off a little bit. And Teams want those top 40, 50 picks. Yep. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of former players in the second mm. and the third round yeah. today. So, and even like current players, like Toronto. Wow. Look at how Alan Fanica looks. He looks phenomenal. He does. Never would He looks guessed. like he should be either. like it. No. Uh, you see it in the face, but not oh, that. Gosh. Wow. He looks like he'd be sure like the a third just, lead like a Western right now. I think right he just now. won a Augusta. Okay. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the best possible story, <laughs> yeah, I think, I yeah. for who they could have taken the Steelers with this yeah. pick. It's Joey Porter Jr. from Penn State, the corner. We'll talk about outside corner. Yeah. They go with the position of need and to a very familiar place to find <laughs> that position of need. Right. And what a great story. Going yeah. where his dad was, That's you cool. know, a Pro Bowl player. Uh, he grew up in that locker room, mm -hmm. um, very familiar with that franchise and that organization and the opportunity that he has to go and play for Mike Tomlin and that, and that franchise, that, that's awesome. He's obviously big corner, physical, 34-inch yep. arms. I mean, basically the same arm length as Broderick Jones. And so get him, park him in press, let him get physical, let him disrupt the timing of routes. Um, you know, decent speed, uh, not, not, he's not a burner, but he's mm -hmm. not speed deficient. A uh, little stiff, mm -hmm. worry about that a little bit. You know, that's why he's still here with the first pick in the second round. But, uh, and I wish he made more plays on the football. But with all that said, you just don't see guys with that size, that, uh, that length, that mm -hmm. ability. So it, 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 we talked about outside corner being a big need. It fits. It's, it's funny because usually the children, the ones that have pedigree from NFL players, kind of usually go similar positions, like the Bosa's from right. their dad, yeah, Bosa. Right. Uh, Brian Cox, Brian Cox Jr. Uh, my dad was a tight end, and of course I was an idiot and decided, no, I'm a quarterback, so I didn't <laughs> listen to that, even though I was 6'5". Uh, but no, it's he plays it like an edge player. He plays mm. corner like an edge player, good and bad. Very handsy. And this is why, and he, he loves to be physical, like Dane said. It's that if he loses right off the press, it's ooh, you're, you're scared. His, right. his ability to recover, um, where you're speaking about stiff, if a guy breaks on him, if he loses right off the press and that guy breaks on him, it, you're a little antsy with it. But you do love the physicality. You love that he's just going to bring it every time. He is competitive, just like his dad was. Um, he first flashed to me last year when he played against Ohio State mm -hmm. and because he was giving Garrett Wilson some issues because he was right. mugging him up. <laughs> and yeah. that, he was like, okay, I'm going to bring it to you. But then you saw Garrett Wilson get him a couple times. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I yeah. can see maybe uh, uh, why you're kind of like slotted where you're at. But even speaking of slot, like that's the thing. He's outside only. Right. I don't see him ever no. making that transition. He doesn't have that agility, that foot quickness, that kind of ability to change direction where you like him in a slot, even though he is a physical and a willing tackler and all that. Yeah, he did not do the three cone, the short shuttle. <laughs> he opted out of those yeah. events. <laughs> He's uh, the DK Metcalf, of course. Yeah, like, right. That's kind of what he is. You know what, that's okay. Uh, the last two years, 11 coverage penalties, uh, nine pass interferences, two hold, defensive holdings. He will get physical. Very it's handsome. a double-edged sword. You have to be okay with that. Yeah. Live with the good. Uh, and it's just it's part of him, and mm -hmm. that's okay. I, I think that he's going to come in pretty quickly and uh, compete for a starting job. Absolutely. It's been a while since the Steelers have taken this sort of swing at the position. Think about how they've tried to fill it over the last three or four years. Yeah. A lot of low-risk signings. Yeah. You know, guys, guys like Levi Wallace, those middle-of-the-pack right. kind of guys. Artie Burns in 2016 Burns, yeah. is really, and then Senquez Golden the year before, or Golson yeah. the year before. 
did not work out. So <laughs> they Justin made him a little bit scarred. Third rounder, okay. yeah. like yeah, they, Cam Sutton was a third rounder, right. but it's been a lot of those mid-tier yeah. kind of acquisitions, both in the draft and free agency. So this is a little bit richer than we've seen them go at the spot in a little while. Yeah, no doubt. They, they've missed on some corners. Corner has been maybe a little bit of a blind spot for them. Um, you know, they, when Cleveland cut Joe Hayden, that was a good fit for Pittsburgh for a couple of years. But for the most part, yeah, they've they've struggled to draft and develop that position. We'll see if Joey Porter uh, Jr. can change that narrative a little bit. That's what's just so funny is because they're so good at drafting receivers yeah. and developing receivers. And it's like some teams are just like this, where it's mm-hmm. like they just nail one position, other teams, eh, or other positions, just not so great. Uh, but it's kind of funny how they've had some accomplished defenses, some really good defenses, despite truly not having corners. Mm-hmm. They, they just they built through the spine, and it's working for them. It's it, it's interesting. There you go. There's so the we, we were okay. wondering what the trade was going to look okay. like. The Titans go to 33, trade with the Cardinals and the pick is in immediately my question about the Titans and quarterback was did they like one of the quarterbacks in this draft and is that the reason that we heard all the chatter about them moving up or right. were they motivated to find a quarterback full stop and I think we're about to get our answer here this is interesting yeah so the Cardinals we talked about maybe they're not done moving trading right. okay they pick up a third round pick uh yeah they kind of flop oh yeah they switched they basically, yeah, switch. That's backwards. not a lot to give up no. if you're Tennessee. No. That's no. not a lot to give up at all, especially if this is for a quarterback. Cardinals were more than willing to get out of there, uh, move back a little bit. And for Tennessee, yeah. It's that's just, essentially like a seventh no. round pick, mid the end of a yeah, second, no, yeah, seventh round. Like, it's almost nothing to yeah, move back eight not, spots. They move back eight spots here and then move up nine spots with their, their thirds. Yeah, that's actually a pretty no, damn good I, trade for the oh, Titans yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not too much to give up for them. I mean, kind of you would think this is for the quarterback. You would think yes. this is for Will Levis, who they d- did a lot of work on. Okay. Uh, they, we thought maybe at 11, that was a possibility. Uh, Rain Carthon. Oh, we have the. Looks like there's another pick involved. Okay, here. there's okay, a, a 2024 third. Yes, involved. There it okay. is. that makes a okay. lot more sense. Yes, I was okay. like, uh, the math isn't working out. 2024 third is in the. Okay, for the Cardinals, you're adding another 20. So they now have another 2024 20, third. They, yeah. they just yeah. need this, bodies. This is great. <laughs> yeah, good job. This is exactly Pretty how they body. should be operating. Well, it makes sense that these two teams traded with yeah. where Ronnie right. came from, uh, yep. being a Titan so, guy. Some teams need bodies, other need playmakers. Cardinals are in that bodies uh, category, <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. So. Yeah, I mean, Will Levis, he was a, a 30 visit for the Titans. You know, Rand Carthon, first year as the GM, uh, as, as a GM. But with Tennessee, would he go get the quarterback? Is this the right time to do that? They drafted Malik Willis in the third round last year. Right. Uh, obviously, John Robinson did that. But, uh, you know, wh- how did that factor into their decision making here? So I, it, at this point, 33rd pick, didn't have to give up too much. Um, it would make sense for the quarterback, Will Levis. Will. And, man. It would be really funny if he goes with Ryan Tannehill here, like, well, <laughs> because that's the comparison for him. Right. Uh, my question was the sequencing. N- Dane talk about the timing of it. You know, this is a team I think we all believe is not going to be very good this year. Yeah. Next year's quarterback class is very good. Did you feel an urgency to go get your guy? And clearly they did, because yeah. the pick is in, and it's Will Levis from Kentucky, the 33rd pick here, Dane. Yeah. What do you think about the fit with Will Levis in Tennessee? Uh, really like the fit, um, and it's 20 picks later we thought might have happened if he was going to end up in Tennessee. Um, I, it's funny how Will Levis will go down as a second-round pick when no one would have been surprised if the Titans moved up to six and drafted him there. It, that, that is a perfectly logical outcome that could have happened, and nobody would have batted an eye. Uh, but here he is. They're getting him with a second-round value. Um, I love that play right there where he's, yep. he saw it quickly. Boom, it's out, that release. Um, it, it, he just does a really nice job using the tools that he has to go make something happen. And, it, again, it's not always pretty. Yep. It's not always on time. Sometimes he needs to see things quicker. Yep. But when you're 6'4", 235 pounds, you're a good athlete, you're smart, you're tough, you have an outstanding arm, you can just do a lot of things. Yeah. And I think, just like we talked about with Richardson, uh, you know, obviously the, the tools and the upside, I wanna talk about the floor. Yeah. How that raises your floor as a quarterback. I think the same thing with Will Levis. I think that raises his floor with the, all the tools that he has where he can at least make something happen. And even in the games where there's some low lights and he's making mistakes, yeah he can still make something happen because of those tools. Talk and about some of those tools. What kind of player, why don't you show us what kind of player the Titans are getting and will love us here, Nate? First and foremost, the, the offense that he played in, of course, this has been a big talking point, some of the appeal with Levis, was that he played in a pro-style offense. And so what that means with pro-style is a lot is under center here. And this is what some of the appeal was. This is why I've kind of, we've made jokes that it's like, oh yeah, Shanahan guys are gonna love this guy. 
is right here is not the all these guys all these top quarterbacks did stuff under center so I don't want to say that they didn't but they weren't doing stuff like this which is a quick hitting play action play and this is something a lot of guys have to learn at the NFL level if you see this it's he's taking one two three four five planting the foot and the ball's out and that is a very very like not an easy throw to make and not something hard. it's very hard to get used to it really is uh, as someone that had to do it and watching Russell Wilson do it really easily it was really frustrating for me <laughs> uh, but also when you're watching Will Levis is his arm talent right here is him resetting in the red zone we talk about room for error is right here is two of his guys kind of run into each other if you watch this receivers right here is they kind of run and they, there's not a lot of great spacing there this is supposed to be a little move this is a very popular play in the red zone but you see Levis reset I'm going to show the end zone view here but watch him reset and that ball just comes out like that is blurred <laughs> because that ball is that's the release you were talking about yes. yesterday when we were talking right. about Will Levis this, this lightning fast this room for error that he has and how quickly he can reset there just one and that ball's out He's able to pump and do that. Some of these guys have elongated motions. Anyone that's where the, the Stafford comparisons come from. Yes, really. yeah. and that, that's exactly it. it it's, just, it's just that quick release. And if you notice on a lot of his highlights is that his teammates don't do him a lot of, a lot of favors. It's either throwing <laughs> trick shots, he's under pressure, but that actually lets it translate because you have bad offensive lines. He's going to have a bad offensive line in Tennessee. So he's able to do this in these trick shots, but then you see this a lot, teammate dropping the ball. So you see that pressure coming in right around here, and he's still able to get this throw off, change his arm angle. That is very real. That is very translatable. That is why Will Levis, people like him. It's just that he's tough. He's athletic. He can change arm angles. He can make all the throws. It's just that he's a little bit robotic when he does so. But he does have that element of trick shot into him. Lions pick is in at 34. They go with Sam Laporta, tight end from Iowa. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I, I yeah. wanted them to find this sort of yeah. player. When I was thinking about the, tight, the Lions and, again, those kind of secondary pass catchers that they needed to add to the mix, running back isn't the first place I went. It was pass catching tight end. And they find one yeah. here in Sam Laporta, Dave. Uh, I mean, a little surprised he went ahead of Michael Mayer. Yes, obviously. yes, that's yeah. where I want to start. And, and not just Mayer, but Musgrave. Yes. Uh, Darnell Washington. Yep. Uh, even Tucker uh, Kraft. Yeah. Uh, so, so a little surprised he went ahead of all those guys. But this is a, it's just a good football player. They, they, they get both Iowa players, yeah. uh, Jack Campbell <laughs> yeah, and now right. Sam Laporta. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he is a I don't, not a high ceiling, but just a solid. I mean, he's th it's no mystery what the Lions are doing here. No, absolutely. You know, they're going for give us the solid starters. You know, we can forget traits and like the upside, and let's go with the solid football players yeah. that we know what they can do. And Laporte is that guy. He has, he was the guy in that offense, the, he, the receiving uh, target, and still defenses couldn't stop him. Uh, really, he's a dependable receiver. Yeah. He, nobody may, had more missed tackles at tight end than he did at the FBS level last year, so he can do something after the catch. That Kentucky game, yeah. in the bowl game. Uh, but he had, he, uh, suffered a meniscus injury, came back just for the bowl game. A lot of guys, they're packing it in that start our, our draft prep. He came back just for the bowl game when most guys are opting out. So this is a guy that loves football. Uh, talking to scouts about him, they say how does he have the athleticism as, as a Noah Fant or a TJ Hawkinson? No, not necessarily, but he has the toughness yeah. of uh, – George Kittle, yeah. uh, the other Iowa tight end that yeah. you know we talk about so much. So you have that competitiveness, that toughness, that you, you know that matters to the Lions. He, he, I made a joke throughout the kind of process that Sam Laporte is everybody's second favorite tight end. Yeah, and yeah. he ended up being the second tight end that went, which is kind of <laughs> I, I had him slotted exactly the same way you did when we broke down broke down the tight ends. There was a couple of little changes that we had or differences. He was tight end six for me because, mm -hmm. but there is a lot to like because. He's smart, tough, dependable, but is a pretty good athlete as well. They would split him out. Um, like, I have clips. Don't, I, I can show you guys. Don't you worry. But it's, uh, they split him out. They can isolate him. He blocks. He's a willing blocker. Yes. I said as he, uh, maybe I thought, maybe projected him more like early third type, that if he was transitioning to the league, his first role could be an ace special teamer. Like yeah. I thought, because he just has that athletic ability, that toughness, that smartness. It, it, smartness. It is, but he just does a lot. He can be a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. You can split him out. You can run screens for him. He can create after the catch. He does a lot of things well. Yeah. He's very, very useful. And he's a smaller player. He's 6'3", 245. Yeah. Yeah. For you know, a tight end, that, that's a little bit smaller than you usually see. Uh, but it's something that you know mattered to this team. He told scouts you know, when they asked him, hey, you know, why'd you come back for your senior year? You would have been a day two pick last year. He, he told scouts, I wanted to come back and be a captain. Yeah. 
Yes. That mattered to me. Mm -hmm. I, that was really important. I wanted to be a captain for, for the Hawkeyes. And cool. you know that's catnip for the Lions. <laughs> I was talking. Exactly what they wanted. I was talking to an offensive coordinator a couple weeks ago. We we're talking about tight ends, and they huge fan of Dalton Kincaid. So he had an elite trait because he was a great yeah. pass catcher. Second favorite tight end because in my mind, in his mind, this is the next guy, guy's a pass catcher. We yeah. thought that if I couldn't get Kincaid, maybe this would be our second option. What else did Ben Johnson have to say? <laughs> With Sam Laporte, yeah. and I think that this kind of signals the shift that we were talking about last night, and even over the last week or so. This idea of secondary pass catchers. Yep position agnostic yeah. who are your secondary pass catchers and the shift to these sorts of tight ends these guys who weigh 240 245 yes. pounds because we just need other playmakers with the football I think Dalton Kincaid and Sam Laporta being the first two guys off the board is a signal of that shift it, it really is it's something I've really come around on and we talked about on the tight end show again it, it's it's pass catchers it's not just receivers and everything mm -hmm. yes you want guys kind of locked into kind of more permanent roles this is our wide tight end that is in line this is our outside receiver okay you have one of each and it's like everybody else interchange them yeah. the, the f tight end the f receiver yeah. though slot receiver the running back i mean this is right. they have another weapon with there gibbs with right. gibbs there it's like they just want a secondary they have amon ross st brown okay let's build this triangle now we got laporta gibbs and amon ross st brown work in the middle that's pretty fun and can anybody tell me who the top tight end on the lions depth chart is before this sam laporta pick oh my god i mean any Michael something <laughs> uh, Brock Wright. That's that's oh. the name I keep coming back to. Oh, speaking of tight ends, there's a tight the end Raiders oh trade goodness. up from 38 to 35, give up a mid-round pick in the process, and here it is: Michael yeah. Mayer from Notre Dame coming off the board to the Raiders. What do we think here, Dane? 6'4", 250, uh, a guy that's going to help them, especially in the red zone. Um, one of the better contested catch. Uh, receiving tight ends that I've ever evaluated. Yeah. I mean, it does not matter what's going on around them. The, the hand-eye coordination, uh, the hand strength, it's really impressive. Is he a big-time athlete? No, but he's a more than functional athlete for the position. He can create little pockets of separation. Uh, he is a, a workable blocker. He can line up in line. Uh, he can be at work out of the slot. He can do everything that you want. He's just a rock-solid player. It, a lot of the things we talked about with Sam Laporta uh, it also qualify for uh, for for, uh, my, for Mayor. And the day he showed up in South Bend, he was the guy. Yeah. And, and he immediately was productive, dependable, and especially this past year, just like we talked about with Laporta, he was number one receiving option. Not many people can tell you a Notre Dame receiver from last year because there it was not what they used to make that offense go. They leaned a lot on Michael Mayer. He answered and was able to be productive. Just line it up. That that was he's underrated as a receiver and mm -hmm. overrated as a blocker. That's kind of the line I've used throughout the spring. Is that he they split him out just like these other guys we talk about, and he was winning man zone whatever you want different route types. He they designed shot plays for him off like play action, and he's more than fluid to be down the field adjusting for the ball. He's an athlete. Yes. He just he's just a functional athlete. That's the best way to put it. It's so easy to look at him and be like, that's an NFL tight end. Is his blocking is he's naturally strong. He's like strong as an ox. Like he, he really is. Real. Just says that, it's very that, natural. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like it's weird. It is because his blocking technique isn't good, but he still moves guys. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay, well, that's that's a good thing. You're still getting movement and your technique is shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but it is, <laughs> I thought we were on the podcast right now, uh, is that it, it's not good. Uh, and so it's that way we can work on that. We coach him up. His like, this is good. And especially for the Raiders now, not, not Darren Waller. Foster Moreau yeah. is no longer there. They have Austin Hooper now. Okay, Austin Hooper's yeah. kind of the rental. Yep. And perfect. They had a perfect need for this. This really makes sense for what the Raiders want to do on offense. We talked about this heading into the draft because they didn't have a first or second round pick last year because they traded for Devontae Adams. Mm -hmm. We hadn't really seen this Dave Ziegler, Josh McDaniels regime draft. Doesn't this feel like a Patriots it does. pick? Yes. And Michael Mayer yes. going into the second round of the Raiders, it feels like something the Patriots would have done. Yeah. So kind of now grafting those Patriots ideas onto this regime and with Las Vegas, it's starting to make a little bit more sense now. Even in the first round with Tyree Wilson, you know, yeah. right? seems like a, that, that type of pick. And then here with Michael Mayer. And Think about the last time the Patriots drafted an edge in the first round. What was his biggest trait? Length. Yeah. Chandler Jones. Chandler Jones, right. right. Yeah, that's it. Push that pocket. That's what, that's what they like. Just read the power. Everybody, that's the pocket. This is going to 
help Jimmy Garoppolo with yes. that offense, um, help Devontae Adams and, and the rest of those receivers. So, you, you know, with you're right, with uh, Foster Moreau not there, Darren Waller not there, this is a little bit of a shift with what they're doing at tight end, but with Austin Hooper in the yeah. mix, now Mayer. Jacoby Myers. Yes. Right, yes. bring them in, uh, working on him out of the slot. So. It's an a lot interesting of guys collection I like. of I was receivers. Say, it's yeah. a lot of guys I like, yeah. I'm still terrified of the offensive line, <laughs> yeah, the state yeah, of the true. offensive line with the this Raiders, true, but yeah. this group of pass catchers, I wish the quarterback was more exciting, but I do like the guys catching the football here. I do too. Yes. I, I really like Mayer. I mean, he was my tight end one as well, and mm-hmm. it's just like, it, 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 don't overthink him. <laughs> That's why I just kept telling people, it's like, just don't overthink him. Is he going to be just crazy? He's not going to be Kittle 30 yards down the field, hooting and hollering as he's catching a seam route, like ad living that. Right. No, but he's going to be that steady Eddie for you. That's and why Jason Witten heard, heard those comparisons a yes, lot. Yes, it, it makes so much sense. Like, yeah, he, he might, tap, well, get, might sneak in a thousand yard season, but you can see him year after year again, that 800 yards, right. you know, that 70 catches, like just churning that over year after year, a few touchdowns. He's just useful. Like, the, like the, it's, he's going to play so many snaps for you because you can split them out. You can use them in uh, jumbo stuff. You use them in line. You can use them as a wing. You can write in screens for them. That's what Notre Dame did at times with him, and he was good on it. He created yards after the catch. So, like I've said before, is that, that strength comes through as uh, explosiveness, and that comes through with his route running sometimes because he'll run out of stuff and his ball skills as well. Like Dane said, the contested catch stuff. He's just a good football player. I have to assume that one of the reasons he lasted a little bit longer and ends up being the third tight end off the board, Dane, is that the ceiling is just a little bit lower. You right. mentioned George Kittle. George Kittle is an otherworldly athlete. Yeah. When you're betting on traits at the position, I think that's when the ceiling starts to come into play. And for as solid of a player as Michael Mayer is, he doesn't have an elite trait in any one area as an athlete. And it'd be interesting if he were in last year's draft, which yeah. was not viewed as a tight end. Uh, you know, there's some nice tight ends last year, but it wasn't viewed as a tight end rich draft. Right. Where this pick or this draft, it is. It's a very deep position. Mm-hmm. So a lot of teams probably said, hey, you know what? We can wait a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have to force the issue. Again, still surprised Laporta went ahead of him. And, yeah. uh, you know, Luke Musgrave is still out there, Darnell Washington. Mm-hmm. So we'll see the tight end run continue here. But, uh, yeah, it's surprising to see he fell where he did. Tory Holt yeah. announcing the pick for the Rams here, 36 overall. Steve Avila from That's TCU yeah. going to Los Angeles, Dane. Uh, this is a team that needed a lot of work in a lot of areas. Right. They go interior offensive line. Bit of a surprise? Uh, you know, I think when as you're building, you want versatility in that offensive line. Steve uh, Avila gives you that. He started at center, mm-hmm. started at guard. Uh, he's that wide-bodied blocker, 330-plus pounds. But he does have quickness, and he's really smart. I think that's what stood out to NFL teams. Played center. Uh, right, yeah. right. I mean, <laughs> I, he understood where he needed to be, what his angles needed to yeah. be. He's a very smart player, and that matters to a lot, especially when offensive line coaches get involved, you know. I mean, they they meet with these guys. They, they learn more about them. I promise you, Steve Avila was a, someone that really impressed throughout the process with his ability, his knowledge. Uh, and the tape is really good, too. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, again, if you want to play him at center, you want to play him at guard, that interior offensive line versatility matters in a big way to several teams, especially a team like the Rams. Well, that matters so much. I, I love your talking about the versatility because injuries happen. And they what did. happened to that yeah, Rams offensive line? Rams. Yeah. 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 No what kidding. happened to the Rams offensive line last year? Yeah, some injuries cropped up, and you want as many guys that you can that can snap the ball, much less play center like feasibly. Um, that's why when you see maybe a guy like uh, um, John Michael Schuster and uh, Joe Tipman, the top centers of this draft, they're kind of center only. I mean, Tipman <laughs> might be able to bounce the guard, yeah. but it's like they're kind of center only. So that's why you see this, and it's like his upside as all three of those positions that gives guys a lot of bump. That's a lot more value with this position. But speaking of the angles and everything, that's what it, it – when you watch him, you're like, okay, this, I, at first I was going to picture like Gabe Jackson. Mm-hmm. Like just mm-hmm. blind, but I'm knocking this guy right. out when I pull. He does have a little more because he's smart. Knows how to be fluid. It like lets yeah. him be a more athletic. And body balance. control. Body yeah, control. Yes, right, that's a good. Yeah. Way. He knows how to play within himself, which I, is really fun to watch. He, he was a fun watch actually. He was, and I think this yeah. is where that interior offensive line. I was going to ask you if it was going to start now. Yeah. Kicking something off here, here with that pick. Right, and, and you know Osiris Torrance is still out there. Uh, a few others, but you know, the Seattle Derek making uh, 37th pick. Seahawks go with Derek Hall from Auburn. We knew that edge in front seven was going to be a need for Seattle. Yeah. A little bit higher than some of the other guys, I think, it, that you had on your edge rankings, though, Dan, correct? Uh, yeah, you know, with um, 
we've got we still got a few of those guys out there with uh, Keon White uh, still out there Georgia Tech but I mean Derek Hall he he was I think that next guy B Jaja Larry still out there mm. but Derek Hall he talk about those those fairway shots and this that's what he is he is a going to be a solid starter in this league not going to give you the most creative counters secondary yeah. moves he's a hard charger who is just going to go 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 uh, and just a fascinating story I mean he was born four months premature. Doctors told his mom, hey, this is there's no quality of life here. You know, it's just it's they wanted her to sign a, a do not resuscitate, you know, and just kind of move on. And uh, his mom didn't give up on him. And here he is, six, uh, six, four, 255 pound defensive end now in the NFL uh, for the Seahawks. Uh, this is exactly what Seattle needed as they continue to build on that defense. And that, we, we were so surprised that they took Witherspoon yesterday because right. we're like, well, that was kind of your strength anyways, but all right, cool. You're adding, you're adding another kind of what they think is a star quality player up there, but they needed to address the front. Yes. <laughs> they needed to address that front seven in, in some way, shape or form. This makes a ton of sense adding just, you know, they needed this. Like they don't have that many players that can play those spots tangibly. And this, like you said, he's going to give it his all. He's going to just go, go, go. Okay, that matters with the Seahawks, but they also like to have their guys right. go, go, go. That's so it makes sense as far as stylistic. It, it, he, and he has a unanimous approval rating. Okay. You know, you, you could argue that some IQ teams, score. <laughs> yeah, uh, you could argue maybe the, the value is different from team to team, but I didn't talk to anybody that just disliked Derek right. Hall as a player. You know, he is useful. Yes. Uh, you know, no matter the scheme you're running, no matter draft. Yeah, just <laughs> add him to uh, add him to the mix. You know, part yeah. part of your uh, edge rush rotation, whether he starts or he doesn't, he's gonna be an important part of what you're doing off the edge. Falcons move up to 38 here. Colts move down to Again, 44. The Colts right? move back twice. Yeah. After Chris Ballard got a little anxious yesterday after having to draft the quarterback <laughs> in the top five. Now, just, he's, now he's back in his comfort zone. I just right. stand pat. Just, just, just picking up fourth round picks along the oh, way here yeah. as often as possible. And Colts with one of those teams that need some bodies. Yeah. Uh, so those fourth round picks are valuable. Oh, man. And ba Ballard uh, playing blackjack is probably he never, he never stands pat. <laughs> 17 hit. Just uh, more. More. I want more cards. Uh, more cards is better, right? There's more chances at it. But uh, – no, that's it's kind of interesting that the Falcons are moving up here because I'm like, well, they don't need a running back. <laughs> I can tell you that, but they're also another team that probably needs maybe some defensive help here. So. Brian Branch is still out there. Uh, Brian yeah. Branch is still out there. Uh, uh, they they cut Casey Hayward uh, in that secondary. Could that be a fit here? And uh, we're talking about that interior offensive line run. They still need another starting guard. They probably. do. Yeah. Osiris Torrance, plug him in, uh, the guard from Florida. That that makes a ton of sense, actually. God, I would absolutely actually, love if the Falcons picked a running back and a guard in the first 38 picks again. Too, actually. Yeah, if right. They, yeah, actually, this is. I would actually really like that with that zone-heavy scheme. They're going to probably just go like some random position now. John Abraham making the pick for the Falcons. John Where's Abraham, the team? last great edge rusher for the Atlanta Falcons. They've been chasing one ever <laughs> since. been 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> They've been chasing one ever since. Yeah, very, very tall, you know? So Matthew Bergeron goes to Atlanta from Syracuse, 38th overall pick. Dane, they just re-signed Caleb McGarry. Yes. Jake Matthews is there as their left tackle. They have a need at guard. What do you think the fit is for I mean, where he'll play early on? Guard. I think that a lot of teams had him on the board as a zone guard, someone that could play tackle. And he, maybe he is the eventual left tackle for this team. It's a, it's a really good plan. It, you, right. you drop him as a starting yeah. guard now, and maybe that's the succession plan for Jake Matthews, who's pretty deep into his 30s, I'd have to assume. Right. And, and you, you have high hopes for Caleb McGarry, obviously, but you know it, his career's been a little rocky. You never know. And yeah. so adding a player with that flexibility to kick out and play tackle, yep. there's there's so much value to that. Um, outstanding run blocker. That if yeah. you if you like Matthew Bergeron, it's because you saw his run blocking. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, now the pass protection stuff, you know, you could throw on tape against uh, Miles Murphy and Clemson, or you know, the, the, all the pass rushers in the ACC. He had some ups and downs versus those guys. Uh, not the longest player. Uh, needs to do a better job uh, with in, in terms of answering those counters yep. and being in a better position, especially in an, on an island in space. But as a guard, I really think that he'll be able to minimize that, be able to anchor, reset, love this fit. I mean, it, this makes a ton of sense. And, yeah, you talked about that running back in the first round. You come back with this guard here that really the final piece of that offensive line, they hope, uh, makes a ton of sense. It does. Nate, let's show us a little bit more about what type of player the Falcons are getting with Matthew Burch. <laughs> I cannot wait. I'm so glad it goes with the Falcons, too, because this is actually one I – had a, it was fan fiction in my brain even this morning. I was like, that actually would make a lot of sense for everything that Dane said here is Bergeron is a left tackle for Syracuse. And even though he is a left tackle, you see the traits of why it would make him a good card. And that's first this first play. So again, left tackle right there. 
is this first play against Notre Dame, watch him fire out of his stance. Staying low, that is like drill work. That is running under the, under the bars. I don't know how many times you had to do that in high school. Funny, that's hit my head all the time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, I might imagine your teammates. Remember they all like six seven. <laughs> yes. But yeah, so Bergeron right here. See a little bit of outside hand, so you don't want that. But that bend to be able to that strength. Going up against Foskey. Yes, right. and he just drives him out. And that's what he does in the run game time and again. Now, and what Dan was talking about with the pass game and his pass protection, and this is why I compared his footwork almost to Peyton Manning in the pocket. It's very chattery, but he is light on his clunky. feet. Yeah. yeah, a little clunky. It's weird. I don't know what it, how to describe it. It's like he can get him up and down, but it's not like smooth <laughs> so just like Peyton Manning in the pocket it's like yeah that's good t technique and everything so Bergeron as a pass protector yes is a work in progress I think this is plan for the Falcons makes a ton of sense just for everything that Dane said you see that like him firing out a stance he's balanced his hands are pretty good he was a four-year start he played at both tackle spots I believe yeah, he, uh, he he's has that versatility that we talked about that's a premium with Lyman and this is the last play I wanted to show and this is where he kind of popped for me because this is early in the game so again, this is Look zone. Look at that movement in yes. zone. Yes, staying mm -hmm. low, that zone movement. Feet aren't under themselves. Look, he's, I mean, that's just coming out of stance. But watch him keep his balance here. A little jump block. Watch 60 <laughs> yeah. right here. You don't see this, see this very often. See a little jump block there. So that's, that's up, up, down punch. If you're playing any video games, or some <laughs> Street Fighter games right there. But that's really just what Bergeron is. And I, I like this plan with the Falcons. This is perfect for him. I would... I said this actually even on Twitter this morning. I would give him a shot at tackle, but they don't need to. It's great. It, he can go with the ones as yep. a guard and with the twos. Hey, you're the backup right and left tackle. You're our swing guy. The versatility is already a great thing, but the fact that he has length, he's got enough athleticism, he's got tenacity, he seems smart, he's always on his feet. It's a really intriguing package. I really like this for the Falcons. And a great story, too. He's born in Montreal. Uh, you know, football was not as big as it is here. Uh, and he didn't have much recruiting interest at all. Got on a bus, went to a camp at Syracuse, and based just on that camp, he got an offer uh, from wow. Buffalo and then Syracuse. Nobody else knew about him. That's the only camp that he really showed out at. And uh, I mean, he, from day one, was, he was a starter. He started right away. He was. Which is he, crazy. he earned a starting job right away and a little bit of right tackle, but mostly left tackle. Yep. The last four years, he has really gotten better every yep. single year. You see that progression, which is so important for an offensive lineman. Yeah. Jake Matthews only 31. I apologize to Jake Matthews. They're financial. It's been so long. They're, that, it yes. feels like he's been yes. for 20 years. Was there, could, I, I was with the team that drafted him. You can that's forgive so me if, I, if it feels like right. he's a little bit older, but they're financially really tied into him for the next two years. Yeah. So you assume Matthew Bergeron now fits in as your right guard on that, excuse me, your left guard. Mm -hmm. Chris Lindstrom is the highest paid guard in the league, yes. now right guard. But you have Jake Matthews, Matthew Bergeron, Drew Dahlman, Chris Lindstrom, yep. Caleb McGarry. Yeah. You have Drake London, Kyle Pitts. Scotty Miller is now there as a speed threat. Matt Collins is your other big body yep. receiver. And this guy named B. John Robinson is playing running back for them. And John we'll Smith. see what happens with Desmond Ritter. Right. That's and then John Smith is also there right now. <laughs> yeah. with that offense last year, it was almost like an oddity. It was, it, it, it was like a, it was, it was a curiosity. It was. Because it was so good but peculiar. Now, it might just be good. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens with Desmond Ritter. But the infrastructure and the support system they put around him personnel-wise, Dane, it's hard not to get a little bit excited about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be really interesting to see how Desmond Ritter, can he take that next step? And, you know, I think they trust him in that offense. But can he be someone that you're winning because of and not right. just winning with? Yeah. You know, that'll be a key for him. And we'll see if he's able to step up and do it. Absolutely. I still have plenty of Ritter stock. So this, <laughs> he has no excuses. I, I have no, yeah. none of that. There's not going to be any of that Trevor Lawrence talk that I had last year where I was like, hey, the situation sucks, guys. He, he's mm -hmm. better than it seems. Ritter's got none of those excuses. Oh, At 39, is, we assumed the Panthers right might be hunting for another pass catcher. They had to trade DJ Moore to the Bears as part of that deal to move up to number one, go get Adam Thielen in free agency. But one more kind of bit of youth, a little bit of an injection of talent at that position, and we get it. Jonathan Mingo from Old Miss, at number 39 to Carolina Day. 6 one two twenty uh, operated a lot of the slot in that mm -hmm. in that offense. Um, did a lot of catch and go on film, and you, you felt like there is a you know the stats don't blow you away. You felt like there's more there mm -hmm. uh, based off of just you know what he was able to do when he did have the, the, the most the ball impressive in his hands. forty yards you'll ever see. Right, <laughs> right. he'll finish again with three catches for forty yards. Like, Man, that <laughs> right? <exactly. laughs> really? I thought you went for like one thirty there. And, and it's funny you look at the Panthers. Obviously, they draft Bryce Young in the first, and so you need to get him some help. You look at the depth chart. It's like there's plenty of bodies there now. I mean, LaVisca Chenault's still yep. there. Uh, Terrace Marshall's yep. still there. 
but uh, you know, this is a guy that maybe gives them something a little bit different in that mix, and it'll be interesting to see how they use him now. You know, do they operate him out of the slot? Do they keep him on the outside? Not many X's guys this mm -hmm. side. When we talk about Cedric Tillman being one of those guys, Mingo's another one that you can, you know, big-bodied, athletic uh, receivers. Not, you know, they put a premium on those players if you're NFL teams. So not a surprise that he went this early. Yeah, he. It, some uh, someone asked me again on Twitter, refer referencing my Twitter a bunch here, but it's someone asked like who would be the best power slot option for uh, mm. Jonathan Mingo was it. Um, he's a he's a, a willing blocker. He has strength and he he wants to block. So it's like all right, there's something there. Tested like a freak. He is very athletic. He's big and everything. Best on the move. Best on like overs and crossers, right. and maybe that's just how, how he got used at Ole Miss. But I do think you know he's, he needs some work with uh, with route running. But it's kind of again, this is a great synergy fit as far as Adam Thielen, DJ Chark are kind of the uh, one one and two as far as the Panthers receivers. He can go in there, he can literally slot in there, and it makes sense. He gives them that yak ability with upside. Like you said, he is one of the few guys that's a bigger receiver, right. and but he does move. He's more of a movement guy, yak guy. But he has that upside to be a ball winner down the field. I say, some of the receiver-specific things, yeah. the details, yes. that's where he needs to get better, to be a better separator. Um, he's not a polished You're player. not seeing the ladder. The ladder sucks right. with him now. Exactly. <laughs> it's but running. he's a guy that with that size, the physicality, the toughness, I mean, I know it's Vanderbilt, but watch the Vanderbilt tape. That, that I mean, he, he, I think he broke uh, Elijah Moore's school record in that game for receiving wow. yards. Uh, that, that was definitely a, a highlight game where it showed everything you wanted to see from a receiver. Do you have any insight into what they feed the receivers at Ole Miss? Oh, goodness, <laughs> Just right. the amount of like yoked up dudes yeah. that have come out of there over the last five years. DK Metcalf is what, 225, 230? Right. AJ Brown's AJ 220. Brown. And Jonathan Mingo's pushing the scale here at 220. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And you're running four, four, six. They're, yeah. they're churning out here. As I said, for, to have that size but also have the speed, um, you know, really impressive. 39 and a half inch vert. Uh, yeah. I mean, he is a freaky, freaky dude. I what do you think is the, oh, the ceiling? Like, why do you think it took him this long if we're talking about a 220 pound guy with some of these explosion characteristics? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think his, he probably thrives so much because of those, you know, the size, the speed. He never really had to be a detailed receiver. Yeah. And that will be the key to him unlocking everything in the mm -hmm. NFL, becoming more savvy with his routes. Uh, you know, it's all about playing the cat and mouse game with corners. You yep. have to have a level of deception to yep. what you're doing. You can't just run by everybody like yep. you did in college. So can he develop that as part of his game? And I understand why you take that bet that he can do it. Not a lot of nuance. It's like right. he was just a bigger, better athlete. And it's it's fine. You, there's there's times you can use that. And how Lane Kiffin used him was people were going, oh, they, you lined him up as a tight end. It's like, well, it's because Lane Kiffin was dialing up a play for Mingo yes. to get yeah. to the flat. It was all stuff, like you said, there wasn't, there's not that detail, and that's why I made the joke about the ladder step. When he would run a ladder step on an over route, the guy goes straight over, up, and then back over. He just runs. Just runs. He's just running away. And, and, yeah. and that can work sometimes, but there's not a lot of nuance. Four years at Ole Miss, he never led the team in receiving once. Right. It was all like it, it, 600 it, yards maybe right. was his top it, season. It, yeah. It, it, he had his career highs came as a senior, but he never led the team in receiving. And for I liked him season. way more than I thought originally. Like that I thought I would. Yeah. Going in. I still had a third round grade on him. Yep, so, same. I that's, mean, that's, this is earlier exactly. than I would take him, but I get what they're doing. That's exactly how I view him. Yeah, we talked so. about guys landing in the right situations with the right veterans. We talk about nuanced receivers. Adam Thielen is there now. Yes. Right so. now, he's going to a spot where Adam Thielen is going to be able to show him how to work every yes. day. There's little tiny details while playing the position. Don't think you can overstate how important yep. that stuff is. And even Chark's pretty good, like releasing off yeah. the line, working outside. Yeah. Like that, it, yeah, he's going to a good spot. 40th pick here. The Saints back on the clock. Take Isaiah Foskey Just from Foskey. Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dane, we know they needed more bodies along the defensive line after that exodus and free agency. Right. They go get Brian Brisset in the first round. Come back with Foskey in the second round. What do you think about it? You think about Cameron Jordan on one side, and then okay, who's who's the speed guy? Uh, you know, it, Marcus Davenport's no longer there. They needed that extra fastball that's going to give him some pass rush. And with Foskey, that's exactly what he is. He's yep. speed, length, and motor. That's what he that's that's what he does best. Now that after you get past that, that's where you worry about yep. him because you he's very predictable as a pass rusher. You know what he's gonna try and do. It's a lot of long arms, it's a lot of just I'm gonna try and just kind of try to win that corner with my speed. Uh, but you know what after you get done beating him up for the lack of diversity in his rush, you start to really appreciate what he does really well. And that's just he's gonna go, go, go. Kind of like we talk about Derek Hall. You know, it's not yeah. a lot of counters and secondary moves and creativeness. Yeah. Uh, but in order to win consistently in the NFL, you need to develop some of that. 
but there is value in what he offers and that nonstop hustle, the speed. I watched the, the, You had the Syracuse tape yeah. on. Watch the Syracuse tape. You watch him match Sean Tucker on a wheel route down yep. the field. He has that speed to do it. Uh, you want him to play on his feet? He can do that. You want to put his hand on the ground? play wide nine, just go, 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 he can do that as well. So with Foskey, another player that maybe didn't think he'd go this early, top 40, but I understand for this team, the yes. Saints, what they needed as at that position, I understand why it makes sense. Yep, they needed help up front. I mean, yeah. all the guys, it was a mass exodus this offseason, just by design, and so they just, they need bodies. Like, they really do. They need guys that can play reps for them. Uh, you know, uh, Cam Jordan can only play for so long. Cam they Jordan's, need, yeah, Cam Jordan's only – going to play in the league for so long. Yes, yeah. yeah, he can only do that for so long. And he carries a lot of weight for them, both as a leader and both on the field. So they just need guys like this that can play tangible reps. You're saying I, I, he'll probably transition pretty easily to the next level. I mean, right. add more technique, but he's going to be the capital U word, useful early on. But I, they need that. They need guys that can play right away. Yeah. Yeah. After Jordan, it's like, okay, who, who's our guy up front? Yeah. That's gonna they drafted Peyton Turner in the first round. I think this did. tells you a little bit about right. what they envision as his future, future. potentially. You know, yeah. it, it, there's a chance that they're still you know, like him enough or optimistic mm -hmm. about him enough because, again, yeah, Cam Jordan's in his mid 30s. Yes. How long, much longer he's going to be there? But this is another high pick that they've spent on an edge rusher in pretty short order here. Yeah. Exactly. So, and uh, again, I, I think with with Foskey. Because he started popping up in first round mocks, and it's like I'm watching, I'm like, this, he's just not that type of player. Mm -hmm. And like, I, end, I, I feel like I'm beating him up too much. And then, <laughs> okay, when you're done get, getting through that, you really focus on what he does good, really does well. And then you, okay, you know what, I, I can. I can see why you want to add this to your to your mix. Uh, you know, preferably as a third rusher right. that you're bringing in and sub and and kind of getting those matchup opportunities. But you know, for the Saints, I, they're going to want him to step in from day one and yeah. really make an impact. And they need those guys. Like how they play up front too is that uh, they won't blitz a lot. They'll run simulated right. pressures a little bit. But they're you got to go like and you got to bring it. You yeah. got to do a lot of physical things. We're not helping you. We're not slanting you. It's up and at them. And that's kind of how they go about it. So. They, like I said before, is that they need these guys to eat these reps early. Even if that, it's like, yes, like you said, pre preferably he'd be a rotational guy, third guy, okay, sub package guy, but I think they look at him as like, no, you're, you're going, like, get ready to play those 50 stats. And he, he was one of those guys, just like Laporta, where uh, the grades were all over the place from okay. scouts. I mean, some thought second round, others thought fourth round. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's, and I think it comes down to what you really value at the position. and. Some are really looking for those traits, the upside, while others are focused more on, okay, what do you do really well? Okay, we can really key in on that, and that's going to provide value that we need on our team. Just think about the types of guys the Saints have drafted on the edge. Big, long yep. guys. Yeah. He's 6'5", 265, he's got 34-inch arms, and that is With their, yeah. that's their profile of player at that position. Mm -hmm. B.J. Ojolari is what? 30 spots higher on your big board than somebody like right. Frosky is, but it's just a different type of player. Exactly, and you know, we talked about with Nolan Smith and yeah. when the way he fell and where does he fit, and it just you, that is such an important part of, especially when you're doing a mock draft and you're trying to place these guys. It's not just, oh well, who's my next edge rusher? Okay, well yeah, put him there. Yeah, it's just not, it's not that simple. You know, that's not how teams look at it. Uh, you know, Fosky is a guy that is probably off some boards yep. because of he's not quite what teams are looking for but he was exactly what a team like the Saints are looking for. Yeah, especially the dearth of talent yeah. <laughs> right up there. Cardinals pick is in at 41, and Nias Williams, Williams looking incredible, Yeah, as always. Arizona not moving down anymore. It's time, time <laughs> to make some pick here, picks here, Dane. You can only get so many. You only accrue so many. That's it. They went with the left tackle, Paris Johnson in the first round. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was offensive line again. Or trench Trenches. player in general. Trenches, or, and period, also yeah. Brian Branch is somebody that yes. they need help in the defensive backfield. They, yeah, they, they do. need guys that just can be players. Hey, and there we go. Talk about and of all the needs, yes. <laughs> defensive line and edge rusher specifically, yes. I think might have been the biggest one on the Cardinals list. They go with B.J. Ojolari from LSU with the 41st pick here, Dane. One of the highest graded players left on your board, I think. Yeah, I really like this player. Because mm -hmm. um, he knows what he's doing out there. He, he and He's kind of the opposite of Foskey in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I, he, uh, it's funny because you just used him as right. the, the exactly, the exactly. Uh, you set it up nicely, Robert. Uh, with with uh, Audulari, you you see uh, with the way he's using his hands, the way he's setting up blockers, uh, and especially he'll set up a move for later in, in the game. And you know he understands how to do that at yep. a young age. The character's off the charts. Uh, that's the one thing you talk to any Southeast scout. 
that tell you Nolan Smith, B.J. Argelary, those yeah. two guys, character off the Who's charts. Who's number 18? That, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a LSU, big deal at LSU. That matters. Yep, yep. Exactly. They don't just give that number to anybody. So for the Cardinals that need a lot of help on the defensive line, need a lot of help in general, this is a, this is a nice building block. You go Paris Johnson, high character yep. in the first round. B.J. Aguilar is, in a lot of ways, the defensive version of that here in the second. I really like this. It, it was He was, when we did our Ed Show with Deontay, you know, I think he was our last guy that we kind of talked about. I kind of just, when talking about it, I was like, he's just solid. Like, he, he's good in coverage. He is young, which is very uh, is. appealing. Uh, but, like, just good in coverage. He's, like, not overly strong, but he is strong. He uses his hands pretty well, but he'll disengage well. He's got enough pass rushing juice. But you can see the intelligence all the time because uh, even when he would get asked to rush, and I remember against Bryce Young, was that they were using him to loop around because they knew he'd be sound yeah. and just knew he would do the right thing. And that's kind of what he is. It's another sound player for the Cardinals. Edge hey. rushers on the Cardinals here. Oh, we got, got one right in my mock draft. There yeah, you go. Cam, you know this one? <laughs> nice. Cam Thomas, Mazai Sanders, both of whom were third-round picks last year from a different regime. So mm -hmm. not a lot of guys blocking B.J. Ojolari's path to playing time here. 42nd okay. pick of this year's draft, the Green Bay Packers take tight end Luke Musgrave from Love Oregon it. State. Nate, somebody that you said it on our show when we were talking about him, and we were talking about it a little bit last night, just moves different. And now the Packers get one more guy with a little bit of pop in their office. This is, like, good for them. Like, I, I uh, as much as I, I would like Mayer going to them in the first round, I, I mocked it when we did it, but this is actually how I kind of like, like this better in the second round. Uh, he has that star quality. He is, uh, as a blocker, they used him more offline and everything, but he has the upside, the length, oh, yeah. the athleticism, the tenacity, the competitiveness to be a good inline blocker. That's where you're projecting. But as far as a receiver... Again, he just moves different. He has loose hips. He's tall. He's long. He has feel. Former skier. Former That's skier, it. yeah. That's the it. body control. <laughs> he has explosive ability. Um, there, there's clips of him. It was only these two games that he played this year. They were a fantastic film. Just some of the best film you could watch. Throw on the Boise State tape it's and easy sell. Everything. Everything he does. And like some of the clips that they have, they're isolating him as a lone receiver and he's beating corners on dick routes. It's, that's, and that's in college. You don't really see that with mm -hmm. tight ends in college truly doing that. I love this. They needed this type of guy. But him and it's kind of funny. Him and Lucas Van Ness are kind of the tight end edge versions of each other. And yeah. I love both of the players. It, yep. if, if Luke Musgrave turns out to be the best tight end from this draft class, what, Wouldn't be surprised. Yep, no. I mean, it makes he sense. He was my tight end too. Like yeah. he, he, I am. Become, I, I'm he very was, bullish on. He him. was my tight end three. Yep. Uh, and so, but I'm right there with you. I mean, he, as a combo tight end, he might have the best upside of this group yep. because of the athleticism. Because he is a functional blocker. He gives you something there. Uh, and so, I, I'm a. If he were to play more than two games this year, I, he's probably not here at 42 yep. for for the Packers to take. But because of the the knee injury, didn't have. He only had played two games this year. That allows him to fall a little bit, and it's, it's a steal, I think, for I this team. 36% yeah. of Oregon State's receiving yards in the two games that yeah. he played in. And if you look at the athletic testing, 93rd percentile broad jump, 82nd percentile vertical, 88th percentile 40, 87th percentile 10-yard split. Uh, we said last night, the way he moves is just a little bit different because he's so explosive and so athletic. It's a little bit like Mike Kosicki, but he could block. Yeah. yeah. So you have kind of the best of both worlds, yeah. and if he had played 11 games, probably going a lot higher than yeah. this based on that combination of tools. Right. So 255 pounds. You ran a 4.6140, and I was kind of disappointed. I thought he'd go, <laughs> you thought yeah. Yeah. Back, yeah. I, was, I was expecting a 4.5. Right, yeah. yeah. I yeah. thought he'd you know, run a little faster than that because, you know, you watch him on seam routes, and yeah. and he's he also has a blocked punt last year. Yeah. I mean, like, he can <laughs> and he just scored plays. it. He yeah, blocked exactly. It, picked right. up in one motion and scores. It was, he, he, he's just a big athlete. Yeah, so. I, yeah big fan, and I, I really just love the potential there. I love that he's going to Green Bay. I think it's, right. it's, it's a great fit for him what they do uh, yeah really really like this all right we're going to take a quick break we're going to be right back uh, you really mustn't darling I
We are back when we were off the clock here. The New York Jets go with Joe Tippman, center from Wisconsin. Even with McGovern coming back, still felt like it was a position of need right. for them. What do you think about Tippman going to the Jets? Yeah, an offensive line, they, I think their off, offensive line options in the first round, they got shut out. Yeah. And so they come back here in the second round and get uh, a versatile player. Yes, he was a center only in college, but I do think, you know, he's 6'6", 315. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he does have uh, that experience because you know better than anybody, Wisconsin, they cross-train those guys. Everybody. He was a tackle in high school, goes to Wisconsin. They play him at guard, play him at center. And in order to get the best five on the field, they put him at center where he started the last two years. Uh, but this is a player that I think if you want to play him at guard, he can do that. I think he gives you some of that interior uh, versatility. He's really good on the move. Um, I mean, I think you think about what that offense wants to be. I think he's a natural fit. He's my top center. Um, I think with Joe Tipman, you have a young player who has a, a high ceiling. Yeah. Um, he's not just a... Yeah, not, no offense to John Michael Schmitz, who will be um, off the board here pretty quickly, I'm sure, but he gives you a little more upside. Yep. You, know, you like where he is now, but also what he could be because of the package of skills. Absolutely. He needs to stay off the ground, but you love the movement. You love uh, when he gets his hands on you. He knows what to do. So big fan of Joe Tipman. And they put everything on him. He, yeah. he handled a NFL center load. And, I mean, that Paul Chris offense, that's what, it's a pro offense, I mean, as far as what they ask, especially from the offensive line. And I know this because as a quarterback, it was great. We didn't have to do anything, <laughs> any points or anything. You just killed the play. When, oh, single high, we're done. But he really did. He had to handle everything with the load. And so it, that mental transition is going to be way easier than, I think, a lot of college centers. Um, but also I, everything you're saying right there, Dane, is that he still has plenty of upside to tap into. Yep. Um, kind of a, yeah, late bloomer to the position maybe not as an athlete or anything but like you could see him like figuring it out like oh okay this is how I angle on this double team this is how I climb and it got better and better and better even through a tumultuous year in Wisconsin this past year but like this a lot because of the versatility and I also just think he could hit more easily be a day one starter and hit the ground running. Govern only a one year 1.9 yeah. million dollar deal so I mean this is he came back I assume yeah. just to kind of shore this up in case the draft didn't fall their way but yeah, right. not a lot preventing Joe Tippmann from winning that job. I think he's their best. Fair Tucker back healthy that's a yeah. nice interior for the Jets. You just wonder what's happened to Red Tackle. Yeah. Is Max Mitchell going to be that guy or do they try to upgrade there? What, is hap what happens between Brown and Mekhi Becton? Some right. questions along the offensive line but adding one more body to the mix still feel like it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. I like this for them. Uh, th speaking of Chris Ballard and, and what he <laughs> likes to do, uh, Julius Brent's here, the pick. Uh, oh my God. The biggest corner in the draft. Uh, you talk about size and athletic ability. You knew Chris Ballard would be all over this guy. They needed it. Oh, like, yeah. They needed, they needed some uh, some corners to play for them. I mean, if you look at their depth chart, I can even tell you without even looking up at my laptop right now, oh. it's a whole bunch of undrafted free agents they're, and seventh who, rounders. Their outside corners are, I mean, you, I, you know what Kenny Moore is, but their yeah. outside corners are, yeah. I don't know. Just I mean, insert name here. You ready? Oh, yeah. Bring it. Dallas Flowers? Sure. Yeah. He, is, is, oh, well, yeah of course, Dane's going to know. Yeah, this yeah, this, <laughs> Dallas Flowers and Isaiah Rogers. Who, Isaiah Rogers yeah. has had some moments. Yes. He did, but yeah. Dallas Flowers on our lads right now currently slotted as the starting left cornerback for the Indianapolis <laughs> Colts post Savannah. It's trade. traits. Uh, uh, it's, this is what he goes after. It's always going to be size and length for Chris Bauer, and it makes total sense to go for the biggest corner. 6'3. 198 pounds, 34 inch arms, um, ran the four fives, but his short shuttle and three cone were unreal. Which is huge. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that he has that ability to to mirror and match. He can he, he can still run. He has those long strides, mm -hmm. and so he can run with receivers down the field. My issue with Brents, watch the Big 12 championship game. Okay. Watch him against TCU, and he struggles to find the football. Yep. He has a tough time, especially when he was with uh, Quinton Johnston. He had a tough time finding the football, going to make a play. That's what soured me a little bit on Brents. But again, you're banking on those traits that you yeah. just don't find guys walking down the street looking like him yeah. playing corner. And it makes sense. Gus Bradley's still there. The, mm -hmm. These are the corners. Uh, Gus Bradley's always going to have that Seahawks defen defense in them. Legion of Boom. Well, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about that last night with uh, when the, the Cowboys drafted Mozzie Smith. I comp Mozzie Smith to Brandon Meebane. You think about Dan Quinn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and yeah. Like, it all comes yeah. back around. They it have a type. We all around. have types right. of stuff. Yeah, but it makes sense. Gus Bradley, that's that's their MO. They like the long corners and fluid movers, the the triangle testing, you know, height, weight, yes. speed, and this is what it is. And that type of defense is like, oh yeah. If if this the Seahawks took him, everyone would go, Oh yeah, like this is more Seahawks than Witherspoon. And it's kind of funny. Gus Bradley is kind of carrying that on, and I'm sure Chris Bauer's like, Yeah, I'm all about that too. Packers move down here. I don't think we mentioned that. I believe the Luke Musgrave pick is the pick they got from the Jets. Correct. Right. Yep. Yeah. Forty-two. So now we 
they're showing Jets fans, and Jets fans are like, yeah! And it's like, no, they're talking about you guys got rid of those pet guys. And well, whenever we talk about the Aaron Rodgers trade forever now, yeah. Luke Musgrave's name will be involved in it in some way. It was part of the package that they got for Aaron Rodgers, and good or bad, that will always right. follow him That's around. It. Right. Yeah. And it, we'll see how, obviously, the, the conditional pick next year will factor mm-hmm. in, too. And, you know, what's, it's one of those things where you can't really judge a trade in the moment. Like any trade, you got to wait, yeah. especially when draft picks are involved. Yeah see how these guys develop and uh, you know if they turn out to live up to the hype where they were drafted yeah absolutely yeah it's always the pick became and then parentheses the name and stuff it's the Ryan Tannehill trade with the pick that they got mm. also and it was it was David Long was the other guy that they ended up getting so it's like oh yeah that was a two for right there so <laughs> right. That, that was that parentheses right there but that's again yeah it's like Luke Musgrave if he does turn out what we hope that high upside is. It's like, yeah, that's what we're always going to remember. The Packers' original pick, they traded to the Lions. Lions are on the clock here at 45. Interesting. Interdivision trade. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The Lions, Lions love do that. that, though. Minnesota you know, Lions. Minnesota There's Minnesota more than three times. other teams, Detroit. Like, they, they, you can call it in L.A. and the Rams. Like, that's a, those are the only teams they hit up for trades. <laughs> what do we think here for Detroit, Dane? Uh, already Sam Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, Jack Campbell. I mean, okay. It seems like they've got 40 picks. Let me, so. yeah, let me, co- or let me search my the beast for team captain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> solid, not spectacular. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, ready to start. Tough. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Control it. Yeah. Tough. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it seems like that's what they've been targeting, at least with these first three picks. Uh, and, and the Lions also have another pick here coming up, like 55. Uh, so three picks here in the second round. Uh, they, this is a chance to really get better on both sides of the ball. And so far, they went running back, linebacker, and then the tight end. Yeah. You could argue three, not in, in terms of non-premium positions yeah. um yeah. you know so what do they do with this pick are they going to go with oh it's going to be a guard well <laughs> Colton they, talked about they could use uh, it's a death with jonah jackson yep, yep. maybe being a free guy is probably going to be gone right, exactly. be guard for ne- i mean but also you got some corners on the board you know, we've yeah. talked about them going corner early in the draft with devin witherspoon is akili ringo or dj turner one of these other corners that hasn't been drafted yet is that on their radar after missing out on one in the first round is osiris a captain no, no yeah. but I, I love the fit. Yeah, he's going there a year. It would be impressive right. if he was. He, he's the one. Oh, yeah, true, right. Uh, but, yeah, he's the one guy that's like, okay, this actually kind of me- makes sense as far as positional fit and also, like, his type. Like, he's a right. big physical guy. He like, didn't I, test well. No. Lions don't care. I mean, no. you know, it's not going to It's not gonna <laughs> factor. He's not good. The Lions <laughs> don't care. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, 20. See what happens 48 something. hours does. Like, yeah. this is, <laughs> Again, they deserve the benefit of the doubt. Yes. The way yes. the last couple years have gone. Yes. A lot yes. of goodwill has been built up, but yeah. they're they're really testing it right now. They are. They are. And you know what? It's I like Sam Laporte. I'm, I'm mostly kidding here, but it has yeah. been a, a curious draft for the Lions thus far. Well, when we consider when you offset it with what they th- we thought they needed. Yes. Right. We're thinking about edge rusher and corner and all these high end positions. Quarterback of the future. It's just been a little <laughs> yeah. bit yeah, quarterback. <laughs> hey. It's been yeah, a little bit know. different than we might have expected. Yeah, it was uh they, they have their own premium in Detroit. Brian but. Branch is still out there. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean I think he, he would definitely be their fit. seventh slot defender that, they, that they've acquired so far this oh, offseason right, right yeah they like all that uh i know this is i mean uh, this is i'm actually really anticipating this one let's forget that we're not getting the goodell audios so <laughs> a little, little, little bit different than last right. night but yeah the lions obviously just a stockpiling picks they have so many here in the first two rounds and yeah, they're gonna team their team's gonna look a lot different after this draft i think we knew that no coming doubt. in no doubt there, there it is, is. Okay. nice Awesome. I I mean, Brian Branch is just one of those players that you watch and you're like, okay, I'm in. I like this guy. Yeah, exactly. Some people may be scared off by that 190, the 458. Not great numbers for a DB. That's not what you want. But trust the tape. Yes. Okay. And you see a just a, a darn good football player. And it doesn't matter if he's playing safety, if he's playing nickel. He's smart. He's a really good tackler. Yep. For a guy that's a little bit smaller for a, a safety, a DB, especially playing in the nickel like that, he doesn't miss tackles. Yep. And he, he really understands you know, how to come to balance, stay under control, wrap, finish. Um, and then in coverage, I can go back to that old Miss tape, the final play of the game where he is, he understands where he needs to be position wise. He understands how to leverage the route because he understands what route is coming, what the mm-hmm. offense wants to do. So he knows how to leverage that and then go make a play on the football. So this, uh, I mean, 
I like I, I like what they've done so far, but is this their best pick? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, you might be. Uh, well, we talked last night when we were kind of like guessing what the Eagles could possibly do with the 30th pick, and we we're like, oh, well, okay, well they can maybe go Brian Branch, you know, with Avante Max and C.J. Gardner Johnson yeah. as a replacement for C.J. Gardner. And C.J. Gardner Johnson is now with the Lions, only a one-year deal. It's only a one-year so deal. So that okay, I am that fascinated by how the roles are going to shake yeah. out. Right. Because you still have Tracy Walker there. They went out and they got Kirby Joseph in the third round yes. last year at a really nice rookie year. Now you go get Brian Branch, CJ Gardner Johnson's there. You have Manuel Mosley on a one year deal. You have Cam Sutton there. Like, what the, when they have six defensive backs on the field, yeah. who are the defensive backs where? and where right. are they playing? Yeah. I can't wait to find out yeah. because they have so many different problems that they could potentially address. He legit had one of my favorite plays I watched in this whole draft process, and it was the one you replied on. I, I tweeted it, and he breaks oh, yeah. on the ball. Mm -hmm. He's running the route. It's a sail route, which is just an inside corner route. He is running the route before the receiver is even close to the break. There's stories about like Chris Paul in basketball, like when someone's running out of bounds play and he aligns the opposing team, goes, No, you're doing it wrong. You're supposed <laughs> to go here to free throw line. That's how Brian Branch plays on defense. Like he knows what the route combinations are going to be. I've compared him to Jimmy Ward, more of how Jimmy Ward was used last year mm -hmm. as that slot, a good tackler, smart, a great blitzer as yes. well. He is a fantastic blitzer. He knows how to like turn the corner and get around blocks. So again, we talked about useful, but I, I think he's even more than useful. I think in his role, he could be a star at it. Like he is not, no pun intended. Right. Uh, but like when I did that all pro and I, all pro teams for defense and I had slot defender as one of them, like he's gonna be a candidate for that, I think for years to come. I really like his tape, he's a lot of fun. Yeah. We're talking about guys, don't overthink it. It was, one, it was yeah. one of the categories we kind of addressed kind of heading into the draft. And Dane, this seems like one of those just don't overthink it kind of guys. Right. Exactly. Uh, and more so than you want the 4-3 and you want the 6-2, 2, two 15. Yeah. You want quick reaction players, yes. at, at, you know, DB, safety, corner, guys that are smart but also have the quickness to go do something. You know, it's, it's, there are quicker players in this draft, but they don't n have the knowledge that Brian Branch has. They don't have the recognition skills to understand what is coming. So it doesn't matter that they're quicker because they can't make a play on the ball right. like Brian Branch does. And that matters so much in the NFL where everything's boom, boom, boom. He's able to process all of that, and it's it's he was that star, you know, that, that for that Alabama yeah. defense and the Saban that Mika Fitzpatrick popularized. Uh, they just trusted him with everything, yeah. and what he mentioned everything that he was doing from blitzing, playing in a slot, playing more of a post position. He can do all of that, and yeah. so yeah, to your point, it'll be really interesting to how they how they distribute all these DBs and what they're asking them to do and where they all fit. I usually talk, I, I say zero fat in their movement, and usually I refer to quarterbacks with that. And and sometimes receivers, sometimes offensive line. Usually with offensive linemen, it's because they're such good athletes and they can move. Well, you just watch that Bergeron clip where he's firing out of the stands. I say that with quarterbacks, and usually that comes with their footwork starts tying into their brains because mm -hmm. they, they, they know where they're going, so they don't need any wasted movement. That's how Brian Branch plays safety. A, he, yeah. he max, or Nickel, I should say, too, is that he maximizes it because he has no wasted movement because he knows exactly where he's going and he knows it's before it's going to It's happen. like Bryce Young at quarterback. Yeah. It's, it's body rhythm. It's, yeah, it, body it, rhythm. it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a feel. It, it's yep. something that, you know, you can't teach. You can't, you and can't. that's and that's what Will Levis is kind of the opposite of that right. in terms of that body rhythm, and, yep. you know. And it, Branch has that on defense, like a Bryce Young has it on offense. Yep. Lack of explosive traits, but name me a star safety in the NFL that his success is rooted in explosive traits and speed. Right. Name one. Yeah, I mean, <sighs> Buda Baker, maybe. I mean, I, he, I, like James. M Minka Fitzpatrick ran a 4-4-6. Minka Fitzpatrick had a 47th percentile broad jump at the combine, 15th percentile vertical. Yeah. yeah. All the, so many of the guys that are successful yeah. at that position. You know, Derwin's kind and of no his own beast. He's so much faster on the field. Than so on the field. Yeah, no it's all reaction faster. time yep. and, and just recognition. And think yep. about your Justin Simmons is the world and the guys that are going in the third round. Safeties aren't built out of traits. The no. guys that we see be no. really successful in the league. It's about more than that. And Brian Branch seems to kind of embody a lot of that idea. Absolutely. And this is the first first safety off the board, right? We haven't had, yeah. and so yeah. it's... I, and he's more of a slot. I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, Middle yeah. of the field defensive back, let's call it. Yeah. Spine, yeah, so, of no, no, so spine of the defense defense. Right, yeah. and uh, ironic that he is my... Uh, this is the fourth pick the Lions have made. He's my highest rated player. I was just going to ask that. Um, was Laporta number the second highest? Oh, no, Gibbs. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Gibbs. Yeah, and then... Uh, but hey, we have another pick here. 46 pick, the New England Patriots take Keon White, edge defender from Georgia Tech. I think he was probably the highest rated edge left for you, right, Dane? Yeah, once B.J. Argelary went, yep. then next up was going to be uh, was Keon White, who, uh, you know, love 
I love Daniel Jeremiah. He's one someone I should respect more than anybody. He was super high. He had him as a top 10 player uh, at one point in the process. I, I couldn't get quite there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and DJ backed off a little bit. I think he ended like, <laughs> in, the, in the 20s somewhere. But um, you know, you understand why you would think that because of that uh, that size and that quickness that he has. Uh, I just wish it led to more production, more impact uh, on a snap to snap basis. But again, you, know, you understand what the traits that he offers. Why, especially here in the middle of the second round, Patriots, you know, they're having quietly a nice, nice okay. little draft with Gonzalez, now yeah. Keon White, really finding some nice players on defense. And the two numbers you can look at, some you look at sometimes with traits with ed edge rushers, it's kind of funny with Patriots ones because they like to push the pocket. Yeah. Arm length and bench press. You can kind of just look at that, 34 inch, 34 inch arms and 30 on the bench press. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I don't really need to look at triangle mm -hmm. numbers or anything as far as how Patriots view these guys. And also, like, this is a guy, he was a late, late watch for me. Uh, was that also he was an old Dominion tight end, right? Tight that, end. that was super. Yes. That's I, I think that's so fascinating when a guy switches spots. Like I really do when they actually played there for multiple years and switches spots because you're hoping for there's even that little bit more room for growth at the new position. Yeah. Washington's pick is in at 47 here. Jartavius Martin, cornerback oh, from Illinois, it. Dane. Yeah. Devon Witherspoon's teammate, Devin Witherspoon's teammate. What do you think about Martin going to Washington? And this is a guy I mentioned. If, if there was a big surprise in the first round, could it, who could it be? And Quan Martin was a name I mentioned on the pod as because he's just so well liked because of what he does. He was a superstar. You talk about you know with Brian Branch and maybe not being that explosive athlete. Quan Martin is that explosive athlete. 44 inch vert at the combine. Uh, ran really well. His broad was over 11 feet. Uh, but he, he rotated between single high and nickel. They played him a lot of different areas. I, to me, he was more of a 90-10 player where 90% of the time, he, or 90% of the play, the first 90%, he was in position, he knew what was going on, just that last 10% yeah. finish. Uh, but, you know, a guy that can play nickel, play safety, big fan of Quan Martin. Yeah, I mean, this makes sense. We've gone over the Washington roster a few times this offseason going like, they actually got some stuff to them. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of these spots, especially defensive line, of course, but just the offensive weapons, okay. You know, even that running back, they have just nice pieces all around, but you kind of look at their DB room, and you're like, okay, I, I like Forrest. And, uh, corner, like, yeah, you can look at that, but it's just another kind of IQ player, right. I would say. Like, Forbes has a great feel for the game we yes. talked about yesterday. Getting these guys that are kind of more football players, too. It doesn't even matter what the testing is. Yeah, he did well, but it's just that they, they know how to play the game. Also, shout out to a couple of Illinois coaches that I played with that coached these guys. Him and Witherspoon was Aaron Henry and no, Antonio I, Pinellas. Yeah. Great guys and, like, doing a great job coaching these guys up. I'm really happy for them. They got two guys going within the top 50 in this That's draft. Awesome. So yeah. Now you get Forbes, likely on the outside. Kendall Fuller is already there. You add Quan Martin to the mix, who could play a little nickel, play a little safety. I believe that Cam Curl was a free agent after this year. Yep. So in 2023, going to be a pretty crowded room. Yep. And there's a chance that, similar to Detroit, when they're in nickel, when they're looking at some of those 6DB looks, you get a lot of those bodies yep. out there together. And then maybe is this a plan for if they have to move on from Cam Curl after the year? They've spent a lot on the defensive that, line. So just makes sense, I think, with that, Washington's that timeline and position. Smart and feisty. I mean, yeah. I mean, even with Forrest back there at safety, it's like that's another guy with an IQ. So no it's doubt. just it's an that's an interesting room. It's kind of cool. Like they all kind of cut from the same cloth in their own way. And Quan Martin fits because he has the he's, he's a tough tackler. Yeah. Uh, the character's terrific. Yeah. So that's a that's a great fit. And Speaking of great fits here, with the, the Bucks trade up to 48 and they get your boy, Aaron's. Cody Mock, North what Dakota a State, man. <laughs> just a just a picturesque human being. Every interview is amazing with him. Oh yeah, he's like he the most likable. Yeah, oh no, absolutely. But he very very likable. He, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> I haven't even considered the redhead offensive line potential now oh, with Ryan yeah. Jensen and Cody Mock playing right. next to each other. Oh, well, and this is right. the Bucks are a team that they love those small school yeah. interior offensive they line. They sure do. They, they love do. those guys. Yep. And yeah. Cody Mock is the next one up here. They've done a good job with it. Oh my yeah. <laughs> God. Six five, three hundred pounds. A, I mean, he's a walk-on tight end. Yeah. Walk-on tight end and put on 75 pounds, turns into this tackle, uh, but didn't lose that athleticism. The mm -hmm. way he moved, the best se the best three cone I've ever really heard of for an offensive lineman, 7-1-2. Un wow. Unreal. Uh, it's but, like an edge rusher. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, some wide, better, some wide receivers yeah. in this class, no doubt. But, you know, the, the attitude, um, you know, it's – 
and he's, you know, the, the term country strong, you yeah. hear that a lot. But he grew up on a farm, you know, <laughs> he, he has it. He's got like eight brothers and sisters, you know, he's, it comes from a big family, comes from a farm, uh, and he goes to North Dakota State where, you know, this was not the path where yeah. you thought he, he thought he was going to go, and he just kept getting better and better and better. You love the personality that he has. Uh, you know, he, some, one of my other you know, favorite things when watching the North Dakota State tape was just watching him after the whistle. He always had something to do, whether it was a little bump, whether it was a, a really emphatic first Image. down. He's going to get along the with Brad Jensen brothers. real yes. well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> real well. And, and the position flex that now he gives yes. this I was going to ask you, huge. where do you think yes. he lands? Because now they move on from Shaq Mason. Obviously, yes. right. they cut Donovan Smith. So Tristan Wirfs moved to the left side. Matt Fiewer's on this team. They still have a needed guard. So in all of the kind of iterations of this offensive line, where do you think he fits best? It's, it, that's a really good question because I, I said it before with him. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being the best center from this class. He has that type of ability. Um, it was primarily a tackle in college, but I think he's best going to be best at guard. Yeah. And that's what I love that with that senior bowl. He was like, where do, where do you want me? Want me to play guard? All right. Like, he didn't care. He just, you want, you want me to play tackle? All right, great. Center? All right, never snapped before. I, I've, I've practiced it a little bit playing playing out in the farm there, but uh, let's let's go try it. Yeah, he, he was up for anything. And, uh, you know, I thought he did a nice job. And right. that, that willingness to wherever you want me, I'll yeah. go. And the adaptability, yeah. you know, and that's part of his intelligence, part of that toughness that mm -hmm. we talked about. Um, you know, no, no, no real wonder why the Bucks traded up for a player like this. I yeah. can't get over the aesthetic of him. If they, he does play guard, just him and Ryan Jensen yeah. standing next to each other in the huddle, yeah, it's going to be man. fantastic. He's, he was practicing snapping with a bell of hay. Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> how, that's how he got it. And it's like put the donut on the bat, made it, made it firing it back there. Well, no. and it, but it's interesting because who is their left tackle right now? I mean, it, it, it might be Tristan Worse. Yeah, might right. Be worse. Okay. Yeah. And so then, who's the right tackle? Yeah. You know, is it? So they do have some work to do here to figure yeah. out how is this all going to fit? Because uh, the interior, you think you know, they like Gedecky, who Gedecky was a year, day yep. two pick last yeah. year. Uh, obviously, Ryan Jensen at center, and then uh, you know, right guard Nick Levert, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, offensive line is a work in progress. Yeah. We'll we'll see how it all shakes out. But Mock and his. Position flex is the type of guy you target when you are a team that is trying to figure things out uh, on offensive line. Yeah, they needed they needed bodies there. Yeah. It was it was funny because it was such a strength just so short such a short time ago, and then right. just on purpose it feels like they're like okay we're resetting this <laughs> and yeah this is this is continuous like you guys mentioned before. They've nailed these type of guys before. Ali Marpet, uh, I know he was D3, uh, Division 3. But, yep. um, but even, Hobart. Yeah, and Hobart, yes. But even Gadecki being a, a Central Michigan yeah. guy, you know, that's not. Uh, who, who, yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of these, Alex Kappa. Kappa uh, was another one, yeah, yes. So. Yeah, these smaller school guys, and maybe they think too, is that like, okay, well, there's traits there, there's a mentality there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll just coach them up and work it out here, and then like, we'll find their best spot for them. It's not a bad play, and they keep hitting on these guys too, so why not? Oh, yeah, Mock was my 45th player in the draft. They get yeah. him here with 48, yeah. so uh, yeah, love the value there, makes sense. Couple pass catchers still waiting to come off the board. Darnell Washington's name we haven't heard mm -hmm. yet. Jalen Hyatt now. We're getting yes. to the middle of the second round. Have not seen him come off. And again, somebody that we talked about on a receiver show, Nate. Obviously, the explosiveness is off the charts. The ball tracking, he can give you kind of a specific skill set, but a tough evaluation coming yep. from that offense in Tennessee. And speaking of that, Dane, Hennon Hooker still available right. halfway through the yep. second round. Right. Which you know what? As much as I do like Kenneth Hooker, I, this is the Very where he should be. Here. Yes. When I started yeah. seeing him in top tens of mock drafts, I'm like, what are we doing, guys? I know. I, 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 I get yeah. it. I mean, I understand why you like Kenneth Hooker, but the yeah. value is just not there. Yeah. And so this, this makes a lot more sense. It does. Yeah. Now we're getting to range. Even I had thirdish round grade on him, give yeah. or take. You know, like whatever five nine would be. Alan and Fanica. <laughs> the way that Alan Fanica looks announcing these picks, I'm like really rethinking some of my life choices and taking care of myself. It just looks incredible. It's unbelievable. 49th pick, the Pittsburgh yeah. Steelers go with Keanu Benton from Wisconsin, did. Dane. What do we think? Yeah, this is uh, defensive tackles. We're going to come off the board here pretty quick. Keanu Benton, easy player to like. Uh, Nate, I know he's one of your guys too. 6'3", 310. Played a nose in that three-man front that they yeah. ran, but you think that he's an interchangeable guy. Yes. You want him to play over the B gap, he can do that, give you some pass rush potential, something you really saw at the senior bowl yep. when he got those one-on-ones and, you know, we give him a chance, give him an opportunity, yep. and he took advantage of that. So a, a young player, he's just 21 years yep. old for a, a fourth-year senior, 
um, a high school wrestler. That's a big part yes. of his game and what he does. So you know he understands leverage. You, you know he understands uh, you know, just how to use his body and yep. be in position. And so uh, not every team was saw the pass rush potential, but I think if you did, he's a top 50 pick. Yeah, I, I'm a big, big fan and honestly my favorite uh, Badger from the last few years uh, like really was at any position. I, I enjoyed watching him. He always stood out and the kind of sub uh, side story I know about him was that he was the last offer of his class. Mm. Wisconsin had an open offer. He was a local kid. They're like, all right, day before signing day. Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. And he signed. OK, cool. You know, not an early enrollee. Hey, he's right. going to come in camp. OK, yeah, sure. Good, good for you. Started as a true freshman. Like right away, they're like, oh, we just, we just fell into this guy. And the wrestling shows up all the time. And, and that's really when you watch his game, that's what shows up all the time is wrestling. So let's watch his game a little bit. Yeah, Why don't you show absolutely. us what kind of player the COs are getting here in Keanu Benton? It, it's, I, I love Dan was just even mentioning too, is just that some of that versatility with all this stuff. Like he, I really do think that is, yes, he's playing nose here. He's 95 here, by the way. <laughs> I should, should talk about that as him being that. Oh, my fault here. Maybe that will help out everybody with getting it this up on the screen. <laughs> uh, but with Cal Benton is just that like, I think he's a mauler. And that's the best way you see that wrestling background come come into play all the time because of just his ability to use his hands and use it, uh, be physical all the time and be violent. And that balance shows up as well. It's almost like a judo guy. Uh, but right here going against Michigan State, you see just firing off the ball, uh, even when he's two gapping, getting his head across and just powerful and explosive and working through. So right there in the middle, again, and just firing, staying low. And he just does this consistently. And this next rep, this is where the flash is abandoned. And this is what you saw at the Senior Bowl. Mm -hmm. It's just this instant win. See that hand usage and balance? He's a mauler. This is, you know, he's not to that tier with the shades of Jeffrey Simmons. But just that type of play style, I should say. But I'm not going to say, I'm not comparing him. He's not that tier. Uh, but just that type of play style with that big, mauling, in interior defense alignment. And this is going to be the last snap where I show a little bit of that pass rush right here 95 again but a little bit of that pass rush and winning instantly staying balanced even through the side block and just overwhelming the center and getting through now you just want to you always want to close that one step closer but when you saw at the senior bowl you saw more of those flashes of him as a pass rusher and that's why i think i really like him more as a pro even more than i liked him as a college player yeah love it i agree with all that that makes that makes a ton of sense i'm pretty sure the guy that the, the Michigan State receiver that caught the ball in that clip that you just showed was Jaden Reed, yeah. who just went one pick after it, Keanu Let's get Madden the clip back up. No. To the Packers <laughs> with a 50th pick. They do pick a receiver, their second pass catcher under the 195 here. pounds. No. Wow. They, they broke it. Everyone's going to yell at me on Twitter because I tweeted he, that this morning. <laughs> 187. Yeah, yep. And, and he's. But what you love about Jaden Reed is he plays bigger than he that he that he just looks yes. on paper. Uh, he is a guy that you can throw up clips where he's catching the ball off the helmet of DBs, making plays. Uh, I, Jaden Reed, if you watch the Senior Bowl at all and you saw him during practices, he was beating everybody. Speed, there was nuance to what he's doing. He can inside outside versatility. Love Jaden Reed. I, surprised he went this early, yeah. I, but I, at the same time, don't hate it at all. I, no. I think he's, you know, to see him go ahead of some of the other receivers still on the board is surprising. But love Jaden Reed's game, and you know, I think it's it's an interesting fit with the Packers. And we know what they like. You mentioned it. Uh, uh, he's kind of one of your guys. You yeah. said like some of them you're a little higher on, and I agreed with you completely. I. He, he is just a useful receiver. I could see him lining up anywhere and yeah, just being yeah. good at what he does. He has the deep speed. He has a little return ability, I believe, too. And, yes, uh, and that just, that kind of speaks to his do it allness. And yeah, his film was a little better last year, but it was still pretty dang good this year. And he's just like, like he's just a football player. I like him yeah. as kind of that number three for them. Mm -hmm. And they went below their size threshold. They the Packers really look at only 195 pound or above receivers. I tweeted this this morning. And of course, it's wrong <laughs> the first time I tweeted, but it is that they must really like him. Yep. And they, yeah. he's he's a football player playing receiver, but he has some juice. Now think about it all. You have Romeo Dobbs. Yep. You have Christian Watson playing right. on the outside. Yep. Jaden Reed potentially playing in the slot, and Luke Musgrave. Yes. We're remaking this pass yes. catching core on the fly very quickly. Speaking of being on the fly, the picks are rolling in right now. That's great. 51st pick, the Miami Dolphins take Cam Smith, corner from South Carolina. Welcome to the draft, Miami Dolphins. They, they are yeah. here. Right. Uh, obviously, we know <laughs> that they made the Jalen Ramsey trade, but Xavier Howard, who knows how much longer he's going to be on this roster, this just kind of feels like a for right now and then also for the future pick for Miami. It, but doesn't it seem like that's maybe the corners, the strength of their team uh, on de defense? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, right. they've got a lot of decent players there. Um, so it's an interesting pick here with Cam Smith. Uh, he is two hands on. 
and that's my problem with Cam Smith. But he is a fluid guy. Yep. Uh, you know, he has decent size. Uh, it's just, can he be more disciplined? Yeah. That, that's the question with Cam Smith. If he can become more disciplined, he will be a long-term starter in this league. If he can't, he might be on a new team in three years. You yep. know, and so there's there's some there's intrigue there. Uh, but uh, the, the Cam Smith is a player that some teams were high on, some teams a little bit lower on. Okay. And that's... Not a guy I watched. <laughs> I'll just no. be completely honest with him. I watched the glimpses of him, but it wasn't the guy I truly studied. Uh, but what, what, as far as makeup with the Dolphins, that is kind of interesting because that is, when I look at their defense, that is kind of their strength. Maybe you look at other positions. I, I do like the defensive front. Of course, like the offense, I thought maybe they will go O-line right. and, and kind of help that out. But, yeah, it's not bad to just inject even youth when you're trying to transition some of these positions and a premium position, of course, being corner. And, again, you got Vic Fangio. He might want to just like, hey, no, I want some youth there. I want some guys that I can coach up and figure out at that position, and I want kind of one of my guys. We Next another... pick, 52nd overall, the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> Boy, do they love their running backs. Uh, Take Zach Charbonnet from wow. UCLA in the middle of the second round, Dane. I mean, this is around the range, or where'd they take Kenny Walker last about year? Right here, I yeah. Mean, yeah. About 10 picks earlier, uh, but same thing. Had an outstanding rookie yep. year. You think, okay, we're good at running back. Nope. Well, let's keep adding to the mix with Charbonnet, who is an outstanding player. I mean, yep. he is. He might not be as explosive as some of these other backs that we're going to be talking about uh, being drafted today, but man, the vision, the contact balance, it, it's just outstanding. It uh, is. And he's a really nice pass catcher. Uh, he can do a lot of things without the ball as a blocker, yep. and just just knowing he's out there, the defense has to account for him. Um, so he just he does a lot of the running back specific things yep. really really well at a high level. I, I really like his vision. I, I almost preferred him in like a zone type scheme because I like him to just get north and he uh, reads so well. He does yeah. and different and UCLA depending on the week would use so many different run schemes under Chip yeah. Kelly and he was good at all of them. Pin and, pool and yep. I mean, they're doing yeah had enough juice to get to the outside and all that and. Let's see. Let's well, see. What, what kind of player are we talking about? Was Zach Charbonnet going to Seattle here, Dave? Uh, was was Charbonnet? And honestly, him and Kenneth Walker couldn't really be any more different right. as running backs. Yeah. Like Kenneth Walker is kind of a ball of chaos. He's Sonic. Mm -hmm. This is this is I don't know Knuckles. His tails. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Knuck, I'm gonna go with Knuckles here. <laughs> um, but again, he he's a bigger back, but he's light on his feet and he tempos his runs. And we usually yes. have sometimes for a receiver, but here is just that he knows how to press the line get north, and run vertical. And that's the thing, is that he's not that big bruiser, like downhill type, but he always falls forward. And I looked up a stat, and uh, Charbonnet, Charbonnet had the highest success rate of all FBS backs on first and second down last year. Mm -hmm. He was just an efficient, I, I, I was about to say bruiser, but efficient balance back. And I really like this clip, because this shows off kind of the more athleticism than you think that he originally has. Making a guy miss in the hole, you see that just balance right here, and just that suddenness to run through it and that contact bounce. So what should be blocked for one or two yards, he's getting five. What's blocked for eight yards, he's getting 12. He's just an efficient runner that's always getting north and falling forward. So again, right there, he's dragging defenders. And I, I was going to show one more. Where, uh, oh, yeah, I love this one. All right, show him one more right here where he's getting to the outside here. You can run outside zone with him. You can mm -hmm. run split zone with him. You can run pin pull with him. All the runs are on the table for Charbonnet. Like he's just a balanced back, just a do-it-all, well-rounded running back. I'm very, very high on him. Uh, he was my running back three. Same here. Um, yep. So I feel like for a lot of people, but just a, a good player that, yeah, will literally hit the ground running for Seattle. He's going to hit you a lot of doubles. Yeah. Okay, not a ton of home home yes. runs, but that's why you have Walker. That's why you have Walker. You know? <laughs> and so he's. Of all of his runs last year, 22% of them went for at least 10 yards. Yeah. I mean, he is a guy that will give you those chunks. He forces tacklers. You better be on your A game yep. to get him on the ground because he's not going to make it easy for you. He's going to make it a chore. Because, uh, yeah, he's not a true bruiser, but yeah. his contact balance That's what it is. is well above average. Side tackles, he's dragging you. Like, yeah. it's like, it's, he's just a big, sturdy back. And, and really, it's just uh, so, even when I was like, talking about him and saying how efficient he was, people were going, oh, that's because their old line's so good. And there's guys running free all the time, mm -hmm. and he's running right through them. He, it was a little bit of scheme and a lot of bit of Charbonnet. He averaged 4.2 yards after contact okay what the offensive line is not responsible for no, that that, no, that no, is no, the no. running back so <laughs> there's some running backs out there that wish they had 4.2 yards per carry yes he's 4.2 yards after after the uh, yeah. contact and that that says all you need to know about his contact yeah. balance seattle over the last day or so really rounding out those complementary pieces within the offense jsn yeah. there now yeah. and there in the slot zach charbonnet to compliment kenneth walker i mean 
They've got some guys on that offense now. They've invested in those yeah. secondary, tertiary pieces. It's, it's it, the workload offense. and how they distribute the carries, that's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, do they try to get them on the field at the same time? Or is it just a work share type of situation? Mm -hmm. I, I'm really interested to see how this is all going to work. And, and with Kenneth Walker's kind of more physical run style, even not physical, I don't know, he's, he's a ball of chaos. Like yeah. He's just yeah. speed. speed. He's just, yeah, yeah he, he's just explosive in every which way. He got hurt last year. Right. And that's, hey, we, yeah, Rashad Penny's gone, even yep. though he was always getting hurt as well. So now we, this is our 1A, 1B. Or, or one and two here. I'm shocked. I shouldn't be shocked, but that the Seahawks went with him because um, with Kenneth Walker, maybe they'll get someone a little bit later. I was kind of curious. I thought somebody that needed a lead back because yeah. that's what I think Charbonnet is. Like he's, yeah, it's going to be great in a committee, but I thought he could be your innings eater. He's the guy that can get you 15 touches a game or 15 carries a game, and it's fine to run any type of run scheme. So I, I, it's, it's interesting the Seahawks went there. I think they're going to have a really good offense this year, and this is just another piece for it. Bears on the clock now, Ooh. waiting for their pick to roll in. This is the pick that they got in the Roquan Smith trade. Mm. It looks like it's Gervon Dexter Sr., Ooh, defensive okay. tackle okay. from Florida, Dane. This is a, a defensive tackle where you're betting on the upside. 6'5", 3'10", 4'8", 40. I mean, he is, he's got speed. <laughs> he's a former basketball player. Okay. Uh, he, he was all. tackle You don't usually, yeah. Right. He yeah. was all basketball, all basketball. And then his junior year in high school, the coaches kind of coaxed him out. To the, you know, Come on, get out here. And he really, that, he, all right. I'm not going to go to the NBA. This is my future. Uh, he's a five-star guy. Goes to Florida. And, man, he played a lot of snaps in that defense. And. The one thing that worries me with him is the snap anticipation. Mm -hmm. It's very inconsistent. Some snaps, when he times it up right, I mean, that, that natural leverage to get going, that forward lean, he can swim around the center. But when he's not right with the timing and that snap anticipation is a little bit off, that's where he can be neutralized mm -hmm. pretty, pretty easily, by, especially by NFL uh, centers. So, but you just feel like, okay, this is a 21-year-old player. There's more to what we've seen than what he's put out there. And so right. I think it's easy to be optimistic about what he's going to grow into. Not just what he – this is a pick for the future. Yeah. You're not expecting him to win a starting job from day one. Uh, this is a pick that hopefully two, three years from now, you're looking back and saying, hey, we got to steal with Dexter at this point in the draft. And that's and where they are on defense. I was going to say, right. that's what they need. That is what they are. They just need bodies up front, and it is not going to be a microwaved one-year solution on the defense, yep. on the defensive line or elsewhere. Yeah. So betting on traits, that's what we've seen Ryan Poles do. I mean, this is somebody that we're talking about 95th percentile testing in some of these speed stuff. And his verts, were, the vert was good, the broad was good. Ryan Poles has consistently bet on traits since he got this yep. job, even in the trenches. It's, you're going right. to the flash, right? The, the, right. Yeah. The, and I mean that complimentary. The <laughs> one player that, like, when I first watched him last summer, he had some flashes where I was like, this kind of looks like Chris Jones. Like, oh, yeah. okay, and where was Ryan Poles when Chris do, Jones was drafted? That, I, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I will show you clips where you're like, okay. I don't yeah. want to see him. I, I, okay, I can, I can see, see where it, if, when things all fall right, He's got it in him. There's flashes of violence. So it's, yes. yes. Can he be more yes. consistent so we flashes see of it? Violence. No, it, <laughs> no, trust me. There's going to be plays where he, he's like, it looks like he's the best player on the field. Like, yeah. he has that ability. It's just not always there. He's, Nick he's Hardwick announcing player. the Chargers pick again. Just another offensive lineman wow. looking fit. fantastic. Unreal. Just the, Okay. Nate, I'm gonna or Dane, I'm gonna let you do this with the 54th pick. The I thought you were going to Nate. For USC, that. uh, that's no. the last place I'm gonna go. <laughs> no, no. The USC Trojans take an edge rusher. Know Why don't you personnel. tell us all about him? Know your personnel. Tuli Tuli Pulu Tu. Close enough. Uh, like this guy <laughs> led. Tuli Tuli. <laughs> yeah, he led the FBS in pressures uh, in sacks. I mean, he was just a hard guy to keep out of the backfield. But another guy where you know what's coming. It's power. It's he wants to use both hands and go right through the blocker. Um, I mean, he was he was an unstoppable force. Now, if you force if force him to go to that secondary move, you shut yep. down that uh, what he's trying to do with that first move with that power. It starts to unravel a little bit for him. But you know what? Again, it's we talked about with Isaiah Foskey. Yep. You know, if you, even though it is predictable, even though we know what your fastball is, if you do it really well throughout the course of a game, he's going to get his pressures. He's going to get home. He's going to give you something, and there, there's value in that. And they when, need, they well, need edge guys. When we, were, when we were talking about that heat check draft yes. that the Chargers could have, if yeah. they went on a little run and it all came together, pass catcher was yeah. number one. Yep. Let's mm -hmm. get that other just bit of juice on the offense, check. and then we need another edge guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there is nothing yeah. beyond Joey Bosa and Khalil Max, and now they go and get that third guy. 
Also, a little wrinkle here. Staying in the AFC West, the Chiefs have traded up to 55. Wide receiver. Okay, so which right. wide receiver is it? You drop Jalen Hyatt into this situation, yeah, that's and now we're is. cooking with gas. Yeah, that Jalen. We, we thought maybe at 31, Jalen Hyatt could be the pick. Um, I've heard Rasheed Rice connected with the Chiefs. Oh, interesting. SMU receiver. Um, it's kind of a more complimentary piece to what they have, right? right? Yeah. Bigger body guy. Bigger Possession, body, yeah. ball winner. Yeah. Yeah, um, ball winning is like, is the, like yeah. the craziest catches. Like, uh, yeah. his, that's his real. But, right. you know, but a work in progress for all I'd, the techniques. I'd stuff. love to see Tyler Scott yeah. in that offense. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I think we're, we're to the point now where we could see Tyler Scott's name come off the board. Shoot, even Tillman. That Tillman makes would, sense. would make sense yeah. as far oh, as yeah. giving him a big body, right. traditional outside guy as well. We thought Cedric Tillman somewhere in that 50 to 75 range yeah. is where he's going to go. So this is that that would make some sense they as well. They tight end here, would they? Like as far as like just adding, like having a succession play and how Darnell much Washington? tight ends. Is that what you're thinking? Or, or yeah, like someone Tucker like Craft. Tucker Craft would be fantastic. Oh, there. I love that. I love that. Uh, like because you know they use Noah Gray a lot. I like Noah Gray, mm -hmm. but Noah Gray is Noah Gray. Yeah. <laughs> he's he uh, you know his over under at the Super Bowl was eight and a half receiving yards. That's <laughs> Noah Gray right there. He's a Swiss Army knife. So maybe because they found that path of using these tight ends last year and using them so much maybe they're like oh let's upgrade these guys and get like really you know put some rims on those tires uh <laughs> but it, it's I mean, there's so many receivers that I would just love, like there. It's nice when you have an all, you know, all Hall of Fame quarterback. Yeah, it's like it's, you drop any receiver in, yeah, you can feel pretty good about it. There, right. there, there was talk that the Chiefs were trying to maybe move up last night for a receiver. They yeah. didn't get it done. Mingo was the guy I wanted for them because that all those movement routes, yeah. overs yeah. and stuff. I was just like, get the ball in his hands, yep, create that, those yak opportunities. That kind of works for what they have. So. They do it better than pretty much anybody that's not San Francisco. Yep, um, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. It does. And so, just to kind of reset where my best available is. Drew Sanders, the Arkansas linebacker, uh, Darnell Washington, Georgia tight end, Jalen Hyatt, Tennessee receiver, Keely Ringo, the corner from Georgia, Osiris Torrance from Florida, still out there, uh, the guard, Trenton Simpson, Clemson linebacker, Josh Downs, the slot yep. receiver from North Carolina, and then DJ Turner, Michigan corner, uh, best as a nickel. So uh, kind of resetting things. Yeah, there's some really good players still out there. A couple yeah. players we thought could have gone last night in first round, and they're falling a little bit here. Yeah, this is, I know, this is like, even like, when some of the names came up, like even when Brian, like we're like, oh, Brian Branch might go here. It's like, oh yeah, he's still available. Like you yeah, see yeah, some yeah. of these guys that you're like, oh yeah. I mean, all these, Darnell Washington was looking, was. 20th pick to the Chargers, you know, or the early 20s to the Chargers. Like, that's where some, after, especially after he tested. So you're but seeing. He was one of those guys, Dane. Yeah. We were talking about we it before talked, the draft. Yeah. If there's somebody that's going to go a little bit later than we're anticipating, yes. is Darnell Washington one of them? Because is the idea of Darnell exactly. Washington a little bit better than what, what is. he is in practice right <laughs> exactly. now? Exactly. Or, you know, and what's the, because you make bet, bets on these guys, and what are the chances he's going to end up being the guy that you hope he could be, the reason you're drafting yeah. him in the second round? Uh, you know, I can understand why some teams are a little, yeah. little skittish of that. And even like Hyatt, like, okay, what's the reservations that we have? Mm -hmm. Okay, slot, he did a lot of work from the slot. He got free releases. He still has to work on the route running. But then there's the traits that you're like, well, it's great ball skills. He can, he can take the top off. So somebody's going to fall in love with that. Yes. So it's kind of interesting that maybe that some of these teams kind of like, you know, <laughs> slow themselves down maybe while I'm, I'm taking him maybe early on. Right. Detroit moving down again, stockpiling a couple more picks here. Interesting. The, the spots I thought they would go, tight end, defensive back, they've drafted a lot of those guys already because mm -hmm. they've had 17 picks, it feels like, yeah. in the first two rounds. Right. So not a surprise. They're like, you know what? We've shored up the positions we feel good about. Let's just keep amassing more picks here. Right. Look how many people there are. That's God dang. Yeah. Another big moment night. for the Chiefs. See, a, see, see a red. This, uh, this uh, event's so great. And good for, good for the NFL that the weather's been nice. You know, yeah, right. right. Don't yeah. worry about rain. And yeah. I mean, that's... We wouldn't mess. know, but <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the weather's been great. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, but also, like, this is what happens, like, last year. Initially, anytime you talk Chiefs, you're like, oh, yeah, dra uh, draft defense, draft defense. Okay, they need help. on Offense is fine. They crushed the draft last year. Yeah. They crushed the draft yeah. a couple last two years. They've got a lot of starters, so it's like there's not and that. They great. went out. The edge was the one spot. It's like they need another yeah. body there. They went out and got that in the real first round. So pass rusher. Yes. feels like things are a lot of different directions that they could yep. go here. Feels like a lot it's of things are on the table. It's, it's nice to be the Super Bowl champs. <laughs> it is. It's nice when you have that quarterback and yeah, you know you don't have to worry about it. All things are good when you got. Although those I guys. wouldn't be surprised if they draft a quarterback today. Really, I wouldn't be surprised. Not this pick, but no, yeah, yeah. later third round. 
Like, I like wouldn't be Jay, surprised. Like a Jake Hayner? <laughs> I, I was thinking Jaron Hall, maybe. Oh, wow. I, I kind of like that fit. Oh, wow. I know, okay. I know they like him. You know, you know Andy Reid and those BYU yeah, guys. Oh, yeah, oh, right? yeah. <laughs> Don't, I, 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 it, They're running the same offense. It's the flavor yeah. that he loves. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Oh, man. And even if it doesn't happen today, even tomorrow, fourth round, it's possible. Yeah. So, yeah, I think even though they did sign Blaine Gabbert to be that quarterback, too. It's like, we know. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we, I think he's coming in to compete. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, John. 100%. Because yeah. they took, uh, what's his face, the Houston quarterback, Kevin Cole. The second round, even when they had McNabb back That's right. in the day, yeah. you're, you're going. So way here back. you go. And they, they held okay. it. We were wondering which receiver uh, it was going to be. They said they were connected go here. With Rice I received a few SMU. texts this morning that said, "Hey, uh, <laughs> Chiefs and Rice, uh, keep keep that on the radar." Why do you think that is? Uh, he's a ball winner. I mean, he is a guy that will go up and come down with the football. Strong hands, um, you know, kind of a basketball player out there yeah. with the way he plays. So he was my number one senior receiver in the summer. Okay. In my rankings, I came out back in July. Loved what he did last year. You know, watching that Danny Gray and Rasheed Rice offense in yeah. 2021. Um, I, he did not test well. You could tell there's just, especially at the Senior Bowl too, there's just a little bit of juice missing, mm -hmm. you know, from that speed. But when the ball was in the air, he went and got no one it. Better. And he was productive. He was reliable. Everyone knew the ball was going to yep. number 11, and he was still able to make plays. So um, I, in, a little bit of yak, but not. that's not his no. bread and butter. He's a guy that it, it doesn't matter if you press him, um, if you give him a little bit of space, he is going to track the ball, yep. go up, and make plays. You, and you're saying that, like, track the ball, and you said a little bit of basketball on him. And usually we say that with rebounding. Him is, is alley oops. Like, that, that's how right. he plays. Like, his ball skills are really good. He's a willing blocker. I thought Great he, blocker. Yes. yes. And, and a little bit, which is now what the Chiefs are kind of like leaning yeah. into. They right. went, okay, we're cranking down the RPOs. You guys need to do that. Um, as a route runner, he's a little raw. I called him like, it, it, it was fitting that he's a Mustang. He's kind of a wild horse. Like, he has a bit <laughs> of a, go. he's kind of over there. He wavers and everything. But just the ball skills, he comes down with every ball that's near him, he's coming down with it. He, he plays bigger. He's big, but he plays even bigger than he is. And I, like you said, like he didn't test I thought he was going to kind of like, he thought there was going to be a little bit more juice to him uh, with the ball in his hands. But as far as like, you're just pinning it on him on the outside and some stuff in the middle, because I do think he has that movement ability, at least till the ball gets there. I, I like him. There's a lot to like with him, and it makes sense for what the Chiefs need as far as they're going more physical style at the receiver position. Bears trade up to 56. The fact that Devin Hester isn't giving this announcing this pick in a gold jacket is upsetting me, <laughs> but well, that's a conversation Ooh. for another day. Bears go with Tyreek Stevenson, corner from Miami. Dane, what do you think? Uh, former Georgia player. I transferred to Miami back home. Uh, played a little safety, played a little star at Georgia. Okay. And that's kind of where the animosity was. He wanted to be a corner. He transfers <laughs> back home to Miami. Six foot, 200 pounds, big physical player. And he's a good athlete. So, you know, there some questions about the consistency and, you know, just, you know, why aren't you making more plays on the ball? But we talk about with Ryan Poles and the traits. This guy has those traits. Yep. You know, it, w those triangle numbers, the speed for a bigger corner. Uh, you know, he has some inside-outside versatility. So I thought somewhere second round is where he's going to end up. Makes sense that this is where the Bears would go. Yep, long, and especially what uh, uh, Flus likes to run, especially on the outside. Well, yeah, I know he's not calling plays, but it's his defense. Uh, but as far as like what he likes to run, that kind of helps as far as defense, like being physical and being mm -hmm. more near the ball and all those types of things and being long and long and long. You're going to be on an island. So, hey, we got to make plays on the ball. We got to be jamming these guys on the outside or at least physical and getting up in their face or near them. So there is a little bit of that to his game. Uh, you said that he does have that some kind of like positional versatility as well. Like, did you you think he bumps inside at all or anything like well, that? Well, that's that's where Georgia played him. They played him that star yeah. position, yeah. and so but he he wanted to be an outside that's guy. So, but I think he has it. I, it's interesting that with the uh, the Bears, they went with maybe the the fairway shot in the first round with that right tackle with Darnell Wright. These two, Jervon Dexter and Tyreek Stevens, are more swings yeah. where. You know, uh, Dexter's young, you're betting on the upside. With a guy like Tyreek Stevenson, he is a little undisciplined, you know? Yep, and yep. so you, ha you have to kind of cross your fingers that he's going to figure things out here now in the NFL. The Bears, I mean, we'll see what happens with with Kyler Gordon. And, mm -hmm. you know, and Jalen Johnson's going to be free agent after the year. So does Gordon stay inside? Do they play Stevenson on the outside? Does he move inside? And Gordon moves outside, so how the cornerback position shakes out for them is a question, but it certainly was a need. Yes. They needed one more corner, however yep. you wanted to cut it. So interior defensive line corner, both pretty huge needs for them if you looked at that Bears depth chart. 
Giants with the 57th pick go with John Michael Schmitz, center for Minnesota. Interior offensive line, I think, was a spot where the yep. Giants could go. Yep. You know, ben Bredesen is a short-term answer yeah. there at center. You know, Mark Lewinsky probably one more year there at guard. So, again, a, a team that, at least over the next couple of years as you project forward, was absolutely going to need more bodies. Nick Gates moved on this offseason. Right. Just a lot of guys, a lot of moving pieces there. You know? Every single second-round mock that I did, John Michael Schmidt to the Giants every time <laughs> because that's, it fits exactly what they need yep. and exactly the type of player they want. Uh, and, and I heard from a lot of Giants fans, oh, he's not going to get there, he's not going to get there. I, I think he was a little overrated through the process mm -hmm. when he showed up in first round mocks. He's not that type of player, but he's still a really good player. Hey, what do you think solid. keeps him from being that type of player? I, I, the, the he's long first round mock. Oh, yeah. Not an elite athlete, needs to keep his hands and feet on the same page. You know, throw on the uh, Illinois tape. Uh, one of the first plays, he's on the ground because yep. he wasn't able to react to the blitzer. So, I, you know, he's not that top tier athlete that you want from the, the center position. But he's really smart. He's strong once he gets his hands on you. Um, he's a six-year senior. You know, he could have came out last year. I think it would have been a top 100 pick. He went back, six-year senior. So this is an experienced guy ready to step in and be a starter for this team. Oh, yeah. He easily could be that day one star because, what you said, uh, the mental side. And they're going to put it on him. And it, this just makes sense. I'm glad, like you, know, like you said, that mock there. It's like, yeah, they, they needed – a center, a guy to snap the ball, a guy that can handle that stuff. There were some issues with them last year, especially, you know, John Feliciano being in and out, center and guard for him. And when he was not in, it was kind of, things kind of fell apart about yeah. where, where the protection was going, where everything was going. So this is a guy they build around. They invest in their offensive line. The Giants, even this is a new regime, but they're going to put some, you know, pedigree into that offensive line. They've done it again. And like you said, I was with you. When he was starting to get mocked in the first, I was like, oh, really? Yeah. Okay, but his, I like him. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly where he should go. Right, right the late end second, early third. That he's that type of player, but he could be a day one starter. And he's gonna be a more than fine one. Bryce is making about a million dollars against the cap this year. Yeah, so yeah, if they right. think John Michael Spence is their yeah. starting center, I think that probably something. He started nine games in three years. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all you need to know about what, what that uh, what his capabilities are. Tight end run. Yeah. Here we are. We thought that the Cowboys might go tight end in the first round. Instead, they come back with a tight end in the second round with the 58th pick, Luke Scoot maker from Michigan. See, and it's really interesting when you you have a Michael Mayer staring you in the face in the first round, but you know the defensive tackles are not going to fall to you in the second, so you make a decision. We'll go with the Michigan player in the first round. We'll come back and get the Michigan player in the second round <laughs> right. uh, with Luke Schoonmaker. Taco didn't scare him off. But. No, apparently not. Uh, I think you and I would both agree we would have taken Tucker Craft yes. here. Yes, I would uh, But Luke Schoonmaker still is a day two player. Yep. Um, 6'5", 255. He is an athlete, can make plays as a route runner, but he's also a pretty good blocker. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is just a uh, another one of these combo guys that you want to play him in line, he can do it. You want to detach him, he can give you something. My biggest thing with him is can he stay healthy? Yes. Shoulder yeah. injuries this year, couldn't even finish his pro day before he got hurt. Then but practice at the Shrine Week because he was yeah, hurt too. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a big Luke Schoonmaker fan. I yep. just I hope he's able to stay healthy because if he if he can, he he has a chance to be a really solid starter in this league. If you were looking at the Cowboys depth chart coming into this weekend and you were circling the needs in red pen. I think the first one might have been tight end. I think mm -hmm. the second one might have been interior defensive line. Yeah. Yeah. Now in the first two rounds, that's what we get. get it. Makes sense. Uh, and again, no offense to Jake Ferguson. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's uh, another Dalton time. Ferguson that's, Hendershot yeah, the third. There yes. you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're all the same person. And actually, if you probably looked at the measurables, they're probably all going to be the exact same size. Six <laughs> three. Maker's a pretty good athlete though. He tested yes, pretty well. Yes, Six eight did. one three cone. Yeah, uh, that's, yes. a, that's 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 pretty good for a guy that's that, that size, two hundred fifty pounds. He's not built like you. Like he's got right. a square body where you're not expecting that kind of movement. <laughs> Out yeah. of, you, know, you don't you think know. SpongeBob's going to move that no. well in space? Yeah, and, yeah uh, Tucker Craft is the ultimate square body. <laughs> uh, but he, like, he is. Like, he's a. Uh, I've looked at him as the tight end consolation prize. Okay, you missed out on the the, the big. You know, the big time guys, I kind of looked at him as the Michael Mayer Constellation Prize. Does everything well. He, he's a good blocker. That's why I first liked him. But then mm -hmm. a game early on in the season, I'm trying to remember what it was, but who cares? He ran like a little stick route where he's coming out of the route. I was like, oh. Maryland? That I would be, make sense. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. It was early in the year. And I was like, oh, okay. You have that. Yeah. You, you have that. Like, and yeah. And then he tested. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't, I don't think it would be like that. But yeah. yeah. But it was like, <laughs> it was more to him than I thought. But he is a balanced Y, can play in line. And Enough receiver for him. He's an auxiliary target. It's perfect. When you see a tight end at the top of the route, 
you know, a lot of these guys, they're big, they're lumbering, they're, it just, it's a little rigid as yep. they drop their weight, get out of the break. Well, he stopped and then they come yeah. out. Yes, he was, yep. he was really able to do it in a fluid motion, really impressed. I was like, I didn't know he could do that. That's how I uh, went like, into Okay, him. Luke Schoonmaker, you have my attention. His name's Luke Schoonmaker. He's from Michigan. He's a tight end. I was like, I, I had, I had, I know you're not supposed to scout the helmet. I was scouting the last name. Yeah. Like, oh, he's going to be a blocker and probably a little stiff. No, he can move. It was going to be Peyton Hendershot. Yeah, yes. Schoonmaker, yes. the fourth. Yeah. But they love their balanced tight ends. And like what I mean by that, a three down tight end that you can ask them to do everything. They do everything well. They check a lot of boxes like him, Jake Ferguson, and Hendershot. Like, that's kind of fun. He, he grew up in the Northeast. Funny thing with him is he was a quarterback. Uh -oh. uh, and then this little, this more unknown guy came to school named Will Levis. And uh, <laughs> Schoonmaker changed positions, changed schools, and went to Michigan and on a different path. But, you know, he's uh, not a big play threat, but he's, again, another guy's going to get you those doubles. Oh, yeah. I think of uh, his career receptions, I think only four over 25 yards. So, again, not going to give you those those home runs, those big plays. Which is interesting with the testing. The fact that yeah. he tested no. as such an explosive athlete, yeah. but you've never got those. Is, and the uh, offense, I think, too, that Michigan yeah. offense, they don't ask that of their tight ball ends. control offense. Right. <laughs> that ball's on the ground. We've had five tight ends go, I believe, in the top 60 picks, correct? Yeah. That and right. we have two more that... Yeah. We'll be surprised if Tucker Craft went in the second round. Maybe not. You know, the Bengals need a tight end. Yep. How, what's six the tight ends, yeah. Six no, it's five. No, five Darnell, have gone. Darnell Washington and, and, and Tucker Craft potentially right. could yeah, right. go. What, what's the record for tight ends in the first two rounds? Oh, good question. I mean, it, it feels like we're absolutely approaching it if we haven't broken it yet. Yeah. Uh, I, I have one for the first three rounds. I want to say eight is the record for the first three rounds. Or seven. It might have been seven. I'm sorry. So now we're already at five. We, can yeah. get, we could get six in the first two rounds. Right. It, it would not picks. be surprising at all. Right. Eight, yeah. Eight's the record for the first three rounds. It's happened twice. Yeah. So. Uh, that yeah, and there could be plenty of these guys going. I mean, right. that, that, yeah. that was always the and, and the Cowboys are a perfect example. We knew they needed a tight end, yep. and instead of taking Michael Mayer, they take they the, the harder to find position, tries. and yep. they're okay sacrificing a little bit uh, to get Schoonmaker. It's really interesting. I think there's so many different factors in play. That one we've yeah. seen it play out multiple different times, and just this idea of they're getting pushed up because teams just need more receiving options. Yes. I think so many different factors are kind of contributing to what this draft has looked like at that position specifically. I think it's fascinating. And, and you, we were talking about the explosive playability or lack thereof because of the offense and everything. But Dak and tight ends, Dak Prescott and the tight ends, he's going to pepper them underneath. Yeah. He loves having that kind of auxiliary option, a number three in his progression where you just, okay, six-yard gain, I'm good. That's what he's going to be, and I think is going to be perfect for that role. Just think about this Dallas offense if it all clicks into place. Brandon Cooks is there now, mm. you know, that offensive line in place. And then here with the 59th this pick, is, the Bills get an offensive lineman in Osiris Torrance from wow. Florida that we thought they might be looking yeah. at yeah. at the back half of the first round. Yeah. Right? And so the first article I do after the draft is over, I rank my favorite draft classes. I can tell you right now, Buffalo is going to be in the top <laughs> ten. Uh, love with, we, we talked about the fit with Dalton Kincaid in the yeah. first. Yeah. If they this drafted Osiris great. Torrance in the first round with that pick, I don't. everyone would have been like, okay, yeah, get offensive line, mm -hmm. like it. Osiris Torrance is he started my guard right away, and he's going to help that uh, help that offense. Yep. So to get him here at 59, like That's I get great. it, he's not a great athlete. You know, he's not this superb mover, but once he gets his hands on you, it's yep. over. Yes. And again, I'll say it with him. It, he, I'm, he could have stayed at Louisiana. Mm -hmm. He would have been a, you know, a, t a top 100 pick, no matter what. Uh, but he decided to go to Florida, follow his coach, and he played at a high level this year in the SEC against SEC competition. So, uh, surprised he fell this far. Again, again I think it was a, that athletic testing may, maybe soured some. Mm -hmm. uh, they have certain thresholds, what they want, a position, certain movement abilities. He's more of the just line up, I'm going to dominate the man across from me. And he did it consistently on tape. This is another, and this is why I thought he would maybe go to them in the first round, was that reconfiguration of their offensive philosophy. Yeah. And he's, yeah. a, he's an at you blocker. And I think they're going to be more downhill with everything. This makes sense of for mm. another downhill type blocker and reconfiguring the offense completely. I, I just really like this alternate image that the Bills are kind of creating, kind of a yank to what they've shown before, more spread finesse. It's like now they have this kind of angle where it's like, hey, we'll just go at you. And I think he's been well coached. I really liked with the Florida's offensive line and how they coached their guys. Right. So I thought they were really mentally astute and they asked them to do a lot with good eyes. So I think mentally his transition should be okay as well. I wonder how those spots shake out. You know, they gave Ryan Bates that contract last year. They matched what the Bears gave him. They signed Connor McGovern in free agency. Yep. Mitch Morse yeah. is still there. So you know they've committed to a couple different guards already in their roster. So how they see the interior of their offensive line I think will be a question for yep. them heading into the and year. And this might have been a case where, hey, we can't 
can't pass on this yeah, bag. Yeah, I totally understand right, that. Yeah. They brought him in for a 30 visit. Right. So I was wondering, when I saw that, I was like, oh, what are they What are they trying mm-hmm, to do here? Because yep. tackle seemed like it might be the move for them on the offensive line. But when they wanted to meet with them, I, kind of alarm bells going off the back of your head. It's like, how do they see this position group? And are they trying to undergo this attitude change yeah. and have the shift happen? And, and that's the thing when I've been mentioning this with the Bills is that it's not like, oh, tomorrow they're going to be in heavy personnel. Every time. I think it's just – do you have that ability to pivot to that type of mindset in that game and ask for it? I think they pivoted. And I think they now pivoted. we get 12 they, personnel, we get Damian, an offensive guard in the second round here. Uh, Damian Harris is like a big winner of this. Like yeah. He really is because these are that's the type of blocker he thrives behind. And I, I thought I forgot it's, Damian Harris is even there. I mean, it, think about it, the way the Patriots built over the last couple yes, of years. Yes. So At you blockers. I think they cool. understand that something needed to change. Yeah. And they needed to go in a slightly different direction one way or the other, yes. and this is it. We've done so much side to side. Let's get vertical. 60th pick, Dane. The Cincinnati Bengals go with DJ Turner, cornerback from Michigan. Mm-hmm. We thought that defensive back might be on the table for them. You know, they signed all those guys a couple years right. ago, but some attrition has started, and they go corner with their second round pick. And it's interesting, you know, they went Dax Hill out of Michigan in the first yep. round last year. Come back here with uh, DJ Turner, who I think is going to be best in the nickel. I think it's where he fits the best. Um, I mean, you look at their depth chart right now with, you know, Wouzier and Mike mm-hmm. Hilton and. Cam Taylor Britt, I thought, did a nice job last year. He was a second round pick uh, in last year's draft. Yep. Uh, but DJ Turner, if you want guys that are smart, explosive, and competitive, boom, DJ yep. Turner's your guy. A little undersized. Uh, the lack of length will show uh, at times. Uh, the lack of play strength will show when he's going up against bigger receivers. But he has he ran the fastest 40 at the combine. You know, he has the speed, mm-hmm. no questions about that. He is a really competitive player. I mean, he is locked in from the start. Um, and I think he's really smart with the way he plays. So I like him best in the nickel uh, because of some of those size concerns. But, you know, if you need to play him outside, I think you could do that as well. Well, that's – and and Dax Hill they drafted too. It's like that was kind of – you know, he, he did some nickel stuff as yeah. well, right? right. So, but it's nice – I mean, now they have Hilton as well. So it's kind of – it's not a bad thing to have guys that can do that. And, and the speed, though – is a little different what they had at corner really before, right? They kind of had more crafty guys by not some, maybe not always by choice, but just who they had to throw out there. So maybe now getting a guy with kind of plus athletic traits is kind of nice. And again, this is another defensive pick, and this is the reconfiguration of the Bengals. The offense is about to get expensive. Let's get the defense cheap. Yeah. And speaking of that, one of those guys that they signed in free agency a couple of years ago is they remade that team. Well, two guys, Mike Hilton, one, should be Wuzier, two. Hilton, two more years left on his deal, one more after 2023. Awuzie is a free agent after this yep. season. Okay. So we saw them do this exact thing with Dax Hill yep. last year where they sprinkle him in slowly as a rookie. They have those starting safeties. Von Bell and yep. Jesse Bates hit free agency. Dax Hill steps in as a starter. Right. So that same sort of succession plan feels like we might be looking at that with TJ Turner. And, and there's been a lot of, yeah, that secondary looks a lot different than it did last year. Sure know, no more Jesse Bates. Uh, mm-hmm. No more Von Bell. No more Eli Apple. Uh, Trey right. Flowers. I mean, it, right. so there's a lot of turnover here, but they've been preparing for this. That's why Dax Hill was the first round pick last year. Yeah. Uh, and they're continuing to do that with the DJ Turner, who, again, is just a really solid player that I, I think he checks a lot of boxes. And, yeah. you know, you feel good about uh, a guy whose first name is Juan Drago. You know, I mean, that's awesome. How he got DJ <laughs> out of that, I mean, it's because of his dad. His dad is the same name. But uh, that's such a disappointment. I'd be I so know. bummed if my name was Juan Drago and I went by DJ. DJ. Right, yeah, right. So, <laughs> really neutering the name. There. Maybe, maybe he'll change it when he gets to the NFL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll look pretty, pretty cool on a football card. They really would. Uh, no, this is uh, with the Bengals too. Is even with the Miles Murphy pick and everything. Where it's again, they have, they're having plans for these positions. That's exactly what it is. Just uh, building contingencies. Like we put depth. Yeah. We get an injury yep. here, injury there. You're yeah. protecting yourself. And I think that when you feel like you're a real contender planning for the worst case scenario is not the worst way to think about your mm-hmm. roster building. Right, right. And that's why we got to talk to the Lions a little bit. Too. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's it's, what I'm yeah. saying. Contingency plans are very good. I mean, even the Seahawks went with another running back. Like, I know, yeah. well, that's more of, yeah, they, they're they not going against type there. But uh, no, but just having those plans, especially even if positions that you think are a strength, not that I'm saying that, that DB is for them right now, but just sometimes it's nice to just keep the keep it turning. Yeah. Just like what the Eagles are doing. Just keep keep another guy down the assembly line. Always have a plan. I think the only real like need, if you're looking at the roster that still kind of looms large for them, would be tight end. You know, they didn't address those right. first two rounds. And I think pass catching running back, but that's something they could do in the well, third and fourth yeah, round. Right tackle, right? Like we don't know what's gonna happen there. Jonah Williams is under contract. He is. I mean it's that's another it's succession plan. Right yeah, but, but yeah. <laughs> for right now, I mean it's that's one of those things where he, he can yeah. complain all he wants. He's still on the <laughs> yeah. team. He is, he is. Jack's picking at 61 here, another team that, you know, right in the mix in the AFC, one of those teams that are trying to kind of finish off this roster to kind of push them into real contender status. This is the 
Darnell Washington was a popular pick here for them. Mm, the definitely was. And then again, another team. Their own they version could of use a tight end. Yeah. Tucker Craft was another guy yeah. that we oh, mentioned that potentially yeah. going that there. Actually, I mean, because, you know, they're obviously Evan Ingram is there, but their second tight end in the last season. Mm. Chris Manhurts, he's not giving you much no. <laughs> as a pass catcher. But he had a so. role. <laughs> and, and, and Doug Peterson, uh, he likes those South Dakota State tight ends. Uh, that's yeah. right. Uh, that that so. is right. Oh, that's right. Oh, okay. They do go tight end. Yeah, well, that's with the strange. 61st pick, the Jags go with Brenton Strange from Penn State, Dane. It's so funny how the draft works. I mean, a month ago, if I told you Brenton Strange is going to go ahead of Darnell Washington, like right. people call you crazy, but right. that's how it works. I, Brenton Strange, I, maybe the best true H back in this draft. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's the way he was used. A lot of some catch and go routes. He'd play him. You know, he'd, he'd be in line. He'd be in the wing. He'd be detached. Yep. Line him ball all over the place. Uh, a functional blocker. Yes. I mean, he will finish. Uh, he loves to finish, but he's also a really good pass catcher, and he's got some juice after the catch. He will make something happen. Uh, I mean, he, he was really uh, an underrated part of that Penn State offense. Yep. Uh, first downs. Uh, you know, he, he's not maybe the most explosive player, but I, teams loved him yeah. because of that versatility and different ways he can help your offense. Walk me through why Brenton Strange over a Tucker Craft or over a Darnell Washington if you wanted to go with that position. I'll let you take this one. I, I, I wouldn't have, because <laughs> uh, I think Tucker Craft is even a better mover and everything and has oh, more yeah. upside at the other spots. So that's kind of interesting to me. I, um, I really, when I watched him, he reminded me of Tommy Tremble. Yeah, from, Nor that's a good uh, from Notre Dame a few years ago is with the Panthers now where it's like are you an F like are you like kind of like quasi fullback quasi H I like how you said kind of that H role right. like that true move tight end role but a good blocker even if it's like he is the move guy but he can kind of do all those things so if you want to get a little creative with it kind of interesting to me because it's like he's a better blocker than Evan Ingram but he's not an inline guy so yeah. it's kind of I don't know you different they're both F's as far as move tight ends, but they're way different as far as type of play style. So what's our tight end watch now? How many we have to seven? Yeah. Tight ends off the board now? And we're still waiting on yeah. Darnold yeah. Washington yeah. and Tucker yeah. Craft. So hey, uh, we were just talking about him. We were. Yeah. We were. Wow. Second round, a little earlier than we thought, maybe. Yep. But uh, with the sex, 60 second pack here, Juice Scruggs, guard from Penn State, second Penn State guy in a row here. Yeah. Going to the Texans. What do we think, Dane? Guard center versatility yep. uh, can play both spots, and you know he's a guy that realized at a young age football was for him, and he really leaned into it. I mean, he <laughs> really he gets the most out of his ability. Um, I, he, he has quickness to him, and mm -hmm. he, I love the way he uses his hands because uh, he wants to control you. He wants to use his hands, keep that distance between himself and the defender, and. I, Surprising he's off the board here yeah. in the second round. But, again, I think that position flex is a big part of, of why he's the pick. You know, I, Luke Whipler from Ohio State doesn't give you that. No. Um, you know, some of these other interior offensive linemen, just they don't give you that, that versatility that some teams really place a value on. One of my favorite players the entire Shrine Week was, was Juice Scruggs. Mm -hmm. like, a, a, one of my highlighted guys that I wrote about when I did write for The Athletic. But now he is like, <laughs> as, a, as a center. I, he'll be a center, I believe, for the Texans. I, yeah. just I mean, there's a hole. I mean, there's yeah, clearly yeah. a the, hole. Look at their offensive Kenyon line. Green, like, massive spot. Yes. And I really liked him. He had just a good mindset about him. I thought he was... Um, I, I liked his moving ability. He, he had a lot of the stuff I like in a center. Um, everything was just sound with him. He was great in pass pro. Mm -hmm. Like uh, and I know one on ones is not. You kind of want to just see more movement and everything. You don't want to take too much. But he dominated in pass pro. Like he was yeah. doing really really well um, in the one on ones in practice. And I watched him more on film. But really liked the player way earlier than I thought. I thought maybe a round later, maybe at at the highest. Like, he was my number one eighty six player. So okay. this is my first player outside the top 100 to be drafted. I had him more as like an early fourth guy. Yeah. That's kind of, wow. the, yeah, so like that's how I looked at him because I didn't think he was an overwhelming athlete. Do you feel just, like there just weren't that many other centers available at this stage of the draft? Centers with position flex. Okay. I think that's that's the key distinction. Here. Okay. So, ball. yeah, and uh, welcome Denver to the draft as well. They moved up, right, to get Denver uh, moves to up to draft Marvin Mims Jr. from Oklahoma with the 63rd Sean, pick. Sean Payton Interesting in particular ways. because a lot of receivers on the yeah. Denver Broncos right yeah. now. So what does this mean for a Jerry Judy? What does this mean for a Cortland Sutton? Sutton? Sean Payton putting his stamp on things here very quickly with this free agent yeah. class, plus making a, re a receiver the first pick of that yeah. new era Moving in Denver. up for him, too. And Jalen Hyatt's still out there, right? Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Yeah, Marvin, same kind of type cast right. of players, or I'm sorry, type of players, I should say. I mean, Mims is he's a fun player. He wins yep. down the field, yep. speed, really good athlete. He's just he's a smaller player, mm -hmm. and you know you wonder, 
can he be more of a complete guy? Can he give you more underneath? Or is he strictly a vertical player that you want down the field? Um, because ideally, you want your downfield threats to be a little bit bigger than he is. Yep. Uh, so, but not surprised he's off the board, you know, in the top 75. That's probably where we thought he would go. Just interested that it's to Denver. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I can understand how it fits their offense. Yep. But it's just, there's a lot of bodies there at that position. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. So maybe one fewer after this is over. Yeah, yeah. it really seems that way. It might way. be. Um, especially, like, he would be more of how, even though how Judy was used, Jerry Judy was used at Alabama, how he's been used in the pros, it's not that shifty route running type. It's a vertical threat. Yeah. And I think Mims is a little better at that as far as, like, mm. tracking and everything. So it's kind of maybe, if I were to guess, I'd say that's a guy that's probably going to be on, on, the, on the way out as opposed to Cortland Sutton. And Sutton is more, to me, a Sean Payton receiver. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they, they kind of have a nice more, uh, again, uh, this is the word I'm just going to always use it, but the synergy of that room makes a little more sense. Tim Patrick coming back, but there's yeah. a lot of bodies. He's a little bit of a different type, uh, but if Judy's still there, it would be like, okay, that's a little iffy, iffy, but if he's on the way out, that makes a lot more sense. But yeah, a good vertical threat. Last Juice Scruggs point, not a sentence I thought I would say. <laughs> that, the, ba again, the Ballad of Juice Scruggs? The Ballad of Juice <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could get you with that. Uh, the Ballad of Juice Scruggs is Scott Cuisenberry being the starting center mm -hmm. right now. They, obviously, they had a need there. Not no stars on this Texans offense outside of really Laramie Tunsil. Yes. But you look at the offseason that they had, I think it really was about just making sure that we had a functional body in every spot on the offense mm -hmm. because we want to drop C.J. Stroud into a yeah. really nice situation. Yeah. You go get Shaq Mason. Now you have a center, starting center, presumably, you draft in the second round. Dalton Schultz there in a one-year deal. Robert Woods is there. Noah Brown is a useful player. Yep. And a much quieter move, they signed Case Keenum to be their backup quarterback. Right. Yep. So I think trying to do everything they can to make sure Great we're call. putting this guy into a set of circumstances where we feel good about his development. And Skirts is sturdy. Yeah, like, yeah, is that, yeah. is that a good way to put it? Like, yeah, no, definitely. Their interior is very sturdy. A lot of, a lot of big asses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shaq Mason is a wide right. Yeah. And I think you go back to their draft last year, they're expecting big things from Kenyon uh, Green yeah. in, in year two. Yeah. And John Mechie hopefully be able to yes. come back yeah. on the field. And what that means for that and, offense. And Green so. really came along in the last month-ish of the season, six weeks. I thought, right. he, I thought he started well. And yes. Then, <laughs> oh, middle, I was like, oh, quickly, boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Right. Yeah. Rookie offensive line. It's no. Oh, it's just it, it it's is. such a crapshoot yep. all the time. Always. We've seen guys struggle, and then it doesn't always matter. Mm -hmm. So you don't have really they, quarterback moving too much for you back there. That can, <laughs> that can that kind of hurt you if you, you're a little edgy on your block as well. But uh, no, that, wait, I, I'm glad you brought that up because they're making it very a uh, nice landing spot. For I just throughout. think teams are being really conscious. They are. Even like the Carolina, after losing right. DJ Moore, yeah. going to get Mingo, yes. and they have the offensive line in place. I think it's just teams understanding. We need to. This guy, it's not about him succeeding or failing. It's about us failing or succeeding him yes. or helping him succeed. It's a succeed. great way to put it. Yep. And I just think that a lot of teams are really cognizant of that now, and I like that. Yeah. If too. you're going to draft a quarterback in the top five, like you need to do everything yep. you can mm -hmm. to make sure that the bottom doesn't fall out because of your own doing outside of what he can control. Yeah. So understanding it's a plan for all these players. And, right. and, and, and yeah, no, we're talking about quarterbacks, but every position and having that plan to, hey, yes, we, we want you all to start day one. That's ideal, but... Not all of you guys can, or right. and if we do force you to start day one, let's at least not throw you in the deep end. Like let's throw you in the water that's like knee high, you know, like where it's like, yeah, you're gonna get your feet wet. We're throwing some water wings on dudes. Yeah, yeah. By drafting all these complimentary pieces yes. about your offense and making sure your support system is in place, it's a life raft. Yeah. Um, we're mixing a lot of nautical. I love it. Here. I yeah. love it. It's because the bears are on the clock and you feel like <laughs> you're sinking. feel like you're sinking. Hey, <laughs> no, hey, look, we're we're to the third round now, yeah. and there's still some big names out there. It's surprise. I, Who's I, on your mind? Drew Sanders, I didn't think, would make it this yeah, far. No more know. linebackers. Get away from me. Yeah, Trenton Simpson, uh, yeah. Clemson linebacker, too. I, Jalen Hyatt, I didn't think yeah, would make it to the third either. round. I Even in Josh Downs, I know he's a slot only, but he's a he's a really talented and People player. really liked him. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's yeah. I know. A couple, there's a few guys. That Keely Ringo, interested. even though I wasn't big on Keely Ringo. I mean, I thought just, someone would take a chance oh, half yeah. a round earlier. With that size speed combination. Yeah. So a little Any edge rushers anywhere? Uh, top edge rusher, Yaya Diaby is my oh, yeah. top edge rusher available, who I think somewhere early Super third productive. round would make sense. Um, I like that quite a bit. Zach Harrison from Ohio State is a size size speed, uh, speed freak. Length is outstanding. We, we might have a theme then. Yeah. If, if that ends up happening here. The Zach first Harrison the third would, round. would make some sense. Zach Pickens. Oh, Zach I, know, Pickens. I saw the Zach South, South Carolina. Yeah. There. Defensive tackle here with okay. the 64th pick to Chicago. Former five-star guy yeah. who, I don't know, they quite lived up to it at South Carolina, but you see why he was a five-star guy. 6'3", 290, moves well. 
they played him a lot as a like a nose, and so he was uh, really wasn't given those opportunities to to, to rush the quarterback yeah. and be disruptive. But man, when things are firing on all cylinders and he's in position to succeed, he's he makes plays. He did it the Senior Bowl. I uh, did it consistently against SEC competition. So and again, defensive tackles. We talked about this before the draft. We knew defensive tackles, and I, I, I noticed this going through my seven-round mock as I'm trying to like line everything up. I'm like, man, well, this team could use a defensive tackle. This team could use it. And mm -hmm. so these guys have flown off the board. Even though it's not a strong position, they're going a little bit earlier than we thought because if you don't give them now, you're not going to get one later. Right. So, you know, a team like you know the Browns, they haven't picked yet, but they're coming up here, I think, 74. They need a defensive tackle. And they were crossing their fingers that a Jervon Dexter would fall, that a uh, Zach Pickens would fall. And so far, that hasn't been the case, and it's not surprising. Are those guys all 20 years old? Because that's what the Browns angle at for. Well, that's why, <laughs> that's why Jervon Dexter, because he's 21 and you know, kind of sense. checks a lot of boxes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the stinking bears have crushed those plans <laughs> for, the, for the Browns. And, and with Pickens and Dexter, how – how would you say they kind of complement each other? Like, or do they do they have some sameness? Do you think? Yeah, and they that's do. Kinda, that's kind of that's kind of they're how different I body it. types. Yeah, but yeah. Playstyle's a little samey. Uh, I, I think Pickens is ready to start right away, yeah. or maybe not even start, but at least give you meaningful snaps yeah. and be part of the rotation. Where uh, Dexter is more of the flash player, yeah. upside pick. Um, so if there is a difference, it's it's that. But it's interesting. That, I mean, defensive tackle, defensive tackle. They have loading up on it. I mean, they, had, it, they needed it. Massive. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just it, all along the defensive line, it's not surprising. But I wanted to look this up because I was curious. Uh, Kenley Platt, who does the mm -hmm. our relative athletic score, which is a really useful tool, kind of looking at the traits and yeah. both positionally and then for your weight. And he does just one single score. Pretty much every single player the Bears have drafted in the trenches is over a nine. Yeah. Zach Pickens was a 9.2. Yep. I mean, his broad jump was off the charts. He ran an incredibly fast 40 at 291. Again, we have a theme for what type of players they're chasing on the interior of the offensive defensive line. Yeah. Straight, straight, straight. <laughs> and, and again, you can see why he was a five-star player. Yeah. Um, you know, he at th 290 pounds ran in the four eights. Um, you know, he, he was a guy that, uh, again, at the Senior Bowl when he had those one-on-ones. That's why it, it really gives you an opportunity when things aren't just muddied up and you have a chance to, to beat a blocker one-on-one. -on -one, you can see what he can yep. do. He did it consistently. So yeah, I, I, this is a. A little surprised they doubled up here this yeah. early, but at the same time, when you think about it, maybe not a surprise. And they need it. And it's, uh, I also, the line of thinking, it's like, well, if one of them hits, we're good. Yeah. Like, you know, as you're talking about how many teams are desperate just to get one of these guys. All right, let's get two. Like, we have yeah. the picks. Let's get two of these guys. We have a, uh, we have a need That's here. That's what this was, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they were accumulating all these picks in the second round, this was about creating the connective tissue on your roster, especially on defense. Let's yeah. go get the starting right tackle in the first round with that ninth overall pick. And then the picks we've accumulated later on, let's just try to build out that yep. defense as much as we can because the cupboard was bare. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's maybe one or two guys. You got the two guys you drafted in the secondary last season and those linebackers you signed in free agency. Yep. Anything else was on the table. Yep. Anything. So I'm, I totally understand yeah. taking some big swings at this position because you need to start taking them on defense. Uh, a little surprised he went ahead of Adebori, Northwestern. Yeah. I mean, he's still yeah. out there. Yeah. You talk about traits. You talk yeah. about, I mean, he certainly has that. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's – he, he was my 67th player. So it's a little it's, – it, it's, I don't want to see players fall or quote-unquote fall, but this is more the range where I see the Northwestern defensive tackle coming off the board as opposed to the first-round buzz we, he, he was receiving yeah. uh, throughout the process. <laughs> that people saw the testing numbers. Ah! <laughs> well, I, they were, I mean, they were historic numbers. Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, I get it, but still, let's uh, – yeah, let's remember your grade before, you know, he was a – Fourth, fifth round grade on tape. Yep. Yes. And let's not forget that part of this. And when, when, once he does get selected, do you have clips of him? Because then you see you see the traits of him mm -hmm. and also, but then the lack of finish sometimes. He's not yeah. a great tackler. Uh, but I don't want to spoil anything with that. But I, I just think it is so interesting, um, the defensive tackle position, because seeing the guys get paid, of course, this last offseason, and also all these guys, if you're only going to rush four, you need these guys. And people want to rotate and, and, and keep guys fresh. So it's not... It's, not, it's I, I like the, the idea, I'm coming around really on the Bears too, of <laughs> having these bodies. And this is also the value of the DJ Moore being included in this trade. Yeah. They don't have to don't target to chase. Uh, any of these guys. We're right. seeing yeah. where these guys are going, these receivers, I mean, the pass catchers. And really now it's like we don't have to chase any of them. We have our guy. We have our ace. Let's build the trenches now. Who and the hell knows if this is going to work out? But the process of it, what it has looked like this entire offseason, 
I cannot describe to you how different it feels <laughs> yeah. right. to watch how they've built this thing yeah. over the last year compared to what it felt like under the previous yeah. regime. It's gotta be refreshing. It, yeah. it, it is just the patience and just understanding with the value and accumulating capital and kind of taking these swings, but at the right pace, right. Yeah. it just, I didn't even mean to do that. He we're, we're, we're getting said the word. I feel like Cardinals fans are probably feeling the same way too. I yeah. feel like they yeah. ran their team like a fantasy team for the last you know half decade. That's, now they're that's the thing. Fans are smart. I mean, I think if you understand the plan and what you're trying to do, yeah. you get a little leeway with if it doesn't work out. If a player busts, if he, if he's not who they thought they would be when they drafted him. I think they give you a little bit of leeway because at least you understand what they're trying yeah. to do. It's, in, in, it's like sometimes it's like, I know I have to eat my salad and eat the vegetables. And it's like you tell them, it's like, no, this is good for you. And this is going to work out. And you're going you're gonna to like this in the long run. And it's like after a time, they're like, no, I want, I want the sugary snack. Yeah. I want the undersized receiver. And it's like after over time, you're like, okay, actually, no, that salad worked out for me. Well, I think that the Bears did go through the drive through on offense. Oh. I and mean, that was the whole point is that I want fast food mm. with, DJ, with DJ Moore getting the right tackle because that needs to happen immediately. Yeah. I need to know now. On defense, we're slow cooking some brisket back there. I mean, this is going to be a long, long process, and I think that makes total sense on both sides of the ball. So we got the Eagles back up. I'm getting hungry now. Yeah, no. yeah, ready to go. Eagles have two What's picks in a row. Ringo's available. Let's get another Georgia corner. We we'll yeah. get a Georgia defender go. in here. <laughs> yep. yeah, let's do it. Oh, it'd be phenomenal. Oh. That would be amazing. Eagles two picks in a row here, and I believe the second one is part of the Jonathan Gannon mm. tampering oh, yeah, situation, perhaps, that. which we haven't really talked about no. much, but the trade involved that Tyler Steen going to the Eagles with the 50, 56 pick offensive tackle from Alabama what do we think of this day Van, played at Vanderbilt it was a grad transfer to Alabama this past year and we, we, we kind of beat up the Alabama offensive yeah, I was line gonna say. Not being <laughs> this, uh, he was the one where you kind of okay I can yeah. you know he's a steady player um, I, I, people aren't gonna like this comparison but um, I kind of compared him to a a better Bobby Hart where you know like <laughs> he, he, he's someone that guard tackle you know he's gonna be in the NFL for a long time yeah. and he's gonna be able to get on the field give you that uh, position flex tackle guard but uh, you know someone that I, I think you can trust and so Bobby Hart wasn't always that but you know you knew he was gonna be out there yeah. so uh, you know Steen again tackles they started flying off the board this is the next one up that's what I was gonna say so, yep. This is the best of the rest. Right. That, Andre yeah. Dillard leaves in free agency, yep. so they needed a swing tackle. They needed a third guy, and they just build in depth. Yep. Well, and I, I he might be your starting right guard from day one. Interesting. Okay. I, and we talked about it, um, you know, with some of these other offensive linemen as – the right now he's the right guard for the future maybe he's the tackle we talked about with the Falcons um, yeah. and you know a succession plan for maybe Jack Jake Matthews maybe this is a succession plan for uh, at right tackle with uh, Lane Johnson where he's the guard right now but in the future uh, might be able to kick back out to tackle yeah two straight picks here for the Eagles say. Sidney Brown safety from Illinois is the next one I guess I missed when Illinois has become defensive back you we got yeah. three guys way in the go, first Hank. three rounds Aaron Henry the University of Illinois way to go man Antonio Finales way to go guys yeah Sidney Brown <laughs> landing in Philly day yeah and uh Based off of the tape uh, over the summer, I don't think you ever would have thought no. top 100 pick. But this year, six picks, made plays, um, and then the process was really kind to him. He had a really nice senior. He was the best safety I saw at the Senior Bowl, and that really helped him. Goes to the combine, tests really well. That helped him. So you're looking at, it, okay, production, check, testing, check. Uh, character off the charts. Mm -hmm. Throw on a special teams tape as a as a gunner, and he's beating Riley Moss down the field and making plays uh, on the punt return. So I mean, he is a guy that is smart. He's active, um, a little bit smaller, and he needs to be a better tackler. I thought he'd be a little surprising when before I went in. I thought he'd be a better tackler, uh, especially in the box. Yeah. When you're playing him close to the line of scrimmage, he a little shallow with some of the angles, and needs to be a better tackler to trust, be able to trust them yeah. out there but you can't really argue with what he put on tape this year well and they needed this I mean they need they right. need yeah, he's they, gonna have a chance to play yeah, yeah. I mean, they, that's they, weird. I mean they've been able to draft luxury picks with Nolan Smith yes. and build depth in some of these areas but looking at their depth chart safety absolutely was the most glaring need they mm -hmm. had heading into yes. this whole thing so I have to assume he's gonna have a chance to push Reed Blankenship a little bit for <laughs> some of those snaps too. early on and again it's like it's it's one of those things where if they're like oh we want the vet even if Reed is a young vet uh, we want that guy it's like hey we still have you know special teams 
team's versatility is very nice. I say, fans don't want to hear about that, but listen. It, it matters. Yes. It, it, he is a four-core special teamer from day one, that and that, that matters. It breaks ties. If you have two guys that are right. great the same, they're, they're gonna go with, uh, teams are going to go with the guy that plays special teams. It's just that, that's how it goes. Broncos pick is in at 67, yeah. Dane. Drew Sanders, linebacker from Arkansas, somebody that – I mean, I think it was one of the top 25, 30 players on your board, and Denver gets him here at 67. My top available player at 28 overall. Um, yeah, he's surprised with all the tools that he offers that he would fall this far. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was a far fi five-star guy coming out of high school. Uh, at, went to Alabama, used him as an edge rusher. He wanted yeah. to get more snaps, transfers to Arkansas. They play him as a mic, but also mix in some pass rush snaps. Uh, and, you know, he is a... He's a fun player because all the different ways he can affect the game. Rushing, he can drop and yeah. make plays. And then, okay, so my favorite, or maybe the, one of the most unique compliments I've gotten of the Beast. Uh, you guys know Justice Mosqueda. Uh, you know, yeah, we sure do. Yeah, we you, do. You know him very well. Yeah. Um, you know, friend, friend of the show. Yeah, and is. Uh, good, good follow on Twitter. Yes. He sent me a message. He had no idea... He coached Drew Sanders at in, in middle school until he read the guy, the draft guide. He had no idea. It also tells you a lot about justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, buddy. I, I mean, just, that is the most unique compliment I've ever gotten. That's uh, awesome. That, I was like, that's so cool. That is yes. so awesome to hear. Uh, but because he grew up uh, in, in Oregon, Drew Sanders did yeah. before his, his dad is a high school coach, uh, moved to Texas. Uh, he was a quarterback, defensive end, going up through uh, through high school in Texas. So. I'm surprised he fell this far, but yeah. love the value for the Broncos. And, they signed Alex yeah. Singleton in free agency this year, but mm -hmm. Josie Jewell is going to be a free agent mm -hmm. after yep. this season. So, I mean, again, Josie Jewell, previous regime, you got yeah. a new coaching staff in there. Anything seems like it's on the table. Yeah, especially with their defense was that in, uh, that inside linebacker spot was always kind of, oh, that was a long, little, yep. like, okay, maybe yep. this isn't their best spot right here, but Sanders makes sense. I, like, where he popped for me was him as a pass rusher. Uh, the times yeah. I asked him blitz or even when he lined up on the edge. That's who their defensive coordinator is now. Right. It's Vance Joseph. Right. <laughs> He's exactly. going to have He's his opportunities. No, <laughs> and, and that's where I actually, it's like that blitzing ability or pass rush ability that can be used as that you can weaponize it yeah um, it's nice when a guy can cover uh, pretty good against a run but also that blitzing ability it is a skill everyone just expects all these guys it's like oh they're all the same as blitzers like some guys are just better at it that, that's why like Brian Branch as a, yeah. as, a, as a slot guy watching him blitz and then watching another team use a slot blitz it's like two two yeah. worlds of differences and same thing with Drew Sanders and that's why he kind of he popped for me initially and then of course just you could see the athletic traits with him why the fall, do you think, compared to what we might have expected? Um, that's a good question. I think that maybe understanding where he's going to play, you know, is he a true Mike or is he a true edge? Is he, you know, there's some position confusion, confusion there a little bit. Uh, one thing that I didn't love about Drew Sanders was the take on. Um, yeah. He is a player that needs to learn how to use his hands. Uh, use that stiff punch, keep blockers away from him, and then flow to the football. Uh, you know, seeing through blockers and staying in, in concert with the classic run and hit guy. He like, is. Yeah, he is. Like run, he, that's what he prefers. Anyways. Right. Yeah. So I think the take on stuff I did not love, yeah. and that that did bother me a little bit with yep. him. But again, with the traits, I, I thought that would you know yeah. entice a team earlier than this. Yeah, I I'm, I'm pretty surprised. Like this is the to me it was I thought it was clear cut. He was. The best linebacker in this class. I really did. I did like Jack Campbell, but I just thought he was a tier above. And so that's what's interesting to me. So it's interesting to hear that because that he's a run and hit athletic guy. So mm -hmm. that that always is going to be the detriment. It's like, oh, that guard swallowed him up. It's like, yeah, but you watch all the other stuff he can do. It's he, he went good. 47 picks after Jack Campbell. And so, he, no, more than that. Yeah. Uh, oh, it, I, we'll never Let's see you do the math. Right? <laughs> I thought Jack Campbell was 20. It was 18. Right? 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. never know, but it just it would be fascinating to know where Jack Campbell would have went if he didn't go 18. I'm very like, curious. You know, if, if let's just say the Lions didn't like him, and so the Lions would not have drafted him in the second round either. If he doesn't go 18 and the Lions don't draft him, where does Jack Campbell go? If you told me these two guys flipped where their spots were drafted, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. 18 and, uh, and, eight. and that, that would sound more right yeah. to me going into this weekend than what, what happened. Speaking yeah. of the Lions, their pick is in. 68. 68 here, so we're going to wait and see what this is. They trade up for this? That's what I was going to look. I think so. Denver was on the clock, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Or no, uh, so Denver... Oh, they traded back, back. because because yeah. De yeah, Denver yeah, traded yeah, yeah, up yeah. to go get uh, to go get Marvin Mims, yeah. the receiver. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. Yep. because Denver had back to back picks here. Yep, correct. Mr. Purple Popcorn, Marvin yep. Mims. Like five people are going to get that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went over my head. So. We have four picks into the third this is why round I'm hot. here. <laughs> that, that's that's. 
This is the Lions only pick in the third round. You know, they had a few, obviously, in the second round. Okay. All right. Oh. Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Right on it. I'm on Ross St. Brown. Look at him. Hmm. Dapper. Should have had Jared Goff announce this pick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, he gave, a, he gave a little look there. And there it is. Yeah. Uh huh. 68th overall. The Lions go with Hendon Hooker again. Had was mocked to them at times at 18. Yep. Yeah. Because we thought that they might be in the market for a quarterback of the future. They get one, but they get it in the third round. Yeah, and surprise, he's only two years younger than Jared Goff, <laughs> uh, surprisingly. And I'm half That's joking. not a joke. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean, coming off the ACL yeah. it, with that age, coming from that offense, it's just you have to figure out the timeline with Hendon Hooker. Yep. When do you realistically see him getting on the field? And with the Lions. They don't really have to force it. You know, Jared Goff is in the mix for at least one more year, you think probably two years. Yep. Uh, Hendon Hooker is, you know, he, he's a tough, smart, competitive guy. And what he did this past year uh, in that Tennessee offense, I mean, defense is just, you didn't want to, you don't want to try no. and stop it because the way they would spread you out and then Hendon Hooker will take advantage of it because mm -hmm. he knows where to go with the, the football. Um, I, you know, I, I get it. I, he has starting potential, so fully on board with him being drafted here in day two. Uh, but you know, again, it's it's with timeline. Where do you feel like it is? Yeah, because you do have to go back to the Virginia Tech tape yep. to fully understand uh, him as a pro and, prospect. Uh, yeah, and a, a quote unquote normal offense. Yeah, right. Yeah, not not that freaky stuff Tennessee runs. What do you think about his long term prospects as a starter in the league? I think he is his upside is as a solid starter, which is kind of funny because that's that's what Jared Goff Jared is. Goff is. Yeah. And, and also, and I was going to crack a joke about this, but this is what was going on was that, oh, if he was taking the first round, his rookie contract and everything, and he'd be like 30-some. Well, now it's a year earlier in case yeah. that does work out. But he, he's kind of – he's – he does a lot of things well, like, uh, like Dane just said. He can push the ball down the field. He throws a nice ball as yeah. well, very catchable. Um, he has enough athletic ability. He's a better athlete than Jared Goff, of course. I, I think he's like, I'd put him like above average athlete. I wouldn't put mm -hmm. good or anything, but he can get the job done as a scrambler, some design run stuff, throws a beautiful deep ball. But I think his upside is as a solid starter. And you got to look, too, is that the Lions – have like no depth at, at quarterback either. Yeah. They needed a backup in any way, shape, or form. This kind of works out a, a little bit as far as their timeline, what they needed. Th there's a level of unknown here, and I know you can say that with every quarterback evaluation, yeah. but coming from an offense where you just read half the field yeah. and everything's stretched out, like it's just very different than what you're gonna see in yes. the NFL. So there's a level of unknown here that you just, once he gets into an NFL camp and gets the playbook and gets some on-field reps, you just, what's that going to look yep. like mentally? So toughness, love it. Competitiveness, mm -hmm. love it. Smarts, love it. Uh, characters off the charts, yep. but when the, the bullets are flying and you need to make your progression reads and make yep. a decision, can he do it at a high level? There, and I think the most important thing about this, him going in the third round, it doesn't matter. Right? Yes, exactly. There's no pressure. It, it, this reminds me of last year's draft when those guys went in the third round, and as soon yeah. as you get that deep in the draft, the it's, expectations yeah, change changes. so much, the timeline changes right. so much. If it doesn't work out, eh. Desmond Malik, Ritter. Yeah. Yeah. If it works Malik out, great. Willis. Willis. Yep. Malik Willis. Malik Willis. The, the, the Titans trade, this drafted Will right. Levis today. We didn't mm -hmm. even care yep. that Malik Willis was on the roster because right. he was a third round pick last year. And then year. When we talk about Desmond Ritter, he's going to start. It's, it, these are, yes. hey, this is, this is it, truly a And nice if it works out, yep. if Desmond Ritter works out, yep. great. If Desmond Ritter doesn't work out, okay. And so I think that's the benefit of this is that that uncertainty you can accept that uncertainty when you're drafting a guy in the 60s rather than 18th overall. This, right. This makes me feel a lot better about my quarterback evaluation process, by the way. Again, <laughs> yes. just to be this whole, how everything's unfolded, I'm like, man, okay, all right, I'm not crazy. Uh, because seeing him, like, uh, as people want him to go early to first round, people are saying top 10, I was going, what, what are we doing here? It just it had to make sense. It did, it, yeah, and for my grade on him was basically a third rounder, so it actually made me feel, and there's always inflation with quarterbacks, yeah. so it actually kind of made me feel better that that's where he ended up going, because that's how I see him, is that I think the downside of him is like a high, 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 high end backup spot starter type, but he does have that potential to be that solid starter where he's a mid tier starter, which isn't the worst thing to take in the third. You round. play out this year. Yep. You see where you're at with Jared Goff. Do we want to keep him around for another year? Does Hendon Hooker surprise us a little bit? Mm -hmm. Just gives you more flexibility yep. when you draft a guy in this range. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, it makes sense. Uh, it does. It, for the Lions, you know, they were going with solid starter, solid starter, high character guys. This guy. High character, Sorry. we'll see if the solid starter part pays out in the future. Yep. All right. Texans pick is in, but before we get to that, we are going to take one more quick break.
All right, we are back. The New Orleans Saints are on the clock with the 71st pick. We've had a couple picks since then. Dane, why don't you walk us through what we've been missing here? Uh, Texans took uh, Tank Dell, uh, all 5'8", 165 <laughs> pounds of him. Uh, not, not the biggest uh, player in this oh, draft by any means, uh, but good luck covering him, right. uh, especially one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And we saw that in the, the senior bowl during practices. He was uncoverable. Uh, that short area quickness. Uh, was outstanding. He didn't even test in terms of the 40 all that great, but the short area stuff, mm -hmm. really, really impressive. He can win deep. Um, just to add another uh, another weapon in that, that Texans offense that we've been talking about. And totally different movement skills the receivers they have. And Couldn't, that is exactly what I would right. why it's interesting to me opposite. because you have a Robert Woods, yeah, you have yeah. a John Mechie, you yeah. know, guys that feel pretty safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Adding just we said the, the sugary snack. Yes, uh, no, he's he the is, sugary he snack. Is. He's literally, because he's the size of it, the cherry on top. <laughs> like that, that is what he has, Tank. Um, but no, he has the movement skills. It's, it's what you, ex when you picture a 165 pound undersized receiver, he moves like that. That's kind of the shiftiness, the in and outness. But you're going to see, I mean, again, you got to look at what the uh, Bobby Slowick, what mm -hmm. do they do in San Francisco, how they use their receivers. There's a lot of that movement stuff, whip routes, angle routes. He's going to have a package for him early on, and then we'll see what else he can do. Um, of course, you know, you know, uh, Packers are sub 195. I'm like sub 200 where I'm like, hey, he's off my board completely 190. But it is, I do appreciate the player. There is a lot of receiver to him with the movement stuff as well. I do want to say that uh, uh, what Jalen Reed uh, that the Packers took, they say he was weighing 195 today. So uh, I feel validated about that. Are you a little bit bummed? <laughs> so Tank's real name is Nathaniel. Are right. you a little bit bummed that you didn't get like a Tank type nickname as a Nathan? I, uh, it feels like a real mixed opp missed opportunity. Right? A tank, uh, well, I was slim before. Um, that, believe that. Believe it or not. I do believe that. <laughs> yeah. But still, I mean, yeah. he's not a. He's also that, slim. Right? That's actually hilarious. <laughs> Give me and him next to each other. I'm slim and he's tank. Let's right. us next yeah. right next to each other. That's perfect. But yeah, that. Uh, I yeah. I, I, I never really had a nickname, a good nickname like that. I, I don't think I ever deserved one. <laughs> you have to be good to get a nickname like tank. Right. And yeah. And I think that's. I actually love the irony of that a little bit. Yeah. He's built a little. Little pocket, pocket Hercules there, but I, I always love that the uh, you know like a, little, a big guy named Skinny, you know something like that. So with the 70th pick, Dane, the Raiders took Byron Young, defensive tackle from Alabama. Las Vegas absolutely just needs body along the interior of their defensive line. Defensive tackle might right. have been the biggest need on their entire roster coming into tonight. And again, I think most teams saw this player as a maybe a fourth rounder, but again, where we are with the defensive tackles, these guys are all getting moved up. Uh, and so Byron Young off the board. We, we weren't sure if he would be the first Byron Young drafted today. Uh, Tennessee edge rusher, <laughs> yes. also named Byron Young, uh, yeah. could, could go tonight. So yeah, 6'3", 295. Um, he showed up consistently. Uh, it feels like Alabama always has defensive linemen, right? He's kind of the guy this year where uh, the, the big bodied guy that can stop the run, but also shows a little bit of juice as a rusher when he has the opportunity. So this is a really quality player. And they need it. They need, yes. they need dudes. They need bodies. And he's, he's definitely one of those. I said defense tackle might have been their biggest need. I was still going corner after looking at it. In my mind, they had already just drafted a corner, right. but they have not they yet. Have. So it's corner's still a pretty glaring need for the Raiders, but they came in with so many needs on defense that there was no way, especially after taking Michael Mayer, that they were going to fill all of them. Yes, yeah. They need right. players, uh, and I know. I, I, I do like what they're doing on offense, but they, they definitely need players. And, they, I mean, they need linemen too as well, offensive linemen as well. So. It's interesting. It's like I feel good about a lot of it's aspects. It's almost of like they missed out on like six straight drafts and with their top 100 Funny picks. Funny how that works. Yeah, yeah right? it's, it's, we're starting to feel that a little bit. You have to pay guys? Yeah, it's a little interesting. At 71, Dane, Kendra Miller, running mm -hmm. back from TCU, goes to the Saints. Feels like they kind of needed that complimentary piece to yeah. Alvin Kamara, that second back in the mm -hmm. backfield. Do you think he provides that element to them? Yeah, he's a bigger back, yeah. but I don't. he's not necessarily a power back. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's he's a guy that talk me through that. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. He, explosive though. He but, is explosive, yeah, and but. you get him. Uh, so I was talking to somebody at TCU, and they said every day they would debate, okay, who's the fastest in the program? And one day it'd be Quentin Johnston, the next day it'd be Trey Tomlinson, the next day it's Kendra Miller. Like they all go back and forth, and you know this guy's a big guy, but he's fast. Mm -hmm. He's got wheels. Uh, and at the line of scrimmage, he does a really nice job just picking through, being patient, and then once he sees a little bit of daylight, he hits it. And I felt bad for him. He, he had that knee injury in the yeah. semifinal games against Michigan, and all leading up to uh, the, the championship game, we heard, you know, he might be a go, he might be a go. He needed surgery. Yeah, like, okay. he, he it, they, I don't know. 
I don't know what TCU is doing. He <laughs> needed surgery uh, once he entered the draft process, yeah. and so we don't have any testing information yeah. on him. But the tape is outstanding, um, and even and you always wonder when you know, the Big Twelve and running backs, and am I really am, what I'm seeing? Is that really what he's going to give me in the NFL or not? But um, I, I think he's he's a young player. He's got speed. He's got explosiveness, yep. and I think he knows what he's doing at the line of scrimmage in terms of his decision making, reading blocks, and understanding uh, just the anticipating where those holes are going to come from. So yep. I'm I'm very encouraged by Kendra Miller. As yep. we get here to pick 75 or so, Dane, why don't you reset us with your best available? Okay, so let's look at it. Uh, top 300 here. Darnell Washington's still there. Uh, Jalen Hyatt, the w receiver from Tennessee. Keely Ringo, Georgia Corner. Trenton Simpson, the linebacker from Clemson. Josh Downs, slot receiver, North Carolina. Uh, Tyler Scott, Cincinnati wide receiver. Uh, Tucker Kraft, South Dakota State tight end. Clark Phillips, a nickel uh, corner from Utah. And then Cedric Tillman, Tennessee wide receiver, yeah. still out there. A little surprising he's uh, still around. He's you know, that bigger receiver that a lot of teams look at. Um, and then our most latest, our latest pick here, Arizona, taking Garrett Williams, corner from Syracuse, who, if not for his ACL injury back in October, I think we would have been talking about him much earlier tonight. He would have gone top 40, top 50, yep. uh, but a little bit of a discount sticker on him. We just talked about it with Kendra Miller. Garrett Williams coming off that ACL injury. He's a guy that I love his footwork and coverage. Yep. He has some speed to him. Not the biggest guy. Love his ball skills, ball skills though. He what... finds the football. So uh, th this is, uh, you know, for the Cardinals, who are, they, they can afford to wait on somebody they like this. They certainly can. It, it type of guy you would invest in. And, yep. and if you don't get on the, on the field until Thanksgiving, so be it. And that's fine. Uh, Garrett, Garrett Williams is a nice pick. He was the first corner I watched in this process because okay. it was before he got hurt. Yeah. And, and, and ball skills, that's, that's what popped for me. And I think even just production on the ball skills, but he has that hand-eye coordination, a little bit of springs to him. Mm -hmm. like he can get high point stuff as well. Um, yeah, but they can – you're getting – I hate using this term, but I'm going to. You get a little bit of value with it because he should, like Dane said, should have gone higher, and the Cardinals can do this. This is a luxury pick for them in a weird way as they're rebuilding. Yeah, I thought maybe fourth round. Like, you know, where, where do you draft the player come out, coming off the ACL? Because even though, even with modern medicine, you just every it's, knee's different with yeah, the way they bounce they back. They feel good in nine months, but really, it's it's a year. But and I a half. think for a team that it doesn't matter if he oh, plays this it. year, that's what you have to be thinking about it. I mean, right. The Cardinals have an extra first next year, maybe an extra third next year. Mm -hmm. I think maybe a couple extra thirds next year with the trades yep. down that they've made. So they're clearly being pretty patient. Here we go, Dane. Seventy third pick. The New York Giants trade up. Mm. to go get Jalen Hyatt, wide receiver from Tennessee. Pass catcher seemed like, even with some of the guys they'd added, yeah. one more kind of explosive piece within that offense, and they get that guy in Jalen Hyatt. The Giants said enough was enough. Like, let's okay. The, the fall is, uh, they fell through the second round, yeah. okay. Let, let's stop the fall here. This is too talented of a player to be falling any further. Uh, six foot, 176 pounds, big time speed. Uh, and that's what he does best, vertical speed, ball tracking. Again, yes, he is a little bit limited in what you want receivers to be, but when you can do those two things at a high level, that's useful. Yes. That is someone that can help your help your offense in a big way because defense have to account for that. Yep. And so, and it's not just that he's a, a, a decoy or anything like that, but he can win over the top. And you know, the, think about that that uh, Giants offense with those receivers. Like, you know, Darius Slayton was yep. kind of in that role. Jalen Hyatt's a better version of that. Yep. And so, you know, I. They went and got their guy. I, I like the move here. Even, even though there is some sameness because you best operating from the slot, he is a totally different type of style than what yeah. they have right now. Yep. They have a ton of underneath crafty guys. Yes, they do. That's what they're built out of. So this is the juice. This is taking the top off. When we watched that Giants offense and we really liked it, it wasn't because they were hitting these huge plays down the field. It was all these short intermediate gains. This changes the whole math of everything, opens up so much more space for everybody else. Just think about it on the bodies there. Isaiah Hodgins came on late last year. He's yep. a bigger body type guy. Wondell Robinson now in yes. year two. They still have Darius Slayton. Now they have Jalen Hyatt. Darren Waller is there. I mean, right. they are going to have some pass catchers. And I, I love what you said, Dane, about, you know, even if there are some questions and some deficiencies and some projection issues because that offense right. of Tennessee – at 18, those are like very real questions. Yes, at 21 yes. for the Chargers, but at 73, yes. those questions start mattering much, much less. 
and I know you're talking to Dane, but he, <laughs> oh, here we go. But uh, I, I will say it was that when I talked about Hyatt, I was a little lower on him than others. I, I was like, you, this type of guy, you take more in the late second, early third. And he went, I'm way comfortable like taking him here. Like you're saying, it's not as big as question marks when it's at 18 or this. So that's where, this is where I, now I love the Hyatt pick. If yeah. It was a round earlier. Okay, a round earlier. But that's earlier, totally that, fine. Totally like, great. That, but, that context is hugely yes, important when yes. we consider what types of players these are. And what are. he can bring to the table. I mean, he, he has, he's going to have a role no matter what team he's ever on. He's going to have a role, and there's more to him. As we all expected, the yeah. Tennessee receiver yes. run has now begun. <laughs> yeah. At 74, the Browns, welcome to the draft. Take T Cedric Tillman, Jalen Hyatt's teammate, wide receiver from Tennessee. I really like this. Yeah, so do I. I mean, 6'3", 215. Um, you know, he's a big body player. And you go back to the 2021 tape when he was fully healthy, and you see a guy with double-digit touchdowns, yep. uh, can win down the field, uh, but also can has the size to win at every level of yep. the field because he can overmatch corners. He's strong. He's physical. Um, I don't think the Browns thought he'd be here at no. this point in the draft. Uh, but, you know, here he is. We thought somewhere at 50 to 75. And here we're, he's at the low end of that. Yep. And really, you think about that Browns receiving core. And, I mean, Amari Cooper, that, that you know, in two years, that cap's pretty high. There's no more dead money. Uh, you think about I mean, Peoples Jones. Are they going to be able to or extend him at some point yeah. here coming up? You think about uh, Elijah Moore now. Yeah, Elijah Moore. But you know, he's he's, he's a little bit of a question mark. I mean, yeah. the Jets almost gave him away. Yeah. And I mean, David Bell was a third rounder last year, but you know, he's a slow slot yes. receiver, route runner. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a, plenty of questions at receiver for the Browns that if the value is there, it made sense for them. And uh, with uh, Cedric Tillman at this point, yeah, it makes sense. I, I, I really like his fit there is that uh, Mari Cooper, when I, especially when I was w with him in Oakland, was that we typecast him as an X. And it turned out his best role was as a move Z or even mm -hmm. a slot, especially when he goes to the Cowboys. He was a revelation there. And yeah. it was like, oh, wow, look at him in motion, get him vertical. Vertical, vertical, vertical. And what is Deshaun Watson really good at throwing is vertical routes. And Cedric Tillman is your traditional X. He's your traditional outside big vertical receiver. Good blocker as well, too. So I'm, Bill Callahan's going to be very happy. Hmm. But it fits perfectly for, I mean, you could always use an X, but as, as far as Amari Cooper, as far as Elijah Moore, Donovan Peoples Jones. Really nice kind of mishmash of talent there and type of types of players and types of receivers. I think Donovan Peoples Jones is one of those. Oh, we got him in the sixth round. He's been a good story. Yep. They yep. like him in the building, yes. but now he's your fourth receiver. Exactly. Right. You know, he's and nice. then now yeah. you Tillman has that pure X with that Z Amari Cooper, and then you play Elijah Moore in yep. the slot. If you want to play more outside, because you can, you move Cooper into yeah, the slot. In There's a lot of different options that they have there with that receiver. It's going to be a vertical offense. It's going to be a run and play action offense, and it's great for that. It's like, yeah, this is a good landing spot for him. I was very high on. Tillman because it's the type of player I really like traditionally but also it sure just, is buddy yeah I know the, yeah what? I watched that tape and I was like oh, there's my guy <laughs> I don't care about Hyatt catching another 50-yard touchdown there's my guy right there oh look at that eight-yard gain <laughs> bodying that guy up but I, I yeah I, I just like this fit I really do I didn't think about the Browns as being a team for him but now kind of looking at it, it's like yeah that that makes a lot of sense if the value is there yeah, I think it makes sense yeah. and I mean the best part of it Cedric Tillman doesn't have to get rid of all that orange you know, they, they <laughs> right. had in Knoxville. Uh, just keep wearing it, man. But he's a little good. older. I'm actually shocked. Well, I, I think this is a draft where the Browns, I, and I, I've, I've done a lot of Browns media, yeah. and I kind of telling people, you got to compromise a little bit. Yes. Because in this draft, there's a lot of older players, and when you don't pick until, what, 74? Yeah. You have to compromise. There, there's just no way around it. And yeah. so they have another pick coming up here in the third round. Wouldn't be surprised if it's a someone that's 23 years old because, you know, in that's order to getting. get talented players, sometimes you have to give on something. Yep. And I think age is one of those things where ideally you're getting a 21-year-old, but you know what? Here in a, at this point in the draft, yeah. it's, it's not as you're big betting a deal. On, you're betting on, like, one trait that you really like. Yeah. And it's like, if the rest makes sense, okay, we're fine. That's what you're really going for right now. Browns drafting a receiver. You think, oh, they really need another receiver. You know, they already have Amari Cooper. There's a lot of bodies. They already there. have Elijah Moore. They have 14 guys on the roster, right? It's, what's the Browns' biggest need right now? Uh, to your D line. Yeah. They signed Dalvin Tomlinson in yeah. free agency. Yep. They went and got Okoronkwo to be their, yeah, one good. of their other pass rushers. Right. Secondary is in really good shape. They got linebackers. Anthony yeah, Walker, they, they got JOK. Right. Offensive line's in very good yes. shape. They brought back Pochic. Obviously, have plenty of Joker, uh, run, still running back is fine. They have I, a Joku. I'm surprised they didn't go maybe with the Northwestern defensive tackle. I thought that interior. They still need more bodies there. They, they do, yes. But it is, there's no area on that roster where you're like, man, they really yeah, yeah. need somebody there. Yeah. And I, I say that because I, I haven't really unleashed this yet. I think the Browns are in like pretty good shape top to bottom. Obviously, yeah. a huge question. 
about what they're going to get out of their quarterback after the way that he yeah. played last year. But every other aspect of this roster, yeah. they're doing pretty well for themselves, top to bottom. Yeah. As much as we all love Nick Chubb, though, moving forward, this is going to be a much more passing offense. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, and I think adding a Cedric Tillman helps you get there and achieve that. Yeah. And maybe do, is there a pass catching running back somewhere along the way? Do right. I feel like that element of their offense, which they haven't yeah. really needed to lead into recently, they lose Kareem Hunt. Is that something they're going to be looking at? They like at? the kid from Cincinnati that drafted yeah, last Yeah, Jerome Ford. Right. Oh, that's right, Jerome Ford. <laughs> but yeah. he's still an unknown variable yeah. at this point. And he's so. a, he, God, he's like a, almost like a home run hitter type as mm -hmm. opposed to maybe, uh, yeah. he's okay hands, but he's not like a route runner. He's just like, you run screens for yeah. him a little bit. With the 75th pick here, Dane, the Atlanta Falcons take Zach Harrison, defensive end from Ohio State. Yeah, I think it was right around the range we thought he'd mm -hmm. go. I mean, a freak, 6'5", 275, one of the longest players in this draft. It's, and it's hilarious. We were robbed of him running a 40-yard dash <laughs> because he had, I think it was a hamstring. Um, but he would have ran, uh, I would put the over-under at 4 5 two. Okay. Uh, I mean, he might have gotten in the four fours. Two? He was a five-star guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, That's how I'll stay, you assume. But yes. anyways, but I remember him specifically. He, he is a guy that just, he, he he's how you build him, except he's, he's so long that he's, he is stiff. He can't bend. Uh, but still, there were times where if his arms were 34 inches and not 36 inches, he's not forcing that fumble. Yeah. And so he would create some, some uh, disruption because length. of that length. He, yeah. he really would. And they used him more inside this year too, which yep. is nice. They'd kick him inside and uh, you know let him get that quickness off the ball yeah. and really disrupt things, muddy the pocket. And, and if he's not making a play, he's at least forcing the quarterback to uh, come up with plan B and that's allowing other players. I, I, to believe, I, I wish I had it written down, but I believe he got his hands on a lot of balls too. Didn't yeah. he, was he like a PBU kind of monster Ooh. using those long arms a little bit? Like, yeah, like, not as, I mean, I. I, with that length, I think he wanted more. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's he, how he I could remember him. Yeah. God, Ohio State had like three guys with 36 inch arms, the two offensive linemen. Yep. And a, a 36 DeJuan, is ridiculous. And Dewan Jones still out there, hasn't been drafted yet. And By the way, three of them. The saintification of the Atlanta Falcons defensive front is in full effect. Exactly. Yes. That's a great point. 6 8 great. Calais Campbell, they go get David Onyemata, and now, I mean, 6'5", 275, just pencil him in for what that push, Saints push, defense push. has looked like over the last few years. Right. Yep. And it is a departure from the types of guys they were looking for last year. And That was one of the more, when they hired Ryan Nielsen to be their defensive coordinator, and we were thinking about the types of bodies we've seen in New Orleans up front over the last few years, and you contrast that with what they were trying to do under Dean Pease and going to get Arnold Epichetti, it's like, it seems like a pretty drastic shift. And the company line was, ah, oh, it's not as big of a deal as you think it is. You know, it's gonna, it will, it's more, it's subtler, will be multiple. Everything that they have done this off season has indicated that that is not the case. Yeah, <laughs> right. They needed some new body types up there. The <laughs> most recent pick I'm really interested in, uh, Marte Mapu, the, yeah. the linebacker safety from Sacramento State going to the Patriots. I mean, you think about Kyle Duggar and what he is for that defense. Where, where does Mapu fit? He's a little bit of a tweener, um, but man, I was so impressed with him. This is our first non-combi guy drafted, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, he, he, he was in my top 100. He's a guy I thought based off of how he played at the NFLPA Collegiate Bowl, then at the Senior Bowl, mm -hmm. and then unfortunately tore his pec. So we have, he wasn't able to work out the pro day, and like I said, he wasn't a combine guy. But, man, he is a quick reaction player that makes plays. Um, it doesn't matter if he's covering a tight end, if yeah. he's moving against a run. He is a really nice player. So I, interesting fit with the, with the Patriots with this player. Well, and th they love that interchange, interchangeability. The tweeners with these is a bad the tweeners, word there. They love yeah. it. Um, yeah. They go dying, but then you look at the safeties that are in there, they're 230. And, two, and it's like the other teams have a guy that's a linebacker at 215. It's like, okay. Well, these guys are all the same type, aren't they? Like, we can just call them box or slot, which is a thought that I'm going to continue out through, throughout the summer. Uh, but honestly, this that makes a lot of sense for the type of guy he is, especially that tweener. You, you said that he's just a, a ball player or a ball hawk or near it yeah. and always reading the play, right? That sounds like a Patriots guy, especially at that kind of spot. Yeah. 77, Dane, the Los Angeles Rams take Byron Young, another Tennessee player. The other Byron Young. Edge yeah. from Tennessee coming off the board at 77. This is just a, a fast, he's got a fastball and it's just <laughs> explosiveness off the edge. Uh, you got to hide him a little bit against the, in the run game uh, because if, if uh, you know, teams will run at him and find some success, but uh, <laughs> when you can let him pin his ears back, put him as a wide nine, let him use that explosiveness, get after it. Well, it was one of the best backstories. I mean, he was, he was a, a manager at Dollar General, saw a flyer for a tryout. Okay, let's, let's try this. Goes out and goes the JUCO route, goes to Tennessee. Um, oh, uh oh, what do we have here? 
We had the Packers taking another tight end. Oh, I love this. Oh, I love this. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the show. Oh, Tucker Craft. <laughs> this is great. 78, the Packers take Tucker Craft. Oh, one of the stats, phenomenal. one of my favorite stats as we were preparing for this show, I believe that the Packers, every tight end on their roster coming into the draft, their total receiving yards for their career, 432, which would have ranked 26th among all tight ends for the 2022 season. They didn't just need one tight end. No. They, they probably didn't. needed multiple tight ends. Yeah. And they get multiple tight ends. Luke they, Musgrave and Tucker Craft going right. to Green Bay. They did this a couple years ago, right? With DeGuara and... Yeah, they double dipped. Uh, yeah, the other, uh, the, uh, the, was, who was the other one? Jay Sternberger? That was the year before. That was the year before, yeah. yeah. Uh, was with it? the Virginia Tech kid? I can't remember. No, I don't talking about that. Yeah, I they mean, double dipped. And they did it in the, in, on day two. And both these guys were top 50 picks for me. With Luke Musgrave, Tucker yeah. Craft. Tucker Craft one of my favorite players in this draft. He, if he, again, if he didn't get hurt in that opener, South Dakota State beats Iowa in, in that opener. He, he was meant that much to that offense. Um, he's, he's a playmaker, a guy that uh, is a good athlete for that size. Yep. Can go make plays, um, and he's when you're designing bubble screens for your tight end. I mean, it t- kind of tells you what type of, type of weapon they know they have. As a blocker, he's ascending. He's getting yes. better and better. So yeah, a big fan of uh, of his. And I mean, criminally lasting this long. I know. I'm pretty fired up about this. What type of player are the Packers getting in Tucker Craft? They are getting, uh, like Dane just said right there, they are getting a guy that's a good athlete, a fluid mover. Uh, for his size, he is balanced. He has his feet there. Uh, he stays on his feet. And so when he's as a receiver, has the ball in his hands, whether it's broken plays or plays down the field, you see him on the move here. This is how uh, uh, South Dakota State, by the way, really enjoyed South Dakota State's offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, really like their, whatever their coach was doing. He's a young guy. I got to look up his name because I really like what he's doing. But Tucker Craft here as a tight end, they used him as more of an off-ball tight end, as an F, as a wing. But what Dane and I agree with this is that he has upside as a Y in line. It's, it's like him and Musgrave are kind of cut from the same cloth in this way. But... This is better from the end zone view, but you can see him breaking about 20 tackles over here. This is the kid that hit puberty early playing Pee Wee football. <laughs> that is what he looked like at the FCS level. And it's like when you're taking a guy from the FCS level, that's what you want to see, especially at a position like this. Best athlete on the field type. But you're going to see a pull getting our way here. But how many tackles he missed, the fluidity. I mean, he just makes a guy miss right there. He's juking a guy that, you know, is half his size. Making one guy miss, two guys miss. He's bouncing off that tackle. Third guy missed, like, or that guy brings him down. This but. was his first game back yes, from his injury. From the injury. ankle injury. Yeah. Yes, and that's where I became a bigger fan of Tucker Craft as he came back more from the injury, and then as they used him more in line as the season went on with the FCS playoffs, that's when I was like, oh, I think it was Montana State where I was just, I looked at him and was like, oh, okay, you can yeah. do this. Like, you, right. you're doing this. Of course, I didn't have the film from that game, so I'm sorry, I, I can't pull it. But again, this is just a, another broken play, and you're going to see him as the biggest kid. I'll go from the end zone view here. This is a touchdown again against North Dakota getting the ball, and he looks like the elephant in the safari with all the lions jumping on him trying to bring him down, <laughs> and no one brings him down. Like, this is just what his film looks like over and over again. He's an ascending player. On third down, they're designing blocks, crossing routes, like crossing screen routes for him on mm-hmm. third long. So they're running this for him, and he's moving faster than everybody. And again, you just see that fluid movement. Yeah. You don't see that in guys that size. No. And it's a legit 6'5", 255, and just getting better. Um, I I love this pick for the Packers. I love this pick. I love the Luke Musgrave pick. They're both cut from the same cloth where they move different. They have upside as a three-down tight end. The fact that they got both of them. And, yeah, they're both gambles, and you hope they stay healthy. Uh, But, man, these are two guys that have huge upside at the position. They've completely remade their receiving options. Oh, my God. God. Yeah, this is fantastic. And and he was a a running back. He played nine-man football growing up in South Dakota. Play running Timber back. Lake, yep, was it? Exactly. Yes. Yep. He, and, and he playing running back. Yeah, exactly. Playing running back, nine-man football, and he goes to South Dakota State, ter- becomes his tight end. All you need to know about Tucker Craft and how good he was, Alabama came knocking. Yep. He, he turned down six-figure NIL deals uh, to go transfer to the SEC to stay with his guys at South Dakota State. And, you know, I, it says a lot about him. Yep. Uh, it says a lot about his talent. And, I, I mean, I think the Packers, I don't think they came into today thinking, all right, we're going to draft two tight ends. No. But it worked out that way when Musgrave was there in the second and now Kraft here in the third. Sometimes you can't pass on guys. Right. And so it's maybe seem a little repetitive, but they're going to find ways to use both these It's guys. a position to be repetitive at. you got to take sure. chances at tight ends. If you play 12 personnel, like Josiah yeah. DeGuara shouldn't prevent you from drafting nope, Tucker Kraft if you Absolutely like Tucker Kraft. And like you said, you had him more, like – 50-ish, top 50-ish. Yes. Like, and I, view him, I had a 
easily an early second round grade on him. And I was actually borderline giving him like a late first. Yeah. Like I like this guy so, so much. And like you said, it's like they didn't expect to go in and, and, and to picking two tight ends. They were hoping maybe to get one pass catcher, hopefully two. But the fact that I'm sure when Musgrave came up, they're like, okay, yeah, let's take a chance. And I'm sure, let's do it. I'm sure they had at least a second round grade on Tucker Craft, and I'm sure they're like, yeah, this is great. Now they got both of them. And let, let's give respect to South Dakota State uh, tight end. You, yeah, yes. since 1976, they've had three players drafted top 100. All three tight ends, <laughs> Steve Hyden. Uh, Dallas Goddard and now Tucker Craft. You awesome. love, love to see it. And I really like the other guy they have. I don't even know his name. Number 87. Yep. I, the running back is yes. the one to watch for next year. Yep. South Dakota uh, State's got some stuff cooking. Yeah, if you watch FCS, their offense is a lot of fun. Yeah. They're play calling too. Speaking of complimentary pass catching options here, Josh Downs from North Carolina goes to the Colts at 79. We oh, got wow. Michael Pittman there. We got yeah. Alan Pierce there, big, big bodies. Now, Josh Downs, potentially a slot option for them. Ooh, that's, that's you great. see that Anthony Richardson, the Josh Downs? Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, that Downs is a guy that he's... Perfect fit. He's where he needs to be yes. when he needs to be. And that's such a that. such a safety valve type of player for your quarterback. Yep. And just that, uh, uh, you know, warm blanket that, yep. you know, you feel better about when he's out there. He's going to go... You no know, surprises with him. He's not going to let you down. He... His drop rate, it, it's just amazing to see how it fell, or it, it went from all these drops as a freshman, a little bit better as a sophomore, and he didn't drop the ball this year. Uh, and he was such Shows a big- that it works, because that means yes. he's on the jugs machine. Yeah. 100%, yeah. and he's small, there's no way around that. Yep. He's a slot only player, that's just what he is. That's okay, because mm -hmm. I think that you know, he does what, what he does, he does it really well at a high level, and so, you know, Smith and Jigba, we talked about him as maybe a slot only. He's got size, a little bit more to Smith and Jigba. Downs, a little more limited in what he can give you, but I love his fit with this offense. The stat I came across, and this was from SIS, uh, uh, they had unique routes and how many different types of routes he gets tagged, and no one ran more unique routes than Josh Downs last year in FBS. And that is, it's, again, I'm going to always kind of ding a slot only type of guy, and he truly is a slot only type of guy. I don't see, I, I think, Jackson Smith and Jigba can you know give you a handful of snaps outside, but truly with downs he's slot only. But the thing is he's really good at it. Yeah. And I was worried that he would go to a place where it's like okay they might expect him outside. No, not with the Colts. No. They got big, big, big bodies everywhere. This is the perfect place to kind of get that different type of body type mm. for your pass catcher. He's quicker than fast too. Yes. He, he ran a four four eight forty. You know he doesn't have that blazing speed, but you talk about gear change. Yep. And his three cone was outstanding. You know, the Contested shorter catch quickness. guy for somebody that small yep. too, right? Right, yeah. exactly. And, and, and gets north. Like he does a lot of things well. He's a yes. he's he's. Uh, it's, there's a lot to like with Josh Downs. There really is. Interesting that the Colts, you know, three picks off the board. Obviously, go get Richardson in the first round. But as we get into second and third, I think offensive line maybe something they wanted to address after yeah. what happened last year. But no, they go corner and receiver with their next two picks, Anthony Richardson. And now you have those two big body guys. You get Josh Downs in the best case scenario. You've got some pass catchers for your young quarterback. Yes. Again, trying to build that infrastructure as much and as quickly as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, when you have, now you have the Z, X, that's Pittman, that's Alec Pierce. Right. And then now you got Josh Downs' slot. And then you have two jumbo, jumbo tight ends hmm. as well. Um, yeah, and uh, Kylan uh, uh, Granson from SMU from a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, they yep. still like him. Yeah, they still like him. And then Ogletree, who they drafted yes, from YSU Ogletree. last year, was no, hurt. So. It's a fun group of weapons. It, it really is. A lot of intriguing guys, a lot of guys that are useful in different ways. So it's it's a nice little kind of group of targets Anthony Richardson is going to throw to. So just to kind of reset the best available, Darnell Washington okay. still out there. Uh, tight end Georgia, Keely Ringo, Georgia corner, Trenton Simpson, the Clemson linebacker. Uh, now that Josh Downs is off the board, the top receiver available, Tyler Scott, Cincinnati, yeah. Clark Phillips, Utah still out there. It was just another one of those, just a darn good player. You know, the, the size worries you, the lack of speed that worries you. Uh, Dwan Jones is still out there too, who, yeah. look, I really like this tape, and then you start to dig more in, you're like, uh, back off a little bit. And I think teams kind of felt the same, same way. way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dayon Henley, the linebacker from Washington State, I'm a little surprised is still out there. Uh, so there's there's Adebawari from Northwestern. I, I thought for sure somebody was going to jump Same. at that testing, even though on tape, fourth, fifth round pick. But what do you do with a guy that has fourth, fifth round tape, but tests like a top five overall player? Like you know, it, the third. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I, ta I was talking to a scout who went to the Northwestern Pro Day. He said that the conversations there among the scouts were, okay, who's going to be drafted first? Was it going to be... I'd worry the defensive tackle or the corner, Cameron Mitchell. And Mitchell's not a guy that's getting a lot of pub, but I mean, he's a name we couldn't hear come off the board here tonight. 
Well, and then also, okay. like, uh, you're, you're looking at the, some of those positions, like Dewan Jones, like, even with the tackle run that happened, it was like, well, someone will take a chance because there's just not that many tackles. Right. Like, he was kind of the the next tier of guys. And, yes, right tackle only, most likely. Kind of that, uh, uh, oh, my God, Phil Overholt. Uh, what was the guy with the bike? Phil yeah. Oldholt. Yes, 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 yes. Oklahoma. Yes, you know? and just that oversized right tackle, you know, that's always going to have the size and, the, and maybe the weight issues, like, you don't really want them on the backside cutting off guys, but you want to run behind them. Yeah. And I feel like there was going to be maybe one or two teams that like that and they're fine with the size and maybe not the, the flightest of feet or the lightest of feet. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting that he's still around. We have the Titans here now on the clock at 81. Let me see. Let me see. I'm trying to see any other picks we that we oh, DJ Johnson. To, yeah, it seems like we are. DJ oh, Johnson. To Carolina. 80th overall edge rusher from Oregon, Dan. Wow. I mean, freaky guy. Uh, good sized player, but has speed off the edge. Uh, older player. He was a uh, in, really interesting journey. He was a tight end at Miami, transfers to Oregon, try him at tight end, then they moved him to full time to defense, and kind of really found his way this year. Um, you see a guy with speed, does a nice job against the run. Um, a little bit older, so I think he was off some boards. Like he wasn't a, a great fit. You know, we don't really want those 24-year-old guys with upside, uh, <laughs> unless you're the Jets and draft with McDonald 15th overall. Uh, but here we are, uh, DJ Johnson. Or you Johnson know, last year. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but DJ Johnson, I, you know, he was a a guy that you know was on the freaks list. He he has that type of ability. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I understand the pick for sure. And they needed some edge rushers. I mean, outside of Brian right. Burns, Eter Gross Matos is the guy they took in the second round. Hasn't but out. He's going to be free agent after this year. He yep. hasn't panned out. And you think about the way that those Broncos teams, that Broncos team last year was built with the Giro Evero. I mean, they had banshees. Yep. They had so yep. many guys that they could rush the passer with to the point where they could trade Bradley Chubb, I think, pretty comfortably, yeah. right. trying to rebuild that sort of idea a little Can bit Johnson here in Carolina. Can drop it all, like in coverage-wise or anything like that? Uh, and, and maybe play on his feet a little. But, yeah. I mean, I think most part you want him. Going for it. Yeah, going for it. Okay. And, and he can set a hard edge. He's got length okay. to him. Um, because but. just the, the, yeah, the Everett's defense as well as all the simulated pressures, they like the guys to drop out. They kind of yeah. like those kind of hybrid guys. So I was just curious about that. Interesting. Oh. Sitting here at 81, the Tennessee Titans go with Tajay Spears running back from Tulane. Chris Ray will probably love that film. It was, oh, yeah. yeah I, I, just, I mean, he was a top awful. 75 player on my board. He's I mean, fun. Yeah, 73. Um, I, I, the big question was the knees. Yes. The, some teams were, okay, check, knees are okay, thumbs up. <laughs> Other teams were not. I mean, he is a fun, fun player. His ability it's, to it's cut. Fun. So it was like, he is kind of what I think some people wanted James Cook to be. Uh, okay. Last year, yeah, uh, yeah. as a runner, you yeah, know, yeah. like you know, we knew what James Cook could do as a pass catcher, but as a runner, is a little like you know, you like the idea of it, but wasn't always there. With Tajay Spears, I think it gives you that because yeah. he is so quick. Uh, his knees are just it's so bendy, yeah. you know, like the flexibility <laughs> to be able to <laughs> stop, cut, go. Um, it, Spears is awesome. If the, if the medicals were clean, you feel we feel great about Spears in this range. And it, it's it, my comparison for him more just because he plays with a reckless style and that that and. I mean this as a compliment, was Devontae Freeman. It's not a one-to-one -one mm. comparison, but more that slightly undersized back, but plays like they act like they're 30 pounds bigger and they don't care. Right. Like they're, they're just, every run, every time they touch the ball, is they act like it's a Super Bowl. Uh, you, you'll see Spears lead blocking for his teammates and bringing it. Yeah. I, I have a clip where he... And he's 200 he's, pounds. Yeah, and he's pancaking a linebacker yeah. at 230 or 230, uh, someone that weighs 30 pounds heavier than him. Um, just a, a really fun player. I understand why the Titans like him. That's why I was like, Vrabel probably loved his tape because it's like, he, he's the a start, football player. The start stop is is awesome. He's explosive. Yeah, he it, it's it's a he's a really really fun back, but it's, it's, it comes to the medicals and he's not the biggest size, but he's just a good running back. Just throw in the I, I understand USC's defense was not good, but th watch the Cotton Bowl and, and just see him go to work. It's it's something special. best player on the field. Itis. It was. Uh, that's it what was. you want to see though, <laughs> especially it, if you're going against USC. His teammate Dorian Williams at linebacker. We might hear his name tonight. He had like 17 tackles in that game. He same type of thing on the other side of the ball. So that was the Tate until he won. In that game. Yeah. Twain's well coached. They, oh, they, they are. They're really fun. They had the biggest turnaround in college football history, right. going from two wins to 12 or whatever it was the last two years. Yeah. At 82, Dane, the Bucks go with Yaya Diaby. Just a fun name to and say. It, it is. is a fantastic <laughs> name to say. We wondered after they went with Clash Cansey in the first mm -hmm. round, they needed more pass rush help. Would they get a look at an edge rusher? Because it did seem like a position of need, and they addressed it two rounds later. Yeah, my number 72 overall player here. Uh, he's 6'3", 265. Uh, another great story. He was, after high school, working at the airport. 
not sure what was next and a former high school teammate of his got the call for a tryout at a juco he goes to ends up making the team next thing you know he's this juco recruit goes to louisville and it's it's inconsistent mm -hmm. but when it's it's he's playing at his best it's okay that's an nfl player the way he's built uh the way he moves he had one of the best 10 yard splits at the combine and obviously when Talk about pass rushers, you want that initial get off. Mm -hmm. And that 10 yard split says a lot. It's 154, or something. I can't remember exactly. But it, he, it's it, 156. Okay. 93rd percentile there, of all at, testers. That's, at, at 265, yeah, I mean, that's remarkable. that's special. Yeah. And so even though it's. You're it, at a 4 5 140. Yeah. Even though it's inconsistent, when you can move like that, uh, that there's a lot of promise there. And sometimes with the, the Juco guys, it, it's your, that you want to see that kind of that late rise their second year, and it's kind of like. You, you gotta like you're almost like taking them out like they're like a true sophomore. It mm. doesn't matter what their age is because you're just going okay. We only can look at these two years. That's when we finally get some decent coaching compared to junior colleges. We've seen some JUCO coaches on Twitter, so that's all I need to say. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's that his ascension and his like that's what you're grading to. It's more again when you talk about some of these guys that are more de I wouldn't say developmental, but more ascending. Look at the second half of the year, and that's where he re he really did pop, and it, it made sense with some of his uh, uh, testing numbers because that's. Like you said, there's times where it's just like, yeah, it's overwhelming. Where it's like, oh my mm. God, like you're the best player. And there's other times where it's like you don't hear from him for two quarters. Right. right when you're watching Louisville. Yeah. I mean, he's scheme diverse. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, you see. The Tampa. Exactly. That makes a lot right. of sense. So you yeah. want him to play tighter to the tackle. He can do that. You want to widen him out, play on his feet. I think he can do that as well. So he's a freaky athlete. And in the third round, mid third round, that's that's the, well, you roll the dice. Taking, like exactly. Taking some swings on yes. freaky yes. athletes. Look at his mock draft tool page right now. The third best physical comp for him on this page is Jadevi and Clowney. Okay. Talk about, free, talk about freaky athletes. Yeah. Not, not a bad that's place a to be in terms probably. of your physical profiles right. at the round pick. That, yeah. that's, that says something right there. And so, yeah, Diaby, again, he's, he's long. He's got 34 inch arms. Um, it, and he, the length we usually expect from the Bucks. Right. Right. Compare that with right. Kansi, and it's right. just, it's, it's interesting. And, and I don't want to say, like, make it paint it that Diaby hasn't been productive. This past year, he actually was. He had 14 tackles for loss, he had nine. Sacks. Yep, nine, so right. he, he was a guy that was getting home and more so than we saw the 2021 tape and so another guy that's ascending and he's older he's 24 years old but that's he's, part of the reason that it lasted this long probably um, not a lot of yeah it, it, the inconsistent nature <laughs> yeah. of I mean he and he's I think when you factor in his football journey like he was when he first got the Juco he's 210 pounds you know, he added 50 pounds since then, um, getting better. And so, you know, I, I think when you factor everything in, I thought he would go in that early to mid third round range. And that is basically where he went. Yeah. Oh, here we go. At 83 here, Denver goes with Riley listen. Moss, safety from Iowa. They list him as a safety here yeah, on ESPN. That's... How disrespectful. It is. This, this, is a, this is a cornerback, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, this is, this is the Jason Seahorn Honorary Award. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right here. He's a freak, though. He is. Yeah. He was a 4-4 athlete. He was a big-time hurdler in high school. Okay. And, you know, hurdle... I always got these freaks, man. What the hell yeah, happened? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, because they, they know a lot of places don't recruit them. And so, yeah. But, I mean, hurdlers are interesting because you need not only the speed, but, you know, that, that lower body strength, mm -hmm. the timing, the pacing. So, a lot goes into that. Um, interesting that the Broncos did not have a pick in the first 60 picks. And they come away here with Marvin Mims, mm -hmm. Drew Sanders, Riley Moss. Uh, three really athletic players. Uh, so even though they didn't have a high pick, they're doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I know I can't. I didn't, didn't I mean, see other that. Other than Patrick Sertan, yeah, mm -hmm. they, they've got a, a theoretical need for corner. Yep. You know, Damari Mathis and they drafted him in the fourth round last year, but. Again, different yes. coaching staff. You get some turnover there. So Moss has some good film, man. Oh yeah. It's it's not just this, uh, you know, taking a project or taking taking the the athletic ability. It's like no, his film is pretty dang good. He's got pretty good Zone, skills. Yeah, man. Yes. Yep. And he's the type of guy that when a completion is made on his watch. He takes it personally. Yeah. Like it matters. He's competitive. To him. Yeah. Really, Remember really. Competitive. In the Senior Bowl. Yeah. It was like mm -hmm. he was getting a little feisty. Very, <laughs> we'll very get much out so. there. Yeah. No, you can see I, it. So this this next pick here that can't, is coming up here with Miami, uh, I have mocked this uh, almost every time, just because I want to see it so bad. Yeah. <laughs> How much fun it would be to see Devin A. Chain, the Texas yes. A&M running back, that speed, it's special fat, special speed, it's the fastest team ever. <laughs> yes, this is. I, I I thought it might even happen in the second round. Yeah. Uh, here is in the third round. A. Chain goes to Miami with the 84th pick. 
one of the best athletes in the draft. Yep. Uh, he won the he he could have qualified for the Olympics with some of these track times yep. that he had at, at Texas A&M running indoor track. Speed, speed, speed. Mm -hmm. And the thing with, that you love about A Chain is he looks like a running back, though. Not yep. not size wise. That's what you worry about. He's 185, 190 pounds. He's going to be in that range. But with the way he, he sets up his cuts, yep. the way he reads his blocks, he looks like a running back. He does. And so you're encouraged by that. It's just, okay, it, it, can he hold up? It, it can, you know, what's the workload going to look like? Yep. Um, you know, come to be like a job at best, yep. that type of guy where he's undersized, but man, there's clearly something there. It, he's a real back. Like he yes. really is. And that's what I mentioned him on, on our show, our preview show, that he was one of my favorite guys to watch. It started last year watching Isaiah Spiller, mm -hmm. the back that went to the Chargers. In the the difference driver. in speed. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> and that's the thing, he was a better running back. Not yeah. just, you could see the juice, but he set up blocks. He had balance, he tempoed his runs. He wasn't just, most speed guys and most undersized speed guys bounce. They're yeah. bouncing everything. Bounce, bounce, bounce. He never, he's, a running back. He's working between the tackles. He's setting up blocks. He's following a puller and then cutting inside. So that's why I will usually never look at running backs under 200. He's one guy I'm like, no, I get it. Like, I totally get this. And with the Dolphins, and, oh my god. It makes me so curious about how they'd use him and uh, just like oh. what other little wrinkles within their offense yep. because they yeah. bring back Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert, but you know, we know those guys, Raheem yeah. Mostert especially, has trouble staying mm -hmm. healthy and you know, Jeff Wilson's been solid for them yep. after the trade, but that explosive element, oh. if you lose most or do you lose that out of the backfield, clearly they're accounting for and that. And he has the vision, too. That's what, to and take advantage of that kind of run right. scheme. And he has the hands, too, yep. where he can help out yes. in the passing game. Yes. He is a capable uh, receiver. <laughs> and so in this... I love it. Like I oh, really do. It's like this is. It's really fun to I be on that. Swear offense. I swear, I I tried to mock this into existence. Every single mock <laughs> I, with the, the Dolphins on day two, I want to see this. And so yeah. uh, even my, my, I'm pretty sure I did my latest mock draft. I did last night, uh, but it was two o'clock in the morning, and I might be wrong. <laughs> but look, listen, uh, with a chain, this is a a guy you did that fifty one. Did I do it? Yeah. 51 second round? Okay, yeah. so it can't happen around later. Uh, better late than never. Uh, still counts. A chain is a fun player that's going to create fireworks. Yep. And so uh, we can wonder about the workload and can he hold up at that size? Uh, that, that's why he's available here yep. in the 80s and he didn't go earlier. But, and this isn't a track athlete playing football. Nope. He was a football player since elementary school, and then in high school, they're like, dude. Come on. I mean, the track coaches are like, please, come on. It's a lot easier when there's not bodies out there. Right. Yeah, no <laughs> He's kidding. just going to run all the way. Then he goes to A&M, and he ran a 10 one 100 meters. I cannot. It's it, world-class it, speed. It's, it, that qualifies for the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that is record-breaking speed, yeah. and you see it on the football field. Big day for a lot of teams, especially the Detroit Lions, which is our next guest. He has some deep intimate knowledge of it is one of our wonderful draft writers at the athletic nick baumgartner nick how you doing good guys what's going on doing okay how, how, you've been enjoying are you yourself hanging in there draft? in the studio oh we're, yeah we're I mean, doing uh, wonderful hey i told chris yesterday this looks like um it looks like something out of like a pawnee indiana studio that you guys found. <laughs> I, love this, I love the setup i do the pillars behind you i really do good stuff been so, enjoying it obviously uh, an eventful couple days for the lions you know you're a detroit yeah. guy what do you think of, you know, beyond the first day, we've, we've talked enough about the Jameer Gibbs and value and all of that. Day two right. for the Lions, what do you make out of those three picks so far? Yeah, I think if you take everything that they've done and, like, just kind of throw it into a pool and say, like, forget where you got everybody, like, this is pretty good. Like, every, every guy that they've drafted has sort of checked every box of, you know, they want the character guys, they want guys that are hungry, guys that have football character, and that are, like, good people off the field and can get along with with everybody and that's you know laporta brian branch uh hendon hooker i mean it's every single you know one of these guys i think fits the bill that includes the first you know two on, the, uh, on day one holmes just doesn't care about what anyone else is doing i think that's what's going on here and he's completely uh trusting his board and you know hey i mean <laughs> that's fine if it works but i guess you know i guess we'll see favorite day two haul so far for you you know, I like, uh, I kind of like what Chicago did. Um, oh, man. Oh, man. It's a bad. Way to you know you're on really, really, really go, playing to the crowd here, my friend. I like <laughs> am I, it. Like, am I alone in this? Like, that was, uh, I kind of had to do a double take there. I like what New England just did with Mapu, uh, but I kind of like what Chicago did there. They needed, you know, help inside. Uh, kind of doubling up there a little bit uh, uh, was, was interesting, I thought. Anybody who fell a little bit further than you expected, somebody just couldn't believe was on the board, you know, deeper into the second, maybe even into the third round. 
Uh, Brian Branch is the one uh, we were just talking about with Detroit. But I mean, like, I guess I didn't really quite, you know, the mayor one wasn't as shocking to me, I suppose. Although I think he's probably a first round pick. Right. But like, um, I thought Brian Branch was a top 20 ish player. I know the positional value is what it is, but he's also a guy who can do multiple things. Uh, I think he'll do multiple things uh, with Detroit. He'll probably learn and play with CJ Gardner Johnson for a year, but I don't know what the long term will be, but I thought that was terrific value. Anybody that's left you scratching your head a little bit? Uh, there's uh, been a few. Uh, you know, I would say on day one more than day two, though. I'm trying to think if there's anybody here on day. Do you guys have anybody that stood out on day two off the top of your head? I just was trying mm-hmm. to go through off the top. I mean, I think day two's been kind of okay for the most part. Yeah. I mean, Juice Scruggs was taken a little bit earlier yeah. than personally. I mean, he, yeah. he's the only guy that's been drafted so far outside my top 100. But, um, you know, I think you can, when you want been, that interior flexibility, yeah. you, you understand it. Right? This has been pretty solid. Like, I liked where, how, you know, Tippmann and uh, Schmitz, the way that they went, I thought that was mm. correct, how that would go. Yep. Um, like, Darnell, I guess, Washington, I don't know if he's still, if he's gone while we're talking here. Uh, and I know the uh, medicals yeah. are a concern, but, um, you know, that is one that I, I don't know. I know that I, I saw the report on there that people were concerned about his knees like at the actual combine that's that's not good but i just i like a lot about what he could do in in certain fits so that's a little surprising what do you think about the the hendon hooker pick just in terms of the potential timeline you know is that somebody you think they view as a one day starter obviously you draft him in the third round the urgency yeah. isn't there compared to you draft him in the first round or even in the second so just how do you see that playing out even over the next year or two in detroit yeah i don't think that's it's anything that they'll rush at all in a year. I don't think it'll be next year, but it also sort of depends. Like I think Goff has, you know, two or three good ones left in him, but it's like, that's not a guarantee. I mean, you know, last year was really good. Uh, The last half of the year before was really good, but you know, the previous two weren't so good. So if things start to fade a little bit, I think this gives them the ability to not only back him up. And if he gets hurt, now you have that, you know, fixed last year, it was Sudfeld or bust. So really if Goff got hurt, it was nothing. Uh, and they, I think they signed Sudfeld, like, the day the season started. They had, like, Campbell didn't even know who he was for, for a minute there. It was not a good not a good scene. So, like, this is, for the first time in a long time, they've got a developmental piece who, I know he's older, but, like, that to me, I don't care. I think they'll actually fit pretty well there uh, with Detroit. And uh, I think they'll like a lot about what he does, and he'll fit really well with that offensive line. Who's still on the board that you're just intrigued by their landing spot here over the next day or so? Um... Let's see. That is, uh, you're putting me on the spot now with some of these here. Let's see. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I guess I'm very intrigued to see how these quarterbacks still unravel. Um, you know, in general, uh, I, I guess what where Hooker was going to go was the last little whatever. But I don't know what order everyone's. Gonna, it seems like everybody has a different, you know, six through whatever. And I guess I'm can. Sort of still interested where that starts and then how it goes. And I'm really curious to see what San Francisco does at the end of this, because they haven't done anything yet. And I feel like that could be like a really good three picks and four. I don't know if they're going to move or do anything else, but I'm really interested there. Nick Baumgartner, thank you very much, my friend. Always good to chat with you. We'll talk soon. You bet, fellas. Be good. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Nick. All right. Couple linebackers off the board here in quick order, Dane. Diane Henley from Washington State goes to the Chargers at 85, and Trenton Simpson from Clemson to Baltimore at 86. And Henley is a former wide receiver. Mm-hmm. Uh, you yeah, he's know, like everything. He was a high school quarterback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, they moved him. He goes to Nevada, becomes a wide receiver. The try him as, and he started games there. Mm-hmm. Try him as a nickel, try him as a safety, not quite working out. They moved him to linebacker, had over 100 tackles. Transfers to Washington State for his final year and had over 100 tackles again. Uh, this is a guy that's a, Determined chaser, always around the football. He can cover, he can drop. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm surprised he fell as far as he did. Um, so I, I love the value here for the Chargers. Yeah, he, I, I, <laughs> I had to watch him for, uh, we did the little radar thing, and that was his background's just hilarious because they're like, oh, he plays all these positions. But the run and hit aspect, mm-hmm. he's another one of those. But I had, and it's just the athleticism. Like he doesn't, I don't know, it's kind of, I'm trying to like kind of talk both sides of my mouth. He doesn't play like someone that used to be a receiver. Like, right. it, like, yes, there's some athletic traits from it, but it was like, oh, no, you, you, it looked like a converted safety playing down there as opposed to maybe an offensive guy. I'm saying that he has some physicality to him. He's not like an overwhelming physical guy, but there's not 
You don't. There's not a detriment. He can hold up. Now, there's, mm -hmm. Yes, there's a better way to put it. He, he can hold up there. But he has that true, true athleticism, uh, obviously, with all the positional changes. But run the hit guy, go make some tackles. That's kind of what you're getting him for. Feels like you know they brought in Eric Hendrickson free agency, but you know Kenneth Murray. I think there's always been a, not always, but the last couple of years, I think been a pretty substantial level of frustration with the lack of development they've gotten from him. So yeah. I think linebacker, absolutely, you could have right. talked yourself into it being a need. The Ravens also taking a linebacker with Trent Simpson out of Clemson. They have Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith already, but. Patrick Queen, somebody we heard rumblings about. Could mm -hmm. he potentially be on the move? See somebody maybe wasn't long for Baltimore. What do you think about Simpson going to the Ravens? I, I think it's one of those value picks that mm -hmm. at this point in the draft, it's like, you know, this guy we thought might go top 50 mm -hmm. and he's still available. We can't let him fall any further. Uh, really athletic player. Yep. And, that you just you know, he entered starting the season at, back in August. He was my number like six overall player. I mean, yeah. I, I I was betting on what he could be the upside. Yep. He he didn't realize that upside this year. Yep. He was fine. He was okay, but all that athleticism and the impact wasn't greater as as it should have been. So you know he's the son of an Army Ranger. Um, you know he's the character's great. The athleticism's great. It's just he doesn't see things the way he should he doesn't yeah. anticipate yep. so that that obviously at linebacker that's kind of a non-negotiable can, can he get better at that you know maybe but uh that's why he fell to this point in the third round i actually liked him best when i was watching clemson's defense was closer to the ball as like a, a sam like an old school sam yeah. on the ball like that's where i let him rush him best. Yeah. yeah like and set the edge and everything yeah. i actually thought he did that pretty well um and i was expecting a little bit more from the off ball stuff but like you said the He's a step slow. Actually, both of these linebackers that we were talking about, that's actually <laughs> both of their deals. They mm -hmm. kind of, that play recognition, even though they have the athletic gifts, that they make up for it because those athletic gifts, right. but again, it's faster, harder in the NFL. So you want them to see the ball and go get the ball. But I, I, I thought of him as best as that kind of old school Sam, or if you're in the odd or a tight mint front stuff, they call it the Jack. Yes. Um, that's where I think he is best at. And honestly, in the Ravens, it's a great landing spot. Like I have comfortable where he's going at right now, and also just what they have available. He's great there. 87. The Niners move up. I think they're just getting a little bit bored. Probably trade up with the Vikings. Draft Jair Brown. Yeah. From Penn State, safety. Uh, you, there's a lot of similarities uh, between him and uh, who was our second round safety to the Bears last year from Penn State. Oh, um, <laughs> my guy. Uh, <laughs> We're getting to that. We're getting to that. Oh point my God, in the Jaquan Brisker. Jaquan Brisker. Okay. Good God. I love Jaquan Brisker. Yes. Uh, we all love <laughs> Jaquan Brisker. Uh, they oh, were they were actually teammates at Lackawanna College. Finalist for Defensive Rookie of the Year for yeah. me, by the way. <laughs> they were they go back to Lackawanna week. <laughs> where they were teammates, and then they were teammates at Penn State. And yeah. there's some similarities there with the way they play. Um, Jair Brown, I think, disappoints the people with the way he tested. He didn't test great. Uh, but you know he's also the only player in this draft that has double-digit interceptions over the last two years. Uh, he plays fast. He plays physical. Um, he's he's the type of guy that coaches want to coach yeah. uh, because of the way he sees the field. Kind of the opposite. We we're talking about those linebackers. Uh, play recognition is there, and he's a tone setter. Yeah. You know, he he practices hard. He plays hard. He shows up every day to work, and so that mentality is something that uh, you look past the four six five and you focus on that. And so Jair Brown. Um, thought he could even go higher than this, but yeah, it's a good pick for the 49ers. Not so, a lot of depth at safety on no. that team. Mm -hmm. You know, Tashawn Gibbs is back on a one-year deal. Got a decent amount guaranteed, like $2 million guaranteed of about a $2.9 million contract, but it's one year. You know, mm -hmm. they signed him off the scrap heap last year, so I don't think that's a long-term plan for them. He's obviously been in the league for a while, yep. so maybe not a starter this year, but a succession plan where you could plug him in potentially as early as next season. But it makes sense. This is what the 49ers find these guys on defense, these tenacious, high football IQ guys. And yeah. even the testing might not be there. Um, they play faster than the testing time. And, I mean, these Penn State DBs, my exposure, first exposure I'm watching them against Wisconsin last year in 2021 was they just overwhelmed them. Yeah. Like, they, you can throw the ball. And, a little bit because of the quarterback, but also because of just uh, also what the Penn State DBs were doing. They were just breaking on everything, overs. They made a pick, or uh, Brisker made a great play in the red zone. So, Good job. But, but, but thank you, I know. But <laughs> I'll never forget it again. But you watch these guys play, it's just that they re their read and react ability was just fantastic yeah. because they're, they're just good football players. Manny Diaz, the defensive coordinator, you know, he, he just raves about him. I mean, just you can't get him to stop talking. It's like, okay, I want to talk about someone else. Yeah, but yeah. The, <laughs> he just wants to keep going about him. He, he loves him.
That's awesome. 88th overall, the Jags take, take, they take Tank Bigsby. There we are. Second Running back from Auburn. Second, Second tank, tank of yeah. the draft uh, with the 88th pick. Uh, he was my 87th player, so <laughs> this is right around the range, right? Uh, yeah. Watching that Auburn offense, it it felt like, and I think Tank felt like, he had to do everything. Yes. Because he wasn't getting a bunch of help out there. Uh, quarterback position, the offensive line, it just felt like he had to, to make things happen on his own. Yep. And so you feel like there's more there than just what you saw on tape because he didn't have a ton of holes to run through. 5'11", 210. Um, he runs He runs fast. He runs physical. Um, I, I, I think this is where we thought we'd see a running back run. Yep. Devin yeah, A-Chain, yeah. Tajay Spears, yeah, now with Tank Bigsby, Kendra Miller. Um, this, is, this is exactly what we thought would happen with these running backs. We might see one more before we get to the end of the round. And this makes sense, you know, what, what they have with Travis Etienne, and this is their mm -hmm. thunder. Mm -hmm. right? they, that's what they need. They need another guy that can eat some of those touches. You look at Travis Etienne's touches last year, mm -hmm. he had games with like 30 touches, yeah. like over and over and over. That's all they had. They have Dearness Johnson now. That they yes. Got this right. like Cleveland. Cleveland. Michael Hastie's there. Yeah, but, but again, Tank's nobody that's going to prevent player. you from making yeah. this sort He's of a good innings eater that can uh, that can do more than that. They drafted uh, Snoop Connor last year, but that was in the fifth round. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I I like Tank and I like where he went right here and I, I for for the Jags, great part of a like, complimentary piece, especially in the run game. Uh, yeah, this this is this is nice. I like this in their backfield. Right, we're gonna take one more quick break here before we wrap up the third round. Stick with us. All right, here we go. Buffalo Bills on the clock with the 91st pick. Dane, while we were gone, at 90, DeMarvion Overshawn, linebacker from Texas, heading to the Cowboys. Apparently Michigan doesn't have a linebacker in a draft. <laughs> the Cowboys couldn't keep the Michigan theme going, but Overshawn, uh, Texas kids, Stayed in Texas to play college, staying in Texas to play his NFL football. Uh, former safety, they played him on the edge, they played him as an off-ball guy. This is a your classic run and hit linebacker. Uh, you don't want him taking on blocks, facing that congestion. You want him to just go and, and go make plays. And so, uh, interesting fit to see how they'll use him there. Yeah, I, I, that's... It's also funny in, in college now, like when you watch, you scout the linebacker position, that's what you're going to see a lot of. Yeah. A lot of guys in space, a lot of guys run and hit because 
don't see a lot of fullbacks in college unless you're playing, you know, Wisconsin or Iowa, and that's about it. <laughs> so that and that's what, why we keep saying that too. Is like this guy's a running hit guy. This guy's a you know sideline to sideline type guy, and that just another one going right now because that's what you get. You mentioned we might see another Tulane player come yeah, off the board before the yeah. day is over. Here we go. Dorian Williams, linebacker from Tulane, heading to Buffalo with the 91st pick. Obviously, they lose. Tremaine Edmonds in free agency. Right, right. Big, big deal with Chicago. Probably had a need at linebacker. They go for it here. This is a little bit of a traits player. Uh, you know, he has long arms. He's young. He runs really well. He's a 4-5 athlete uh, that size. And, you know, had 125 tackles this year. Mm -hmm. Watch the Cotton Bowl. He had 17 tackles. He was all over the place. Um, he's another one of these guys that you wish he saw things a little faster. But he does, he's able to make up for it because of that speed and the way he flows with the football. So um, still a young player, still uh, still growing. And in the third round, I mean, it, I thought third round, late third, early fourth was the range for him. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense here. Yeah, and adding speed to that defense that, that needs it. They need a little youth injection over there. So it makes sense to get a guy like that. And different, um, different than how Edmonds was a yeah. little bit too, you know, a, <laughs> Not a lot of guys are like Edmonds as far as size and traits and everything, but yeah, a little different type, and so maybe they just want to add a little more uh, juice on the defense. They have they drafted Terrell Bernard last year. Yeah, I believe in the early third, in the third, third round. Third round. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, they've drafted a couple guys in that range. More competition. But yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. Just yeah. trying to see if we can find the best possible solution there. And Matt Milano's well, 30 now, I believe. Maybe 31. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you know, maybe as we all love Matt Milano, Matt Milano, but. You know, need a plan afterwards. One, we did miss the Kobe Turner pick. Yep. Um, what was that 89, I believe? Uh, defensive tackle yes. out of yes. uh, Wake Forest. Yeah, apologies. Uh, it, our second non combine guy in drafted. Okay. And one of the cooler nicknames, he's the conductor. <laughs> uh, because of his music background, he uh, he's big in the music and chorus and choir and plays three or four instruments. Okay. And one of the reasons that he didn't get recruited high is because he uh, he didn't go to camps because he had music to do. And uh, he was actually a senior year in high school, wasn't getting recruited anywhere. His cousin was getting recruited. Richmond, FCS Richmond, yeah. was in the house. I'm like, Who's that kid in the kitchen? He's a pretty good sized kid. You know, can he, can, is, he, is he an athlete? And uh, they gave him a walk on opportunity. Didn't take long for him to earn a scholarship. <laughs> and uh, he transfers to Wake Forest for his final year. Yeah. Wasn't even a starter, but he worked in the rotation. You see the movement skills, really athletic player. Kobe Turner's a great story. And uh, here he goes, third round. Yeah, and the Rams need those bodies. Yeah, they, like do. they do. They need, they need bodies up front. We, I love playing the who's who of who's that uh, when you look at the Rams uh, defensive line. <laughs> Any more details about what instruments? I feel like we, I didn't get enough about guitar. Kobe Turner right here. Um, I mean, it, the voice I is the bigger like thing. The voice yeah. is just yeah. a real he, strong voice. He's going to crush it in the rookie talent show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, my God. He's saying yes, that he, he did the national anthem for one of Richmond's basketball games. Like, he's a it, – it's still a big part of his life. Like, it's not like a, a hobby. It's something that uh, he, he is a meaningful – almost to the point where, like, do you love football? How, how much do you love football? What's, what's music or football? You know, almost to the point where you worry about that, but it, it's, uh, he's a very talented guy. That's cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I the conductor, you, like, that's just a great I know, it's a, I think he just like trains. That's why I was, I was thinking train conductor. Amazing. I had the hat on immediately. <laughs> I, well. yeah. I wasn't thinking like Julia Tarr. That, that was not the first place my mind went. Lydia Tarr, excuse me. Right, right, right. <laughs> the Chiefs trade up here to 92. A uh, little bit of a delay in the pick coming here but we'll, we'll have it in a second but I can't believe I messed up Lydia Tarr's name that's how you know we're like deep into the third round of the <laughs> right. draft. I, I, yeah that's my version of Brisker right there. I think that we've I think we've hit on everybody so far yes. you know the, those couple linebackers coming off we've had a run on linebackers here Dane I think four five four linebackers in the past eight picks yeah so it took a while, but we got there. Yeah, and all guys that have their flaws, yep. uh, yeah. you know, and you, you can see what they are, but uh, they they also have strong points of what they yep. do. And they're all athletic. Um, Wanya Morris, okay. The other offensive tackle from Oklahoma off and the board the Chiefs here. trade up with Cincinnati here to go get Wanya this Morris. This is your Lucas Niang insurance yes. at right tackle. Yep. Uh, Wanya Morris, a... Former Tennessee volunteer, highly recruited, transfers to Oklahoma, where he was the right tackle. Anton Harrison was the left tackle. Mm -hmm. Morris has a lot of ability. It's just can he stay healthy? Can he stay on the field? Um, he missed the first two games, an academic issue. Then he was banged up. He was hurt. Um, but he has the ability. Uh, you go back to high school and the, the way he was recruited, he yeah. has a lot of ability. It's just can he, can he harness it all? Yeah. And can the coaching get it out of him? So this is a little bit of a... Maybe a little bit of a home run swing. Yeah. Uh, if you're the Chiefs, you know, you, you're kind of hoping on, that you pulls it all together. But 
not many talented guys at that position uh, left a tackle. But that when you have an offensive line coach yeah. who has consistently getting the most out of all yes. of these guys, these are the types of swings That's you can it. take at that yep. position. It is such a cheat code. And I think that that makes total sense as to why they would go after somebody like this. Yeah, Coach Heck, right? That that makes a lot of sense. It does, and that, that when especially with Coach Heck, it's there's a thing uh, my dad always likes to say is a re recoverability. Like, the, uh, how can a guy recover after he loses? And usually it's length and athleticism. And here you go, with Morris. And so <laughs> that's what you work on. It's almost reverse engineering. It's like because they're usually so they're losing so much, but then they're like, oh, oh, he didn't truly lose. He lost initially, but he's able to recover. So that's what you're honing in on. You're reverse engineering. Can we not have you lose initially? And this is a guy. I, yeah. I get it, like taking a swing on him, it's a traits type of tackle. That's it. And usually traits tackles go early, even if mm -hmm. the film's not that good. And that's, yeah. 6'5", 35 inch arms, yeah. uh, a guy, he's got balance, that recovery balance. you're talking about, yes. he has it. It's just, he, the consistency is yep. not there. It, it's, he's not a very disciplined His feet player. sometimes get lazy. That's he's a, a very young 22 year old. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, and he's not gonna be the right tackle from day one, or he won't be asked to be the right tackle from day one. But uh, again, at this point in the draft, you're getting a a really toolsy player yeah. that at a position where, like you said, those guys usually don't last to this point. You yeah. bet on your development plan, and, and yeah. you yep. bet on the building. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what that feels like. A swing guy. That, sure. this, you do a lot worse than this. So now, let's look at the Chiefs draft just in general. They go get Felix in the first round, whose yeah. last name I'm not going to try to pronounce is pass rush from Kansas State, right. or she Rice in the second round. Mm -hmm. What do you think of their draft so far overall? Well, they're hitting exactly what we thought they would hit, right? Yeah. You know, they, they go with the pass rusher, you know, no more Frank Clark, uh, help George Karloftis out. They go with a receiver, yeah. someone that's uh, it's interesting the type of receiver they went for. They went for the ball winner. They mm -hmm. went for a guy that you know has a little bit of juice after the catch, but is more so going to be a, a possession plus yep. player. Yep. Uh, and then here with the right tackle with Wanya Morris, you get another body for that offensive line. Something you can develop, give you depth. I, they're they're hitting the high notes. They're hitting exactly what we thought they would do. <laughs> like you said, they, you were already mentioning the guy. Who they lose this offseason? So they lost Frank Clark. Yeah. Okay, replaced with Juju Smith Schuster, right. Andrew Wiley. Okay, yep, and Andrew Wiley. And it's like they went one, one, one. And yeah. That's then we're gonna fill out, paint them with a similar color. You know, we're just gonna change it from blue to teal. And I think that's kind of what they're they're going about it. But yeah, like even with Rice, and I want to talk about him. Um, I was curious. I you knew they were gonna get probably one more pass catcher probably on day two. Mm. It was they. I could see them just well, even what we're talking about. It's like, oh, I could see that in that offense. It helps with Patrick Mahomes again. But with Rice, it's interesting. It's like, oh no, you guys are leaning into this physical ball yeah. winner type, and, and that That's can what just they didn't do have. Yeah. Right? If you're thinking about the types of guys, you know, MVS gives them that speed element. They yep. got Sky Moore last year, right. who's yep. that slot element, a little bit undersized. So can we just get that bigger body type? It's Kadarius why Tony. Yeah, Kadarius is, Tony's yeah, obviously right. there, yep. and you know it would have been rich, and I, I wouldn't have seen them doing it based on some of the actual cap and financial restrictions. But DeAndre Hopkins was somebody that had been mm -hmm. mentioned there, and I think it made sense in terms of a skill set, even if the price tag was a little bit rich. So Rice kind of wins the same way as Hopkins, not yeah. comparing the players no, at all, but right. just how they win. Four or five athletes, yeah. but yeah. Their can, tape is them boxing out, throwing yeah. a bow, and just high point it. That's what they do. The other interesting thing, too, with these two day two picks, they're not the cleanest players. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's some background work you need to do with these two players. A little bit of risk involved, um, but they're, they they feel like, you know, and especially when you're Kansas City, mm -hmm. and you, you, you can take some of those risks. Uh, they haven't shot away from no, that. No, they haven't. Ever. They have not. So um, we'll see how they, they I mean, these two pan Because if it works, you get a Trey Smith, you know, a six-rounder yeah. with medical concerns. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking about yep. in terms of home run swing on yep. the offensive right. line and, and now you bet on the yeah. way that you've developed players in a the past. A plus starter at guard on a six-round rookie contract. It's like, that's well, let's say it works out. Get. Yep. We were talking about this the other day. How do you pay a Joe Tooney and a Juwan Taylor what you're paying them and you're paying your quarterback $45 million a year and it doesn't end up mattering? You have three rookie starters on the offensive line or yeah. three rookie contract players yep. along the offensive line. Where can you skimp to kind of offset some of those other costs? Oh, here we go. The wait is over. Yeah. The wait is over. 93rd overall, the Pittsburgh Steelers take Darnell Washington, tight end from Georgia. We went about, what, 60 picks later than we thought? Yeah. Um, they just don't make many that look like this. And I think that scared <laughs> off some teams. Yeah. You know, how unique. Unique is, can be a really positive way to describe a player. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a scary way right. to describe a player because, you know, as unique as he is, you don't see many guys like this. Uh, and so it did, did worry a little bit. Is he... As a blocker and as a receiver, did we like the idea of him better, or do we really think he can turn out to be this 
behemoth that is a six offensive lineman, but also someone that's a, uh, a true matchup nightmare mm -hmm. in, in coverage. And so can he get there? That's the big question. Yes. And when you're drafting at 93, you're willing to take that bet. It's way more comfortable yeah. with this. Yeah. This it's is tools, man. Yes. Yeah. Let me bet on some tools. This is my like again, my usual tight end philosophy is the biggest, strongest athletes and just and fastest athletes and just hope they figure it out. And when I say that usually it's more third round types. Yeah. And here we go. This is Darnell Washington. Way comfortable with him here. Like you said, the idea of him blocking the popular comparisons been Mercedes Lewis. Mercedes Lewis took four years to become mm. a good blocker. A and lot then, of tight ends do. Yes, yes. and that yes. he he's probably most likely going to be that. I think even as a receiver, it's like yes, he has the tools and stuff, but because of his size, he has natural limitations mm -hmm. on his route running. So that, but that's why you have Pat Fryermuth. That's it's, exactly what I was going to say. It's, 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 it reminds me of the receiver conversation we had yesterday. Well, when you drop him into a situation where he can be your second tight end, yep. your complimentary tight end, right. the expectations aren't as high, the timeline changes, you can be more patient with him. He doesn't step in as your number one tight end from day one. He replaces Zach Gentry. Yeah, yes, like exactly. That's what you're doing here, and it's just a different sort of gamble. He's 21 years old, yep. and you know, we have to remember that. And tight ends generally do take time yep. to adapt, and, and you know, it's a physical position, and it's going to take some time for going up against NFL defensive ends and, and linebackers. And so... Um, It'll be interesting to see how much he gets on the field here as a rookie. I mean, they got the most out of Jesse James over sure. the years, and that was another yeah. big, big yeah. tight end that didn't really all put it together in college. But, no, this is a good landing spot for him. I, I really like this. Oh, they another team with two Georgia players now, and, and Broderick Jones. You know, they, they, yeah. they, everybody likes that film with him. Uh, but I really, really understand this, like, as far as what his upside can be. But it's like you guys are saying is that he can only he can play 10, 15 snaps. And that's great. And then maybe ease him more and let him do more in the red zone and on third down if he can handle it. So that, that's our eighth tight end, right? Eighth tight so. end. Tie the yeah. record. So tie, tie the record. Yeah. 94th overall, Dane. The Cardinals go get a member of the Cardinal, Michael Wilson yeah. from Stanford nice. at wide receiver. Going from a Cardinal to Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The plural version. Uh, Michael Wilson, if not for the injuries, we'd be talking about him as a top 50, 60 pick. Uh, the injury factor, the medicals, that worries you. Can he stay on the field? But he opened eyes at the senior bowl mm -hmm. the way he played. He's a good sized player, but he has the movements of a smaller player and he's very detail oriented yeah. in how Release he- Release package, just some of the details, yes. the nuances of the position. It's, he gets it. He, yeah. he really hones in on those things and he, he doesn't try to just run by you, he tries to set you up. He yeah. tries to, uh, he knows how defenders want to attack him and he knows how to counteract that. Uh, and then he, he's got good ball skills. He catches yep. the ball well. So, you know, Michael Wilson, again, the only, not the only, but the biggest concern, uh, it was just the injury factor. Can mm -hmm. he stay healthy? Can he stay on the field? Did not have a ton of production because he couldn't do that in college. Yep. And just that offense was just uh, stabbing me in the eyes. Yes. Uh, they, but, it, like, <laughs> he, he, I'm glad you guys are talking about because his, he wins in a different way than I was maybe expecting. Like, he, his releases that you saw at the Senior Bowl, that also shows up when you're watching it on film. There's yep. a lot of times where he is, winning on slants and it's really nice to see a big guy winning like that yes. usually a lot of these guys can get pressed and it's like oh man then they have to body him up and they get tackled for a five-yard gain he those underneath routes he can actually do a little bit more than a bigger guy usually can so i he was a guy he was a late watch receiver wise for me this is kind of i have more like a fourth round grade on him but I, I, I like the film. And again, it's the injury stuff. But, yeah, this is this is cool. I, I like this. Special teams, he'll block. Yep. I mean, the, Yes, the, he's a good blocker. Yes, yes. yes. The, all, the tangible factor is there. Um, his girlfriend plays the U.S. soccer national team. I mean, I, he's got a lot going for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nice. And just goes down to Arizona. He's 6'2", right? 6'2", 215. 6'2", 215. Uh, I think a sign that we've had a changing of the guard in the Arizona front office. Yes. I think so. A little bit of a different Darren size <laughs> receiver coming into the building via the draft compared to the guys that we were used to seeing yeah. from that old regime. It's funny. Yeah. And, and he ran four, five, eight. Mm -hmm. Like, not a burner here. This is not someone's just going to run by you. And that's the thing, too, is that, like, when you see that speeder, oh, okay, but then it's like he's quicker than fast, but he's a big guy. He it's, is, right. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Before All I know is no, nobody could cover him in Mobile. 
Yeah. Every single practice, yeah. nobody could cover him. He, he red him zone, and Jay, red zone period, he was just. Oh yeah. yeah. Him and Jaden Reed were uncoverable yeah. and just really opened eyes, and both of them off the board now. Speaking of the Senior Bowl, earlier this week, Jim Nagy, who oversees yeah. the Senior Bowl, was tweeting about Michael Wilson, thought he was going to be the steal of the draft, mm -hmm. compared him skill set wise, and you know, you know, take it easy with sure. this to Devontae Adams yeah. in terms of the nuances and some of this, the packages that he can roll out there. Another six-two guy that has good speed, speed issues, yeah. long speed, but the the game is subtler and yeah. the, why he wins is subtler maybe that's why you last a little bit longer and again those are lofty expectations but you know Jim had a very close look at him yeah. in Mobile all week I, I liked him the I, more and, and the more you watch him the more you appreciate him correct because you you understand okay this guy is really intelligent like yep. he's smart with the and oh shocker went to Stanford but he yeah, understands right. what he's doing out there so you know I, I do we, love we that. talk about pass rush plan like with pass rush yeah he has a release pro it's yes. very it's the same thing yes. it is it's it, the exact same thing. thing but that's what he does at 95 here, Dane, Jordan Battle from Alabama going to the Bengals. I think safety and safety depth right. was a question for Cincinnati. They signed Nick Scott in free agency, but they lost Von Bell. Dax Hill is going to be in his second year after playing limited snaps last season. You look at all the holes on yeah. the roster. Outside of tight end, it was probably the most glaring. This is the next guy off the board. You know, Jair Brown's gone. Uh, so, you know, you talk about a guy that 6'1", 210, not – there's nothing about his physical profile that just jumps out at you. You know, the speed's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just, there's nothing that really wows you, but he's just been a solid player the yep. last four years at Alabama. Uh, so, solid's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. and, and he's, again, sometimes that solid's okay, especially yep. here in the third round. You don't have to have this huge upside to warrant a draft pick. Uh, if you're, you're a, like smart guy. You, you yeah, know, that's it. You know who he plays a lot like is Gibson. Uh, uh, um, uh, for the 49ers. Like Deshaun Gibson? Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, there is some, similar, some similarities to it where it's just solid at everything, does a lot of things like okay or above average, adequate, I would say, but smart, he's physical, and that's not a bad package to have. Lou Anarumo has become one of those guys, I'm almost not, again, lofty expectations, but when Christian Gonzalez went to New England, it's like, ooh, mm. right. That's how defensive backs are with me and the Bengals and yeah. what they've done yeah. the last few years. All the guys they've found and the roles they've just kind of rolled them out in. <laughs> Defense in general, but the way that the pieces all fit together yeah. for them on the back end, I really like how they think about it. Yeah. So just somebody that's like, ooh, Bengals and, like him. And yeah. he likes smart players. That, that's so what I'm saying. That's exactly. Because you want to yeah. – the, the, the flexibility that they have and just kind of the – the mental demands they put on the guys yes. in the back end, those are very real, even when you compare them to some other teams around the league. You want smart, you want competitive, you want tough. Yep. That's, that's what he is. Even it, he doesn't, he is a low ceiling box post defender who, you know, isn't going to wow you. But again, that's uh, sometimes it's okay if, the, if you focus more on the floor than the ceiling. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what they do on defense, because they do a little bit of everything, it's nice to have a guy that can. Do a little bit yeah, of everything. Can play special teams yep, as well. Smart. That's it. Yeah. No. I mean, watching those Bengals DBs play, it was just it's you don't see a lot of like extreme like where you watch the DBs communicate and watch them. It was just so much fun. They're so well coached, but also just so smart. You can tell the the, the intelligence that the Bengals defense has played with the last couple of years, and it makes sense that they went with this. 96 overall, Dane. Broderick Martin, defensive tackle from Western Kentucky, goes to the Detroit Lions. We knew that they needed some front seven help. They waited a while to get it. Yeah. They tried late in the third round. This is maybe the biggest, I'm not going to say reach, but the biggest discrepancy where I had him ranked and where he's been drafted. He, yeah. he had a seventh round grade on him. This is truly, you're betting on, okay, he's bigger than everybody else, and we think we get more out of him. So, you know, he's 6'5", 330 pounds. He started at Alabama state uh north alabama north alabama okay. and then he transfers to western kentucky three again he's just a bigger guy and but he moves well visit there. <laughs> How, I, the fact that data was, almost didn't know it was shocking to me i was gonna, like you didn't know where he transferred from <laughs> and he was an fcs alabama he's the 96th team. pick and you didn't know where he started college north north alabama went to western kentucky and you know he really came on late he had a lot of 30 visits a lot of teams were like okay we're intrigued by this guy yeah. Um, and the Lions apparently thought they couldn't wait till the fourth round. They took him here in the third. So has some movement, you know, and it, the same reasons you draft a Jordan Davis and the top 15 are why the Lions are drafting uh, Broderick Martin here in the top 100, is you feel like just not many guys look like this, even if it's, the impact is inconsistent. Yeah. Even if I'm, I don't know how many snaps he's going to be able to play for us. Just not many human beings walking around that look like this and have some of those movement skills. Maybe a little bit of an explanation. Lions don't have a fourth round pick. 
There you go. They traded away on the TJ Hawkinson okay. trade. So right. the Vikings have their fourth. They got the Vikings second. So they would have had to wait all the way to the fifth if they liked him. Yeah. But they need this. They need pluggers. They, they, they need guys that can hold up. They need size in the middle. It, it makes a lot of sense uh, as far as kind of like their team makeup. Um, and we're keeping that. Keep those. Keep Jack Campbell clean. Yeah. And, <laughs> like, and, and he's never going to be a high volume snap nope. guy. And, but he's when he's going to be out there, he'll be a wrecking ball. Mm -hmm. He'll be someone that can take up doubles. But I mean, he will also push guys around. So, you know, you have to factor in what is that impact that he's going to give you in terms of the value of where you're drafting him. Obviously, the Lions think he can play some meaningful snaps, even if he won't be playing 45 snaps a game. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, now that we have like five, six picks, Dane, that you're just, just wondering if they're going to go on day two that Keely, you expected to? Keely Ringo. That's definitely yeah. the one. I, again, I, you, you don't come away from his tape saying, wow, you know, this is a, a great football player. You, you come away from his tape saying, wow, this is a physical specimen. At that size, the way he moves. Yeah. But you have a lot of question marks. Um, is he truly someone that will develop into a, a starting corner? I, I thought for sure someone would have taken a chance on that by this yeah. at this point but uh not to not not yet next up tyler scott i know i i i, 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 I was high on him I, trust me i know i'm i'm a little I liked surprised him over mims it, sure think about yeah. how val this the validation and the vindication you're going to feel when he's a fourth round pick oh, yeah. and becomes a real star it's solid not where you start it's where you finish that's right you know i, I want to be right three years so from now so i can't right, tell not myself now. about Muir smith marset it's like <laughs> a long game Holding on. A long game. hey he's working out with patrick mahomes right now here we go that's it clark phillips clark phillips is a good football player yeah. Why has he not been? I, I get it. He's yeah. five nine. He ran a four five. This tape's so much fun. Yeah, he had yeah. six picks this year, yeah. and I mean, he gave Jordan Addison a, a, a ton of trouble. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, Addison took him. Ricky Stromberg, okay. I like Ricky. Yeah, that's a yeah. good pick. He's another Shrine guy. I was trying to stand out for me. And another guy that has some guard experience, yeah. uh, maybe some position flex. So. They needed interior defense. They offensive line. Yes. Commanders yeah, took yeah, them, yeah, by yeah. the I mean, way, for anyone listening. Just really <laughs> has not been able to stay healthy. I mean, it, that was absolutely a spot where yep. they probably could have needed a little bit of help. Talking about Ricky Stromberg going to the Washington football team with the 97 <laughs> pick. Yeah, no, I, I, Ricky had a good week uh, during the Shrine week. Really liked him. Maybe I just watched the centers too much and watched the interior line <laughs> too much. Maybe it was my angle. But they're really one of my favorite guys from that week. Um, yeah, I like this tape. I think he's sound. I actually think he has some good movement ability. Uh, yeah, really, it makes a ton of sense for where they're at too. I think he can slot right in right away. You think he's a starting? You think he's a center? Yeah, I think he's a center. That's center I only. Down. No, no, no. Thing. I think he can. I think he can. Yeah, I think he's got the position flag. You think, think so? Okay, because yeah. they they signed Nick Gates in free agency. Mm -hmm. They brought in Andrew Wiley. They drafted yep. Sam Cosme in the second round two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I even after the Gates signing and bringing in Wiley, I was like, okay. Who are the five and where? So now you bring in a potential center. You think he's got some guard flexibility. Yep. Andrew Norwell is still there, but obviously Andrew Norwell is a little bit older. So how those five guys shake out will be a good question because the rest of the Washington offense got some intriguing it pieces does. on us. Yeah, and Stromberg also has the uh, the sign off from our buddy Brandon Thorne, um, oh. and and he was a guy that. Brandon kept telling me about you know like you, you know we, we, cause we, I, I, yeah. texting back and forth about him and. Going back and watching more and more Stromberg, what you really appreciate, he just he stays attached. Yes. He loses slowly, you mm -hmm. know? And so even if he's not just beating guys up, even if he does lose, it's it's slowly. And so he's he's able to maintain that engage, engagement, and that's I, important. How, I think what I even said after the Shrine Week was I said he maximizes his angles, meaning he knows where oh. to go and he gets there, and then it's just like, and we're good there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then we'll away. see. And, okay. But his eyes are good. He does, he does a lot of good things. I, that's why I think he can start right away. I, I re, Yeah, I liked him. And uh, this is kind of where I kind of figured he would go. So interesting that he goes to Washington. I like that fit. 98th overall, the Cleveland Browns take Siaki Ika this from is... Baylor, defensive tackle. We thought they needed maybe another body on the interior of the defensive line, Dane, right. and they go get one. A boy, very, did they. boy, did they. A, ver <laughs> a very certain type of, uh, <laughs> of defensive tackle, yes. Uh, it, former, he was a top recruit, went to LSU. Then he, he follows, uh, who's our Baylor head coach? Uh, Dave Aranda. Yes, Dave thank Aranda. you, Dave Aranda. Uh, follows him to Baylor, and, you know, you watch that uh, – 
the the Ole Miss tape, the bowl game from last year, mm -hmm. you see a guy with pass rush potential, and you're like, okay. And then this year he didn't really build off of that at all. I mean, he is what he is. He is a big plugger. Yep. Uh, not every team signed off on the medicals, but okay. obviously the Browns did. And we knew that they needed to get better defensive tackle. And uh, so this is this is where we're at with Jake Moody. Or, oh, Jake Moody, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Wow. I know. First uh, kicker off the board. I'll say real quick. <laughs> uh, I, I like that the Browns are again building through the spine and uh, like, uh, but with the him amount of beef. Yes, him and Tomlinson. Yeah, him and Dalvin Tomlinson they now. Said, middle, after the <laughs> way they've been built over the last three years, it's an <laughs> overcorrection. <laughs> Andrew Barry said, "I'll, sh I'll Six, show you three, beefy." <laughs> three hundred thirty-five. You guys say we get pushed yeah. around? Yeah, no way. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. They, they were getting pushed they around. Were. It was it was embarrassing at times. It really was. Uh, the Chargers. I think after that Chargers game, I think they were like, "Okay, okay." We can't keep doing this. The Chargers aren't averaging. They haven't had like one carry past 10 yards this whole season. They're ripping it on us. But yeah, they wanted beef in the middle, built through the spine. So his tape against Texas was actually pretty good as well. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. and that was uh, really the game I really focused on because I was watching Bijan. Uh, but no, he, <laughs> he he showed up and I knew his name and everything. But there's times where he flashed. But he's a plugger. Mm. But yeah. Jake we Moody. have our first kicker off the oh. board, Jake Moody from Michigan with the 99th pick to San Francisco. Okay. Shanahan being out McVay. Because <laughs> they when, need some specialists. When you're in a draft where you feel like there's one kicker, where you haven't graded, you have to take him a round earlier, yep. if not two rounds earlier. Uh, you know, the Browns did that Just with... the fourth, yeah. yeah. The Browns did that with Cade York. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Obviously, the 49ers, they didn't... They had three picks here in the, in the late third, and yep. they didn't feel like that... The, the kicker would last and so Moody was a guy watched well, a lot of Big Ten football didn't matter the situation the scoreboard the weather he's just consistent yeah. uh, even when you, coaches try to ice him and big pressure kicks he made those kicks so um, not surprised he's the first kicker off the board I, I think I had him coming off in like maybe the fifth round yeah. so a little little early but uh, again you don't want to be if Jake Moody would have went in the fourth before the Niners could have got him they would have been pretty upset the Niners that, also don't have a fourth round pick they okay, traded to Carolina in the, in the Christian McCaffrey trade so they were waiting until deep in the fifth and round before they would pick again a big need for them yeah. they needed to come away they did a no lot of work Robbie. on these kickers uh, Chad Ryland out of Maryland, <laughs> Moody, Michigan. We're in that part of the draft. Doing oh, yeah. a lot of work on these kickers. Oh, yeah. hey, Shrine, Shrine Bowl MVP? Because he's the only one that scored points. <laughs> but he was, I mean, he's automatic uh, yeah, that he whole is. week. It, it's when you're, uh, like, and this is how I'll say it, is you take a kicker, yeah, this is your guy. Like, this, right. he's uh, cold-blooded yes. um, and has range and everything. So, it, it's, yeah, no, he's, if you did take a guy, this is the guy. I was going to say, because it's more than just, judging leg power yeah. and, and accuracy it's you really have to understand the mentality of these yes. guys we're talking kickers okay yeah, yeah you do your thing uh, buddy but, but he like i said in big 10 play it doesn't matter against ohio state yep. uh the tcu game it, even though they lost that game he was making some big kicks that uh it, 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 they would get within 50 yards and harbaugh's like all right good we're good send them out there he, he would not I, bat an eye i love big 10 football uh, but it's uh, no. But think about what Evan McPherson's done for the Bengals. Yes. How many yeah. tight games they played in the last two years, and a quarterback's only as good as their kicker. And whoever the quarterback <laughs> is for the 49ers, at least they got a pretty good one in the third round here. But McPherson's so cold-blooded that they all these tight games he was just crushing kicks. He's sitting out at halftime watching the the act at the Super Bowl. So my only concern about this. Is it, are we encouraging Kyle Shanahan to make some poor decisions by oh, giving him a really never good goes kicker? On fourth down. That's my yeah. that's my only right. worry. Oh, he's yeah. There's going to be a fourth and two opportunity. He is sending that field goal team in every single time. He, he he's going <laughs> to love that, it. That's what I'm most worried about here. Yeah. You any more kicker thoughts? I think that's all I got. I, I wasn't expecting <laughs> to talk kicker kickers too? tonight. <laughs> Who's kicker? Chad too? Ryland, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Maryland guy. Okay. Yep. I, I think those are probably the only two kickers that that's, get drafted. That's how well I know the kickers. I just know the the Maryland guy, the Michigan yeah, yeah. guy. Right, like, right. I just know the schools. It's like they, that well, school has. Well, a, a few punters drafted. Maybe yeah. even a long snapper. Uh, yeah. Drafted. There's a, there's Alex a, Ward. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll see if a, maybe seventh round we see a long snapper. I love a good draft. We should have done a live show tomorrow. Just so we would have been out when the long snapper got drafted. We'll do an emergency pod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the special is special. The Niners are in such a fascinating position because they don't draft until the end of the third round, and all the picks are at the end of the third yeah, round. Right. So they trade up for a safety, and then now they have to pick the kicker a round early because they're not drafted until the end of the fifth round. Yeah. Just the, what it does to your strategy. I mean, right. just in the way that you have to conceive of, well, this is our board, but 
how much does that really matter? Yeah. And it just it makes it such a specific sort of experience for this front office. And they have a pick here coming up in two picks. Yep. So we'll, we'll see how they continue to build upon that. They had to but. make sure they got the kicker first before that second third rounder came up, or that last <laughs> third rounder came up uh, in this round. Yeah. So the Raiders on the board right now. Their pick is in. Niners are currently on the clock. And then the Minnesota Vikings, who traded back with San Francisco, going to get the safety from Penn State, whose name I'm, I'm Jair Brown. Jair yeah, Brown. Brown. Yeah. Who played with Jaquan Brisker. Who played with Jaquan, <laughs> played with Jaquan Brisker. <laughs> Those forgettable Penn State safeties, apparently. Just, just to reset again, Keely Ringo, Tyler yeah. Scott, Clark Phillips, the, the Utah nickel. Yep. Dewan Jones, right tackle Ohio State again. Yeah, yeah. Surprise, but not surprised. Yeah, with Dewan yeah. Jones. Yep. Uh, Darius Rush, the corner from South Carolina. I actually thought he was the better of the South Carolina corners. We already saw Cam, Cam Smith, Smith go. Uh, Adebari, uh, Northwestern defensive tackle, still out there. Uh, Antonio Johnson, the Texas A&M nickel safety, and the first Cincinnati wide receiver drafted. It's Trey Tucker. Not Tyler Scott. Yeah, Trey Tucker. that's uh, Trey is, Tucker goes hundredth to the Las Vegas Raiders. Huh. Not your guy, Tyler Scott. Dave. And not not a huge surprise. Some teams did like Trey Tucker better than Tyler Scott really? um, wow. because he is a burner. Yeah, you want speed, smaller guy, smaller package, but he can in return aspect yeah, return plays right, into yeah. this. So the way you want to use him on sweeps, you want to use him on it just he, he could be a gadget player yep. for you. Um, and so an interesting add to when you think about that Raiders. With the wide receiver depth chart looks like. Yeah, it reminds me of the conversation we had about Houston. Yes, where you have those. Specific types of bodies, but not a lot of explosion. Right. And that this is that element that the Raiders didn't have on their depth chart. Yeah. It, very different. And again, this is we have the conversation about the receivers. We rank them all together in the same column. They're all different with what they yeah. offer. Roles are so different players. They, they, yep. There's so many different positions within the receiver yep. that you know, even though you know Cedric Tillman goes after Rasheed Rice, or but they're all these are, are all different. different same thing. Bingo, with, like yeah. they could be the exact same size, totally different. And, and so styles. with the the Raiders are looking for with this pick is you know they're not going to draft a Tyler Scott they're not going to draft uh, you know uh, other Man, receivers I, <laughs> What's that? I actually would have liked Scott with them as well <laughs> yeah, absolutely but you feel like there's a little bit of redundancy but the players they already have there. exactly yeah. and, and so Tucker's a little bit different with what he gives you set the record oh there we go at new record for tight ends drafted in the first three rounds Cameron Latu from Alabama going to the Niners with the hundred and first pick so, you know, and it, we talked about how Jameer Gibbs was the leading receiver. Latu is the other member of that offense where Bryce Young felt some the, the com comfort. He like, was the comfort player. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was going to work the middle of the field. Yep. He was going to catch the football. Um, you know, he, he's a solid player. Uh, yep. You know, the testing's average. You know, he's not a guy that's going to easily uncover and be this ball winner and win after the catch. Uh, but he's going to be where he needs to be. Yep. He's a solid positional blocker. Yep. And so, uh, again, we're talking about a team in the 49ers that they don't pick again until the fifth round. Yeah. And if they wanted their tight end, because they looked at the tight ends heavily, yeah. just like they looked at the kickers heavily, uh, and they felt like they couldn't wait until the fifth round to get their guy. Oh, it makes total sense, uh, especially other guys that are kind of available. There's really this guy's that type that's kind of that balance y and f ability um yeah I, I, he was underneath blanket like that's how i looked at him he was kind of their steady eddie in that offense uh watching with bryce young it, it's really yeah it was all underneath underneath they but they at times split him out there was mm -hmm. times running deep digs and curl routes where he's at the number one position so they use him in interesting ways but yeah he's kind of like a i keep using the term balance but it's just kind of like does everything okay Beyond George Kittle, we got Charlie Warner there and Ross Dwelly. Yeah, they, they absolutely could need yes. another useful tight end. Yep. Going back to that word, and he can eat reps for him, like with, especially with Kittle, and you know, because he can do some stuff, some stuff in line, and they do a lot of zone still, even though they've diversified their run game, so he can do that positional blocking, kind of shielding blocking. The Vikings are wrapping us up here. What an underrated line. Hundred wow. sec second pick. He's Robert Smith was so, I mean, when you're playing Madden 2000, and oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Robert Smith, I, I wanted him on my team every time. He was just a juice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's a really good running Make back. Catch. He, another guy that retired before, yeah. you know, and, and good on him. He's had a nice career. So, yeah. uh, he, juice, he can catch. He was great on screens. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Good memories of Robert Smith. Really fun player. I mean, a lot of really fun players. Four in the Vikings offenses at the time.
Final pick. Last of the pick third of the third round. round. Okay. Makai Blackman okay. from USC goes 102 to the Vikings. Told you guys Blackman was going before Ringo. Yeah. Uh, just like we all thought. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like Blackman, he's he's an older player. He was yeah. at Colorado. He transfers to USC for his final year. And we beaten up that USC defense pretty good. Know, right? He was the one guy that you're like, okay, this, there's something here. Um, average size, uh, but he has ball skills. He had three interceptions this year, 15 passes defended. Um, I, he really competitive player. Yep. Really, really competitive. And so, you know, when the ball's in the air, he feels like it's as much his as the receiver does. And he's going to go make a play. So uh, I thought maybe fifth round. So a little surprise, the final pick here in the third. But... You know, I, I get it. They, uh, they they need more bodies at corner, and yes, so you know they went wide receiver Jordan Addison in the first. We thought maybe could go corner in the mm -hmm. first. They wait till their you know their their second pick here, Makai uh, Blackman. It's just interesting that you know Keely Ringo's still out there. Yeah. They went with a guy that the better football player probably at this point than the huge upside in a Ringo. And that's probably what Flores likes. He probably, Brian Flores, a defense coordinator, yeah. probably watched him, probably signed off on him. It was just kind of gone, yeah, he, he could stay sticky. He's a, he's puts hands on balls. He's going to be in an aggressive defense. So they needed corners, like you said. And so at least they kind of flopped how I thought they would go. I thought they'd go corner in the first round or quarterback, and then maybe go receiver in the kind of in the third round. So they got the two spots that I thought they would fill up, though. Gentlemen? That's night two That's of the 2023 nice. NFL Draft. Wow. Rounds two and three in the books. Just a couple big picture takeaways here before we close the book on tonight. We'll obviously be back with another podcast Saturday into Sunday after the draft wraps up. But your favorite haul from rounds two and three, night two here. Dan. I mean, it's got to be the Packers. <laughs> I mean, to come it's away with uh, Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft, two tight ends that are – uh, yes, they're similar, but yep. that's okay. I yeah. mean, really lean into it yep. because these guys are combo guys. They can block, but they can also really be something in the passing game. Yep. And we think they're both going to it, not be day one, be the guy, but we'll see them as rookies. Yeah. They will be out there making an impact. And so uh, we thought maybe could they go Dalton Kincaid in the first? Could they go JSN in the first? They don't. They go exactly who the Packers are. They take Lucas Van Ness. But you know what? I, I think it paid off for him because of what they I got agree. on day two. Yeah. I, I love it. And Jane uh, Reed. I mean, uh, you think about uh, and yes. Jane Reed. Yes. Where yes. you think about their pass catching, right? Just their depth chart at receiver and tight end compared to where it was at the start of last mm -hmm. season and what it looks like now. They've completely remade the entire. I love it. And it's all guys I like. I, I liked in this process. Yeah. It's Reed Van Ness. I mean, it's kind of like, hey, cool. Like, uh, it's easy for me to sign. I Packers be number one. I, I did like the. Falcons going with Bergeron and Harrison. Yeah. Uh, I liked here on day two. I just think of both kind of nice, solid players for them and um, spots that make sense that they added to. And also just kind of, I like like those players individually as well. So I like kind of like the two guys at the Falcons tab today too. Biggest surprise for you? Uh, I mean, Packers for doing what they did. Uh, I'd say them again. Um, you know, I, I think that I mean, maybe the Browns, I mean, they, they, not yeah. picking until the third and then the players they picked, like, I can, you, can, you can see why they went the direction they did yep. uh, with taking a Cedric Tillman and then coming back with Siaki Ika, um, you know, a big hulking defensive tackle. Not picking till the third round, obviously, that, you know, puts you at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they got some decent players, just not quite the way we thought they would go. Not yep. that route. Um, yeah, some of the, I mean, I was going to say maybe just Denver's aggression. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't be shocked, but, uh, you know, with Sean Payton going there and just going, hey, let's keep the good times rolling. This is what I was used to in New Orleans. I like a guy, let's go get him. So I shouldn't be totally shocked, but maybe that aggression of going and get like a Marvin Mims or anything, I'm not shocked that – actually, I am a little shocked that they went with a receiver as with their first pick. But mm -hmm. uh, So that was a little bit surprising for me. And, and the guys that are still available. Keely Ringo yep. not going, yep. no yep. one taking that chance. Uh, Dewan Jones, no one, you know, taking a chance on that big right tackle if he hits. Clark Phillips, a good football player. Um, Adam Bawari, we thought maybe even in the first round yeah. it could happen. Because, again, fourth, fifth round tape, but top five overall testing. What do you do with that? Teams are trusting the tape, yeah. and that, that's fascinating to see. It's been a while, but I think worth revisiting. Will Levis going to Tennessee? Yeah. Right. Them going back up, and, and that was the question I asked when they made that trade. Did they like one quarterback? Was that the reason we'd heard so much noise about the Titans moving back up into the top five? Or did they want to come away from this process with a quarterback? And we got our answer. Yeah. They wanted to come away with a quarterback from this draft. And, and Nate, I'm so interested in the logic behind that. 
you know, you have Ryan Tannehill there now, so he's probably not going to start from day one. Your offensive line is a mess. You don't have any receivers. There's a very good chance that you're going to be a bad football team next year with a very good quarterback class. So why now? Like, why do you feel like you need to get the guy now? They clearly did, but I'm so curious why that thought process in Tennessee. Maybe they probably just liked him. Yeah, yeah maybe or, they were maybe like, they hey, did. I mean, seriously. Maybe they, they thought it was a rare chance. You know, they only right. traded a third-round yeah. pick yep. to move up to get him, and maybe. that maybe that's the thought. It's like, you know what? We're not leveraging ourselves yep. to potentially get a quarterback in the future. We're not going to have to pay him very One in the much. Hand, two in the bush. Like yeah. They could say, hey, we tank, and then it, Mike Vrabel goes, no, we're winning seven games. And guess what? We're right in the middle of the first I, I round I totally again. get that. We yeah. talked about this yesterday. You never know. Yeah. You, know you never know what your next season is going to look like. It's so easy to say, well, we're gonna, we'll find a guy next year. Maybe they did like him, but I think the process may be a little bit surprising when you think about the state of that franchise. It's just so funny that he goes with Tannehill. Like yeah. that when I watch their games and just be able to stand there and deliver and have some arm talent whip those throws in with a little bit of athleticism to run some stuff and it's like, all right, just learn from Tannehill. This is great. Hey, what he does, like the tape is translatable. Yeah. Like usually sometimes you get like I can't watch Russell Wilson when I was backing him up and go like I, I can't do what he does. Right. So <laughs> yeah. you know, but those two can, and so it's it's a pretty damn good situation. It's really interesting some of the trends. In the first round, we had only Power Five players. We didn't have a single FCS or That's Group so of Five crazy. player, which is rare. We haven't seen that in over 20 years. In the first two rounds, the conference with the most draft picks, the Big Ten coming in strong, which, you know, usually the SEC, yep. they, they yep. reign Always. supreme this year in the first two rounds, the Big Ten led all conferences, which is really interesting. When I was putting together the videos for this, like all, like the first like six players I had were Big Ten, Big Ten, Big Ten. And Shocking. I, was like, I know, well, that's why I was, I was like, wait, I, I, I'm not just trying to be biased here, but then right. I was like, but they had that many yeah. good players, all the positions. Yes. All right, guys, that is all we got. We will be back in podcast form after mm -hmm. round seven. That show hopefully will be up for you guys. I don't know, a little bit later on Saturday evening, and then we will have another show wrapping up the entire draft. Just kind of lessons we learned, mm -hmm. takeaways, what are teams telling us we'll do that for Monday. So still plenty of draft coverage coming your way. Sincerely appreciate you guys spending the time with us over the last couple days. Appreciate you guys churning through 100 picks and knowing individual long snappers that could be drafted in this draft and really giving us some deep kicker takes here at the end of round three. Hey, pleasure is, I mean, speaking for both of us, all ours, because this is fun. Uh, is. We still have a lot more picks to go tomorrow, yes. so we're not done yet, but uh, yeah, this is a fun first two days of the draft. Surprises, um, a lot of what we thought was going to happen, so yeah, it's, it's been a typical draft, and that's awesome. It's great. It, it's when I have takes on a lot of these players, so it's sure. nice I just can shoot from the hip <laughs> right away, get, get them out, get them, let them marinate a little bit, you know, try them out, see how they fit. Uh, so, no, but this is so much fun. I, I love the draft, and I love being able to do this, especially with you guys. This Appreciate great. you guys bearing with us as we tried a little bit something new this year. We had a great time doing it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll talk to you soon.